brings you... Basil Rathbone and the New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his good friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to ask you if you know that one of the favorite wines of American women is Petri California Muscatel. In fact, the whole family likes Petri Muscatel. And you'll certainly know why if you'll just pour yourself a glass. Why, that Petri Muscatel is wonderful just to look at. It's the color of sheer gold. And raise that glass of Petri Muscatel to your lips. Oh, boy, what a wine. Look, did you ever walk through a vineyard early in the morning? You know, when the dew is still clinging to the grapes? And did you taste one of those luscious, plump Muscat grapes? Then you'll know what to expect the first time you taste Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel brings you that same wonderful Muscat flavor right from the heart of the grape. Try serving Petri Muscatel after dinner by itself or with fruit or nuts. It's the perfect after-dinner wine. And serve it proudly because five letters, P-E-T-R-I, spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson is ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Are you all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? I'm ready, if you are, my boy. How would you like to hear a story that took place in Italy? In Italy? (laughs) Say, you and the great Sherlock Holmes certainly did get around. What took you there, Doctor? We'd gone to Rome to investigate the sudden death of Cardinal Tosca. An inquiry, which I may tell you, Mr. Bartell, was carried out by Holmes at the express desire of His Holiness the Pope. Oh, say, Doctor, that sounds like a uh, wonderful... No, no, Mr. Bartell, that's a story that I'm afraid I can never tell you. However, tonight's adventure took place a few days after Holmes had brought his case to a satisfactory, though somewhat terrifying, conclusion. I suggested to the great man that a short holiday would be good for us before returning to England. And so we spent some happy days browsing among the architectural treasures of old Rome. The Colosseum, the Baths of Caracalla, the Forum, the wonderful ruins on the Palatine Hill. I couldn't drag Holmes away from them, Mr. Bartell. And at night time he was able to indulge to his heart's content his great love of music. Finally, it was two nights before we were to sail for England, I remember. We went to the opera house to hear the famous Italian soprano Gina Valchese singing Verdi's Immortal La Traviata. I can hear that exquisite voice now, Mr. Bartell, as Holmes and I, seated in a box, listened spellbound to the great Valchese singing her last act after. <laughs> What a magnificent voice. Yes, it is, Holmes. It's pretty, though, that most opera stars who sing like nightingales seem to have the figures of unusually well-fed outer pigeons. Poor woman, she must weigh at least 20 stone. Nevertheless, you mustn't refer to her as poor, my dear chap, despite her somewhat unfortunate proportions. Signora Gilda Valchese remains one of the greatest and wealthiest of contemporary sopranos. Listen to the applause. Yes, undoubtedly she'll sing an encore. We might as well go back to the dressing room now. The opera's almost over. Why are we going back to the dressing room? Because during the last intermission, I received a note from her requesting my attendance. Oh, what did the note say? Well, it seems that the lady is not too popular with certain members of the opera company. Uh, well, I have no wish to become entangled in any opera clash temperaments. I, I confess I find myself not a little interested in meeting the lady. Shh, shh. She's going to sing her an encore. <laughs> Oh, certainly, my dear fellow. A summons from Gina Valchese is no more to be disobeyed than a royal command. I must 
just ask you gentlemen not to stand outside La Valquesa's dressing room. We permit no strangers, particularly foreigners. But the signora has requested our presence. Uh, <clears throat> may I ask who you are? Permit me to introduce myself, gentlemen. I am Armando Bellini, Inspector of Police. My name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Sherlock Holmes? Oh, but this is a great honor. Uh, allow me to apologize. Here in the Opera House, we have to be so careful, you understand, of intrigues. There are so many. But the uh, Senor Holmes and his friend, I am so happy to meet you both. At headquarters, I hear wonderful reports of your work in the Cardinal Tosca affair. I should prefer not to mention that unfortunate matter, Inspector, except on the conditions of extreme privacy. Oh, quite so. And behind the scenes at the opera is not the most secluded place. Uh, please do forgive me. You are waiting to see La Valquesa. Yes. Uh, she is still on the stage. Uh, she has requested your presence, you say, Senor Holmes? Uh, yes, I trust the meeting is to be a social and not a professional one. We're sailing for England in a couple of days. And you came to hear the great Valquesa singer before you left. Yes. Most understandable. A magnificent voice, Inspector. Mm, yes, a doctor. And still, well, I am a devout opera lover myself. Yet I cannot help but feel it's a future lies with those who can add a youth and beauty <laughs> to a great voice. Ah, that's true. True, senor. But where can you find such a combination? I have found it. Here in the opera, there is a girl. She is my protege. Someday, I hope she will be my wife. At the moment, she is only understudying La Vacchese. If she should ever get the opportunity of singing in her place, then a new star will be born. Oh, really? What's her name? Lisa Bordoni. She has but recently come to Rome from Milano, where she was studied with the great Alfiera. Confidentially, I think that La Barchese is so jealous of her that... Oh, here is Lisa now. And that is her brother with her. Uh, Lisa Caramia, a uh, pleaser to join us. I... George, what a beautiful girl. What is it, Armando? Uh, permit me to present uh, the famous English detective, Senior Sherlock Holmes, and his friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do, young lady? Glad to meet you both. This is my brother, Wally. How do you do? I certainly feel that I know a lot about you two gentlemen. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've read your stories, Dr. Watson. Indeed, sir. I'm very flattered. Lisa Caramia. Uh, we were just saying that in youth and beauty, combined with the voice, lies our future hope in the opera. Your day will come, Lisa Mia. Your day will come soon. I hope you're right, Armando. But as long as I understudy Gina Valchese, I don't see when I'll get my chance. <laughs> <laughs> She's disgustingly healthy. If you'll pardon my saying so, young lady. Though your name is Bordoni, you and your brother don't sound in the least Italian. Well, we're not, Mr. Holmes. We're American. But to succeed in Italian opera, my sister has found that an Italian name is essential. So the Borden family became the Bordonis. In, <laughs> in any case, my real name is Lizzie Borden. <laughs> I'm sure you, Mr. Holmes, as a famous detective, <laughs> will see that I had to change my name. Yes, I can well understand. Uh, who was Lizzie Borden? Uh, well, my dear fellow, one of the greatest and... Uh, most successful of murderesses, who wielded an axe with incredible dexterity. I've often regretted that I was in Tibet instead of America at the time of that particular case. <laughs> Senior Holmes, I do not understand you Anglo-Saxons. To me, a murderess is a murderess. Now, when you speak of a greatness in women, I feel... Oh, but here comes Gina Valcasi now. I will introduce you. How many times, but I tell you a lot. No one wants to stand outside my dressing room. Send them away. La Valcasi is a child. Uh, but you wish to see Senor Sherlock Holmes, the famous detective. He has a come here in answer to your request. Please, uh, permit me to present him, and also as a friend, uh, Dr. Watts. Well, how do you do, Senor? I'm greatly honored to meet you, uh, Senor Valcasi. And now, perhaps, if we may come into your dressing room and confer privately. Perdido. What would La Valcasi have to say? to a detective. I mean, you know, the police as Biro. Go away, all of you. <laughs> well, what do you think of that? She slammed the door in my face. <laughs> Waiter. Uh, see, senor. Uh, bring me some more coffee, please. See, senor. Ah, uh, the very pleasant dining here on the hotel terrace, I must confess. Oh, very. 
Amazingly warm, considering yesterday's snow. Yes, it is. Uh, later, I suggest we pay another visit to the opera and hear about Casey's sing Gilda and Rigoletto. Upon my soul, Holmes, it seems to me that you're astonishingly casual after the way that woman insulted you last night, uh -huh. slamming the door in your face as if you were a tradesman. Shocking. <laughs> what would you have me do, my dear chap? Force my way into her into her room, demand an apology, or have my friend challenge her to a duel in order to avenge my honor? Oh, don't try to be funny, Holmes. You know perfectly well what I mean. The lady asks you to come and see her, and when you do, she pretends she's never heard of you. And here it is nearly 24 hours later, and you've done absolutely nothing about it. <laughs> oh, dear old Watson. You're really quite upset over the affair, aren't you? Well... If it will make you any happier, let me tell you, uh, I have done something about it. Mm, I'm delighted to hear it. What? This morning, I was able to obtain a specimen of Lord Alcase's handwriting from an autographed picture in the possession of Inspector Bellini. I compared the writing with that on the note and I, uh, that I received in the box last night. It was, the, it was the same, proving that the message I received was authentic. Oh, in that case, why did she snub you like that? Well, something was to frighten her, I suppose. Something or someone who was standing at the dressing room door with us. Well, who was there? Uh, Inspector Bellini, Lisa Bordoni, and her brother. Precisely, my dear fellow. Therefore, we may assume that La Valchese had no wish to recognize me in their presence. But if you think that, Holmes, why haven't you been in touch with her today? She may be in some dreadful oh, danger. Oh, if she is... She can find me easily enough. And meanwhile, I'm perfectly happy to be left alone. The last few weeks have been sufficiently strenuous without becoming involved in some fresh case. On oh, my soul, Holmes, you must be tired. I've never known you to be so indifferent to a case. Great Scott. Now, what is it, Watson? Look, walking towards us. It's Signora Valchese herself. Oh, and judging from the lady's expression, she seems to be in some distress. Good evening, Signora. Signora, I must speak Please to you. Please sit down, aren't you? This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? First, I must apologize for my behavior last night. It would have been dangerous if Abel Casey had acknowledged that she had to communicate with you. That's just what my friend assumed, uh, madam. Please speak quite freely now, Signora. Uh, no one can overhear us. Signor Holmes, I am being persecuted. My life is in a danger. Been you must save me. You've been threatened. See, si, see, si, Signor. And now today, tragedy has struck. My sister, my beloved Bella, uh -huh. lies near death from a murderous attack. An attack that was immense for me. Good Lord, what happened, madam? If you will please to keep her quiet, a little Albert Casey speak will I learn what happened. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry, madam. I, uh, this morning, this morning, I always myself take my dog for a walk. But this morning, I feel the trace of a cold. I ask my sister to take the dog for a walk. Please do understand that my sister is very much like me in appearance. Yes, I understand, Signora. Uh, please continue. She walk alone in the park. From nowhere. A horseman come gallop and ride her dog. This is much I learned from the traces in the snow when I worry and go to find her. Was she able to tell you who the horseman was? No. She cannot speak, Signor. They say at the hospital that her skull is a fracture. That she may not leave. Signor Holmes. That attack, it was meant for me. You must protect Senora, me. Signora, I shall do everything in my oh. power to... No! 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 What's wrong, madam? Somewhere there is a cat. I know it. Make it go away. I can't understand cats. They drive me mad. No! 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 Oh, make it go away, please. I can't understand them without even a thing. No! 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 I can't understand them without even it must be your imagination. Mira, I am sorry to make such a scene, but I cannot bear to be near a cat. I cannot tell you what it do to me. It, uh, it may sound a no, foolish no. weakness. No, no, not at all, Signora. Such a condition is quite common. In fact, I believe medical science has given it a name. It's known as ilurophobia. Oh, whatever it is called. It makes me ill. I must go to my room. I, I cannot stand much more. Uh, my poor sister. I imagine with your sister at death's door, Signora, you will not sing tonight. Signor Holmes, I love her very much. But even a sister is only a sister. My heart is my life. In an hour, Signor. I sing Gilda in a rigoletto. You will attend the performance. And afterward, you will tell La Valchese how she may trap these devil who seek to destroy her. Oh, 
Holmes, it's after 9.30. We've missed quite a lot of the opera. It's hardly worth going to our box now. It'll just be in time to hear La Dalcasia sing the incomparable Caronomy. Come on, old fellow. Let's slip in as quietly as we can. Well, it seems to me we should have been in our box from the beginning of the performance. She asked you to keep an eye on her, you That's know. true, old chap. But it occurred to me that an attack on her during the performance was unlikely and that our time might be more profitably spent making inquiries at the writing academy. But you drew a blank. We found no trace of that mysterious writer. No, but at least we tried. Here we are. Let's stand at the back of the theater for a few minutes. Case of singing. It's an understudy. The lady's protege, the American girl, Lisa Bordoni. What a beautiful voice. A nice one, but with a beautiful, wonderful range. Look here, we, we've no time to listen to her now. We must go to the Valkyrie's dressing room at once. We know she left to the theater tonight with the intention of singing. I'm very much afraid there's devil's work afoot, Watson. Doesn't she answer? Listen. There are cats inside our dressing room. Come on, Watson. Locked. Put your shoulder to it. Come on, help me. What? Come on. Once more. Come on, again. Now. Watson, here. Great Scott, she's unconscious, Watson. See what you can do for her. She must have fainted the fight. Yes, some fiend, knowing her deadly fear of cats, has locked her in here with half a dozen of them. Shoot. Shoot. Off me. Shoot. Her eyes are opening, Holmes. She's coming too. Signora Barchese. Her lips are moving. She's trying to speak. Signora Barchese, tell me, who did this to you? Uh, 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 Great heavens! Uh, her voice, it's gone. I've known many vicious crimes in my lifetime, Watson. But to murder a voice, a voice that was one of the treasures of the world, is as vile a killing as I've ever encountered. <laughs> Dr. Watson will tell you the rest of his story in just a few seconds. And right now would be a wonderful time to try a glass of Petri California Port. In the evening after dinner, well, any time you're taking things easy, is the perfect time for Petri Port. Petri Port is a rich red wine, the kind of wine you like to sip slowly, so you won't miss a drop of its truly fine flavor. I'm not kidding when I say you owe it to yourself and your family to try Petri Port. In fact, you should try Petri Port and Petri Muscatel. So don't buy one, buy two. Buy both Port and Muscatel. Just be sure you get Petri, because Petri wine is always good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, so the great opera singer lost her voice when someone locked in a room full of cats, huh? Uh, what did you and Sherlock Holmes do? We took Senior Valcasey back to her hotel at once and saw that she was properly taken care of. How did the understudy, uh, Lisa Bordoni, make out, Doctor? Well, the tragedy that overtook Lark Valcasey gave her her great chance. She received a tremendous ovation at the close of the performance, and it seemed certain that another star had been born. But let me tell you the story just as it happened, Mr. Bartell. A little later that night, Holmes and I were once again standing on the balcony of our hotel, watching a crowd of people that had assembled in the court. You see that crowd, Watson? Yes, I suppose they've come here to acclaim the new star. No, 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 my dear fellow, that crowd isn't planning a celebration. Look at them and listen to their angry murmuring. I'm afraid there's going to be trouble. I don't like the look of it. Hello, here comes Lisa Bordoni's brother, Wally. What's wrong, sir? Mr. Holmes, Mr. Holmes, you've got to do something. What's happened? Well, somehow the story about the cats in La Belcase's dressing room has spread. The crowd outside are saying that my sister, Lisa, planned the whole thing so that she could sing Valcasey's part in the opera Where's your sister now? In a room at the hotel here. I managed to get her away from the crowd, and I locked her in. But that mob, I'm frightened for. Ah, here comes the official representative of Law and Order, Inspector Bellini. Wally, Wally, where is Lisa? I was just telling Mr. Holmes that I'd locked her in a room. And that crowd's in a dangerous mood, Bellini. What precautions are you taking? I have thrown a cord on the police around the hotel. The mob is getting out of our hand, and Lisa must be protected. As a matter of fact, the situation is even worse than the crowd knows. I have just been told that La Barquese's twin sister, Bella, died in the hospital tonight. That adds a murder charge. If the crowd knew about that, I tremble to think what might happen. Did you say that, uh... 
Dr. Casey's sister was a twin, Inspector? Si, Senor Holmes. She was a her exact double in everything but voice. Indeed, how very illuminating. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a few words in private with my friend, Dr. Watson. Excuse us for a moment, please. What do you make of it, Holmes? What are you, old chap? Well, the American girl seemed very charming and all that, but she might have done it. It had to be either her, her brother, or the inspector himself. They all had a motive for wanting La Belchese to lose her voice. But I must say I can't understand the motive behind the murder of her twin sister. I think I can give you the answer to that question in a very few minutes. But meanwhile, the mob gets uglier and uglier. The only way to avert violence, Watson, is to give them quick proof and a certainty of conviction. I must go back to Bellini and the young American. I want to keep an eye on them. Meanwhile, I want you to slip out and uh, get me a cat. Cat? What a thought. You'll find out soon enough. But Holmes, what kind of a cat? Oh, any kind, but hurry. <laughs> There's a good kitty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What you do in a hotel kitchen, senor? Oh, you want to play with my cat? Oh, is he your cat? Charming little fellow. Uh, I'd like to borrow him for a little while. Oh, why you want to borrow my cat? Oh, I thought I'd take him up to my hotel room and have a little game with him. I've got some old socks he can play with. Deal. The English, they are a crazy race. My cat does not like to play with the old socks. Look here. Here's 50 lira for you. Oh, no, no, no. I tell you, my cat does not like to play with old socks. My cat will stay here, and you can keep it, your money. I'll give you 100 lira. Uh, so, did, did you may stuff my cat full of old socks? No, no. Give me back my cat. Oh, the give place me. is with you. You'll get it back. Hey, stop cat. him. Stop him. The crazy Englishman is stealing my cat. <laughs> Well, I got the cat for you, Holmes, but I wish you'd tell me what we're doing outside Valcase's door with it. I'm going to try an experiment. We open a bedroom door softly, so slip the cat in. So and close the door. Holmes, man, what the blazes do you think you're doing? You'll drive her mad. I think not. Listen, you watch through the keyhole if you can. Where do you go from, you stupid cat? Go away. Holmes, her voice. It's come back. Yes, I thought it might. I can see her through the keyhole. She's picking the cat up by the scruff of its neck. She's walking toward the balcony. Yes, and towards the crowd down below. An excellent opportunity for a public confession. Come on. Stella. What do you want? I charge you with the murder of your sister, the great singer, Balcazi. <laughs> It was a magnificent, Senor Holmes, a magnificent. The way you forced her to confess on the balcony in a full side of the mouth. And so you saved Lisa. I can't thank you enough, Mr. Holmes. No, can I. Though I still don't see how you guessed. She looked so much like her sister that she fooled even me, her understudy. Yes, it was an extremely cunning plot, Miss Bordone. The real Varchese sent me that note last night. When I met her at the dressing room door, she denied having sent for me because the three of you were there. I suppose that she suspected one of us. Oh, yes, obviously. And later, no doubt, she told her twin sister, Bella, about having sent me the message and also announced her intention of coming to see me. Bella saw her opportunity, murdered La Varchese... Assumed her identity and to give added realism to her role, followed through with her sister's plan by coming to see me today. But I still don't understand this business, Mr. Holmes. Why did the twin sister lock herself in her dressing room and fill it with cats? What did it accomplish? It gave me the chance to see. Yes, that's true. Which is why Watson felt certain the criminal must be you, your brother, or Signor Bellini. But you see, the episode with the cats accomplished one other thing. It made it plausible that the great Valchese should never sing again. To whose advantage would that be? An imposter, of course. In the person of a twin sister who could not sing and who must surely envy her sister's great wealth. Exactly, my dear fellow. As soon as I knew they were twin sisters and everything but voice, it became more than a possibility. 
It became probability, but it had to be tested. That's why I sent for the cat, Watson. When the sister, thinking herself unobserved, exhibited no terror for cats, well, it became a certainty. Oh, my soul, Holmes, this is as fantastic a plot as ever we've met. A diabolical plan, Watson. And I'm only thankful, Miss Bordoni, that we were able to expose it before the crowd reached you tonight. I don't know what I can ever do to repay you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, that won't be hard, my dear. A box of Cotton Garden for your London debut would be, uh, well, an ample repayment. And from what I hear of your reception in Rigoletto tonight, I shan't have to wait very long for that reward, eh? It's a promise, Mr. Holmes. Come in. Oh, excuse me, please. All over the hotel are looking for my cat. I say to myself, there he is. He's stealing my cat. Inspector Molina, you arrest him. He tried to bribe me, and then he ran away with my cat and fill him full of old English socks. Oh, does she be <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, I'd sure like to have a picture of you running away with that fellow's cat under your arm. <laughs> you, a cat stealer. It's not a bit funny, Mr. Bartell. <laughs> Believe me, it was most embarrassing. I know. But it was all for a good cause, and I think you were splendid about the whole thing. Uh, incidentally, how'd you happen to look for a cat in the hotel kitchen? Oh, there's usually one round the back door of a kitchen. Haven't you ever wandered? Uh, well, uh, backstage in a hotel? Fascinating. Oh, of course I have, but uh, I've never been in a hotel kitchen. Then where were you? In the wine cellar. I should have known. Yes, Doctor, I like to look at bottles of Petri wine, because when I see a Petri wine, I know I'm looking at a good wine. And Petri wine is good because of the Petri family. The Petri family first started making fine wine before the beginning of this century, generations ago. Since then, winemaking has been their heritage, handed on down from father to son. So you can take it for granted that the Petri family really knows how to turn luscious, sun-ripened grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. And you can take it for granted, too, that the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a, a trademark. It's a personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. You just can't go wrong with Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what story are you planning to tell us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a strange adventure that Holmes and I had many, many years ago. It concerns a young girl, the mutilation of her doll, and the tragedy that overtook a certain wise woman from the mountains. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Black Peter. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. And tonight, Dr. Watson was played by Mr. Eric Snowden, who substituted for Mr. Nigel Bruce. Mr. Bruce is scheduled to return to the program next week. Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to spend the next half hour listening to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to tell you about something you ought to share with your family before dinner. And that's Petri, California's sherry. Because Petri sherry can make that time before dinner a, a high spot in your day. That Petri sherry is a truly fine wine. 
Its color is a deep amber, rich and inviting. And the wine is wonderfully smooth and full-bodied. Flavor, just swell. Honestly, I mean it when I say the best beginning a good meal ever had is a glass of Petri Sherry. Oh, and look, if some of your family like their sherry dry, you know, not sweet, they'll really like Petri Pale Dry Sherry. So to be sure you please everyone, don't buy one, buy two. Buy the regular Petri Sherry and Petri Pale Dry Sherry. And be sure you look for those letters P-E-T-R-I. Because they spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. And now I know our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's go in and join him. Come in, come in, come in. Good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Barker. Say, how are you feeling, Doctor? All over that attack of flu you had? I'm feeling very much better, thank you, my boy. I'm still a little weak. <laughs> we old fossils take much longer to get over that sort of thing than you young fellows. Well, you take good care of yourself, Doctor. You've got a lot of friends, you know. Oh, I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you, Mr. Barker. And now settle yourself down and I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Where did it take place? You may not be familiar with the names of Jersey, Guernsey, Alderney, and Sark, but those are the four principal islands that make up the group known as the Channel Islands. Oh, yes, Doctor, I have heard of them. Uh, somewhere in the English Channel, aren't they? Between the southern coast of England and the northern coast of France? That's quite right, my boy, though I very much doubt if you ever heard of the tiny island on which this story happened. It was the island of Garth, a minute but self-contained spot with a population of just under a thousand inhabitants subsisting, and from what I saw of the island in those days, subsisting very well on its dairy products. Was it under the rule of the British government, Doctor? No, Mr. Bartell, not exactly. You see, the island belonged to a family by the name of Horn. The head of the family, who was known as the Seigneur of Garth, was an independent ruler owing nominal allegiance to the King of England. That allegiance was expressed by one of those traditional ceremonies in which the Seigneur annually presented one pound of freshly churned butter to a representative of the British crown. Times haven't changed much, have they, Doctor? Pound of butter is still worth a king's ransom. <laughs> but uh, tell me, what were you and the great Sherlock Holmes doing on the island of Garth? Well, I'm just coming to that, my boy, if you'll give me a minute. It was in the summer of 1896 when, to my utter amazement, Holmes informed me that we were going to the island of Garth as the official representatives of the British crown to accept the annual presentation of butter. At the time, I must confess, I couldn't see why Holmes wanted to accept such a ridiculous mission. It was only as we approached the island in a small fishing boat that he told me a great deal more was at stake than a pound of butter. Unfortunately, Mr. Bartell, I'm not much of a sailor, and as the wind was blowing hard and the sea racing, I'm afraid I wasn't a very intelligent companion. Get up, Watson. We'll soon be there. I hope so. I feel wretched, Holmes. I must say, the whole trip seems utterly ridiculous to me. Plunging and bobbing about in a little boat in a raging torrent just because somebody wants to give somebody else a pound of butter. Dear old Watson, you don't really think our mission is so innocuous, do you? Then why are we going to the island of Garth? We're going to the island of Garth at the express wish of its present ruler, Martha Horn. Martha Horn? I never heard of her. She's an extremely spirited old lady. And the only woman who dared tell a certain resident of Windsor Castle that she looked devilishly dowdy for an empress. Great stuff. You mean that... I mean, uh, Watson, that uh, Martha Horn's behests are not lightly disregarded. Obviously, she wishes to see me urgently. Also, my brother Mycroft put pressure on me. He reminded me that a, a visit to Garth might be closely allied to this emerald tie pin I wear. Of course, you recall the origin of this pin. Well, naturally, that lady at Windsor Castle gave it to you after our little trouble last year over those stolen plans for the Bruce Partington submarine. Exactly, my dear fellow. But remember that uh, the spy Oberstein had put those plans up for auction in all the naval centers of Europe. Some hint of their nature must have leaked out. It's even possible that other powers may be able by now to duplicate the pride of our submarine fleet. And whoever controls the channel, Watson, controls England. Well, they're dropping anchor, and yet we're still a quarter of a mile out from the island. So why, why do you think they're doing that? Here comes the skipper. He'll tell us. Here is as close to the island as we may approach, monsieur. We have already sent signals. A smaller boat is putting out for you. It will be here in a little while. Thank you. A smaller boat. Good Lord. 
Holmes, you were hinting at the naval significance of the island of Garth. Yes, old chap, I was. Well, what good would it be as a port if even a small boat like this can only come within half a mile of it? For a surface vessel, no, but we were speaking of submarines. Garth, I learned from the encyclopedia, boasts a magnificent interior cavern accessible only through underwater channels. Great Scott, an ideal natural harbor and dry dock for a submarine fleet. Precisely, and on the control of the island of Garth, Watson may well rest the fate of the British Isles. Now, old chap, perhaps you see why Mycroft was so anxious for us to collect a pound of butter. Holmes, doesn't it seem wonderful to, to be on land again? First the fishing smack, and then that wretched little rowing boat. Then the bucket swinging us up the, the face of the cliff. <laughs> now at last I can stretch the legs. <laughs> steady, old chap, steady, steady. Let me give you your hand. You'll soon get your land legs back again. Yeah, thank you. I'm a bit shaky, I must confess. Hello? Who's that couple walking towards us? Our welcoming committee, no doubt. How do you do? Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watts. Permit me to present myself. I am Dr. Hugo Oberwald. How do you do, sir? How do you do, doctor? And this is Mrs. Reeves, the housekeeper at Horn Castle, where you will be staying. How do you do? How do you do, Mrs. Reeves? Welcome to the island of Garth, gentlemen. We were deputed to come and greet you and take you back to the castle. We can walk there across the cliff tops. It isn't very far. Ah, splendid. I think my friend will appreciate traveling on terra firma once again. <laughs> Dear me, Herr Doctor, you are not a good sailor, perhaps? No, perhaps about it, sir. I had a miserable crossing. I am sorry to hear it. I trust your short stay at the castle will be some recompense for the journey. The formal presentation of the butter will take place tonight. There will be no reason why you gentlemen cannot return to the mainland tomorrow. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Reeves, but it's more than likely that we shall stay on for a few days. Oh, it will be quite unnecessary. I'm afraid that is a matter for Mrs. Horn and ourselves to decide. I'm afraid that Mrs. Horn is incapable of making any further decisions. Oh, what do you mean, madam? Uh, obviously, you have not heard, but the news is slow in reaching the mainland. Uh, Mrs. Horn died yesterday. Died? Good Lord, a natural death, I suppose. But, of course... I attended her myself, a simple case of heart failure. The poor lady died in her sleep. Uh, shall we begin our walk to the castle? Oh, Joe Holmes, this changes things. You suppose it was a, a natural death? I suppose nothing, old fellow. But in almost 20 years of practice, I can recall precisely three clients, actual or potential, who died natural deaths. Come on, let's follow them. <laughs> Dr. Watson, this is Mr. Christopher Horn, grandson of Mrs. Horn and the new ruler of Garth. How do you do? Oh, hello. How do you do, sir? It's very nice of you fellows to come over here. Too bad you had to arrive just as the poor old gal kicked the bucket, though. Allow me to uh, offer my condolences on your grandmother's death, sir. Yes, yes, indeed, Mr. Horn. Thank you. It was a ghastly business. I found her, Christopher. you know. Christopher. Frightful sight. There was an awful... An awful silly grin on the old dear's face and... Well, Don't you think it would be more to the point if you were to explain the ceremony in connection with tonight's presentation? <laughs> You're right, Reeve. Reeve is a terrible tyrant, but she is efficient. Don't know what I'd do without her. Always ran everything for poor old Granny. Why, when the old girl was ill, she... Oh, uh, Christopher, I gave you a schedule of the ceremonies this morning. What did you do with it? Dash it, Reeve, I don't know. Must have lost it. Well, I have my own copy in the study. <laughs> I swear I don't know what I'd do without you. Excuse us a moment, gentlemen. I'll be back in a jiffy. Holmes, what in thunder is going on here? That boy is completely under the thumb of Mrs. Reeves. He was trying to tell us something, but that frightful woman kept changing the subject. He spoke of an awful, silly grin on the dead woman's face. Didn't that suggest something to you? I do. Oh, that's one of the characteristic symptoms of strychnine poison. Exactly, old fellow. And perhaps he was going on to mention the equally characteristic arching of the body. We've got to get Mr. Horn to ourselves for a little while. And you've got to examine the body of the dead woman. And it's going to be difficult. Hmm. Is there a balcony outside the window? Yes, it is. Come along. Let's see what it leads to. The balcony seems to lead right round this particular wing of the castle. 
must have served as a lookout in the olden days. <laughs> I wish the balcony were a little wider. Must be a sheer drop of a couple of hundred feet down to the, the rocks below. Yeah. Hello. These must be the windows of the room adjoining the one we just came out of. Let's go a little closer, shall we? We may be able to find out something. Can you see anything? Yes. They're in there. Mrs. Reeves and the boy. She's leaving the room. Now's our opportunity. I'll tap on the window. He's seen us. He's coming to open it. What are you two doing out there? Admiring the view? Yes, my boy. It's, it's quite beautiful. Uh, Mr. Horn. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I was a great admirer of your grandmother. I was interested in what you were telling me of her death. She had a... A grin on her face, you said. Yes, it was... It was awful. Her her body was all hunched up like... Like a croquet hoop. Really? Of course, uh, Dr. Oberwald said it was perfectly all right, but I must say it seemed dashed odd to me. Yes, it was far from all right, I, I assure you. And you started to say something else. What was it? Let me see. You said, um, when she was ill... Oh, yes, that was a silly business. When she was ill, she thought she was in danger from poisoning, so she, she made Mrs. Reeves taste all her food and drink. Did she really? Uh, uh, where is your grandmother's body now? In the West Wing. The funeral's to be tomorrow morning. I see. Uh, where did Mrs. Reeves go? I am here on the balcony behind you, gentlemen, listening to your conversation with the greatest interest. Christopher, let me warn you. These men are the emissaries of the British government. They would stop at nothing to take the island over. These men are trying to influence you against me, against Terevi, who has looked after you ever since you were born, and who tries to protect you now that your grandmother has gone and you are alone. Yes, I know, Reevy, but after all... That is your pride as the head of the Horn family, the Seigneur of Garth. The Garth that I am trying to say for you. This man is completely unscrupulous. He was about to accuse me of murder. Weren't you, Mr. Sherlock Holmes? The thought had occurred to me, Mrs. Reeves. Of course it had, because you wished to poison Christopher's mind against me. Well, Mr. Holmes, we have no police on the island of Garth. Our only law is the word of the seigneur, and Christopher now holds that title. Seigneur, what do you say? Will you allow an Englishman to blind you by accusing me of being a murderess? Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson, I shall meet you at the ceremony tonight. Beyond that, I, I don't care to speak to you again. Good day. A shame to spoil your plans, isn't it, Mr. Holmes? <laughs> well, upon the soul. Magnificent, Watson. Magnificent. A murderess who seeks to defeat me by accusing herself. Superb. It's a new game, my dear fellow, and one that must be played to a finish. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that right now is one time you'd really enjoy a glass of Petri California Port. You couldn't ask for a more delicious wine. Petri Port, with its deep, rich red color and its heart-of-the-grape flavor as one of America's all-time favorite wines. Petri Port is wonderful after dinner and perfect to serve when company comes. Try it. But just remember that when you want the kind of port I'm talking about, you've got to make sure it's Petri Port, because all Petri wines are good wines. Dr. Watson, this is certainly an unusual story you're telling us tonight. Uh, what happened after Mrs. Reeves left you and Sherlock Holmes standing on the balcony? We retired to our rooms and had a quiet and lonely lunch. Though the great man said little, I could see that he was deeply excited and that his keen brain was evolving some plan that would enable us to solve the mystery of Mrs. Horne's death. After lunch, we started to descend the stairs leading to the main hall of Garth Castle. As we did so, Holmes said... Uh, what? There are no danger ourselves. Mrs. Reeves knows that we are here as emissaries of the British government. Yes, and if we didn't return with the butter within a few days, there'd be a British dreadnought here looking for us. However, oh. I am in danger of one of my worst defeats. My professional pride is piqued. If only I could... Ah, uh, Watson. Yes, sir? If at any time today I slip you a note, don't read it at once, but... Here comes Mrs. Reeves. Uh, precisely, Watson. I entirely agree. 
If I do not make the test on Mrs. Horn's body within 24 hours of her death, it will be useless. I must make it by 3 o'clock this afternoon. Mr. Holmes! Oh, oh yes, Mrs. Reeves. I want to apologize for my behavior before lunch. I was intolerably rude. Oh, please, no. Whatever my quarrels may be with British politics, I at least owe to both of you the duties of hospitality. Oh, that's very gracious of you, Mrs. Reeves. Uh, I wonder, uh, would your hospitality also include a, a personally conducted tour of the subterranean caverns for which this island has become internationally famous? Would they really interest you? Well, I'm afraid that my friend and I won't have the time. Oh, yes, not at all, Watson, not at all. We have plenty of time. Well, as long as we're back here by three o'clock. I'm sure Dr. Oberwald would be delighted to join us. He has made quite a study of the unique rock formation. Oh, that's splendid. Um, it should prove a most interesting excursion. But, Holmes, why do we want to go stomping around a lot of damp and smelly caves? Well, the exercise will do us good, old fellow. Uh, uh, will you lead the way, Mrs. Reeves? And please remember that it's most important that I return I here... I remember, Mr. Holmes. You must be back here by three o'clock. <laughs> Mr. Holmes, and we shall reach the giant cavern. Ah, most interesting. Uh, Watson and Dr. Oberwald seem to have lagged behind us somewhat. They will be here in a moment. There. This is the giant cavern. Ah, magnificent. Truly a miracle of nature. It's a natural submarine dry dock hewn out of the rocks. Yes, Mr. Holmes. And in the olden days, only the smugglers who inhabited this island knew the entrance that leads to this cave. The first tenure of Gar found a cache of untold wealth hidden here. Piglets. Silks, jewels. There are still the remains of some of the finest Calvados brandy stored among oh, these rocks. Indeed. <laughs> An incomparable drink. Would you care for some? It is our custom whenever visitors honor us with their presence to offer them a glass. <laughs> oh, I should be delighted. There is a natural shelf here in the rock. Perfect hiding place. Here you are, Mr. Holmes. And here is a glass. Oh, this is a rare privilege. I imagine that very few people have been offered it. Only our most distinguished visitors, I assure you. <laughs> this uh, cavern is completely inaccessible from the outer sea, I presume? Completely. Unless, of course, ships could swim under the sea. Which, as you know as well as I, they can, Mrs. Reeves, even outside the imaginings of Jules Verne. Indeed. Uh, would you care to explore a little deeper? The others will be with us soon. Dr. Oberville, the others seem to be some way ahead of us. Yes, they do, don't they, Doctor? Uh, Holmes! Holmes! Where are you? Dear me, I'm afraid we cannot follow them. Uh, what do you mean? The next cavern is already cut off by the rising tide. Great Scott, you mean that they're cut off? I am afraid so. But do not worry here, Doctor. In a few hours, the tide will recede. They are in no danger. Just, uh, shall I say, uh, temporarily marooned. <laughs> Uh, I'm getting confounded with sleepy. I'm so sorry. I'm afraid that we stayed here longer than I intended. I fear that we are cut off by the tides. Cut off by the tides? We're in no danger. In a few hours, we shall be able to return. But uh, I'm afraid I cannot get you back at three o'clock, which was the time I promised. Uh, but it's vital. Uh, absolutely... Vital that I could get back. I'm so sleepy. <laughs> but please keep talking. I must keep awake. Doctor Gobel and I, I must get to Sherlock Holmes at once. I am sorry, here, Doctor, but we are not able to control the forces of nature. We cannot force the water to recede. Your friend is in no danger. No, no, but he's got a most important test that he must make by three o'clock. I am afraid that will be impossible. I've got to do something. 
Uh, you should have come to these blasted caves the first place. And what on earth I ought to do. By Jove, that note that Holmes gave me, he told me to open it. If, uh, where did I put it? Ah, here it is. A note from Mr. Sherlock Holmes, eh? Vital that you make medical test. Great Scott, Dr. Overall, it's absolutely necessary for me to return to the castle at once. Indeed. A note from Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and now it is most important that you return to the castle. No, my fine English friend. I am afraid I cannot allow you to. Well, I don't know how you propose to stop me, sir. You see this revolver? And do you see this stick? I warn you, Herr Doctor. Oh, no, you don't. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't hear me, Dr. Overville, but when Sherlock Holmes gives me orders, I carry them out. Ah. Uh, Mrs. Reeves, are we still trapped by the tide? What, what, what time is it? Five o'clock. I'm afraid that you'll be a trifle late for your important appointment. What a pity. You deliberately trapped me here. You drugged the brandy and kept me a prisoner. Did I? Now, why should I do that, Mr. Holmes? Because you're greedy for power. That's obvious in your domination of that pleasant, the weak young man who is now Senor of Gath. I'm sure your beliefs would find support in certain ideologies now arising in Germany. Your choice of a German doctor as an accomplice in your plans would support that theory. And what might my plans be? I should say that you're determined to give Gath as a submarine base to Germany. With this island in their power, they could control the channel. Very interesting. And I suppose, as well as being a spy, I'm responsible for Mrs. Horn's murder. You and Dr. Oberweil between you. She was too strong for you. You had to get her out of the way. You probably made subtle attempts on her life at first, the origin of which she did not realize, but uh, which caused her eventually to send for me. My arrival forced your hand, and so you and Dr. Oberweil resorted to the quite unsubtle expedient of... Of poisoning her. All pure supposition, Mr. Holmes. The only law on this island is Christopher Horn. Do you suppose he'll believe you? No, I suppose he won't. You've outwitted me, Mrs. Reeves. I walked into your trap just as you intended me to. Then in that case, you may collect your pound of butter tonight and return to the mainland tomorrow. Mrs. Reeves, uh, how much longer do we have to wait for the tide before we can make our way back to the castle? <laughs> we can leave now. We could have left at any time. There's another secret entrance that is above the tide level. I merely had to make you overstay the hour of your test. I could not risk Christopher's seeing definite proof. Come now. I shall lead you back. You fool. <laughs> Where have you been all this time? My bad, Watson. Did you open the note? Yes. Followed my instructions? Yes, it was, as you suspected. Thank heaven, old chap. Then now we can hoist her with our own petard. Shh, shh. Here she comes. I'm glad to see, gentlemen, that you have assembled here in the seigneur's room. The ceremony of presenting the butter traditionally takes place here. As soon as Christopher arrives, we will explain our customs in this matter. Uh, Dr. Watson, I trust that Herr Oberwald proved an interesting companion on your excursion this afternoon. Yes, it's indeed most interesting. We had a discussion of the relative merits of the walking stick versus the revolver. I think I was able to make my argument fairly convincing. Where is Dr. Oberwald now? I imagine he's lying down. He had all the symptoms of impending headache when I, I saw him last. Why are you smiling, Mr. Holmes? What's been going on? I'm afraid, Mrs. Reeves, that your plans have misfired rather badly. As soon as Mr. Horn arrives, I expect you will be under arrest for murder and high treason. Christopher would never believe you. Wouldn't I? Mrs. Reeves, you poisoned my grandmother. Christopher, what lies have these men been telling you? You're the one that's been telling me lies. I believed you when you said you'd been tasting the old lady's food. But when Dr. Watson showed me the results of his test this afternoon... It was as clear as daylight. But the tests could prove nothing after 24 hours had passed. You said so yourself, Mr. Holmes. A deliberate lie, Mrs. Reeves. I'm afraid that I invented that mythical 24-hour test. I knew that as soon as I mentioned it, you would attempt to prevent my carrying it out. So I was delighted when you fell into my trap. You thought that you were shanghaiing me, whereas in reality I was shanghaiing you. My job is to prove your guilt to the senor. With your dominant presence away from the household, it was easy for Dr. Watson to make his test. You devil! You knew all the time! Oh, of course I did. But I had to deceive you. 
I'm glad my performance was sufficiently convincing. By the way, Mrs. Reeves, the drug brandy was dreadfully clumsy. You didn't drink it, huh? Oh, of course I didn't. But it was very unflattering to me that uh, Mrs. Reeves thought I might. Mrs. Reeves, you realize what this means, don't you? I'm going to ask these gentlemen to take you and Dr. Oberwald back to the mainland with them tomorrow. And stand trial in a British court? Never! I was born on the island of Garth. I have lived here all my life and I shall die! Reeves, what are you up to? Stop her! She's going out on the balcony. One day, Garth will belong to Germany. One day, the whole world will belong to Germany. Goodbye, you meddling fool. Goodbye! Rich touch is gone. It must be a couple of hundred feet to the rocks below. What a dreadful thing. I still can't believe she was a murderess and, and a traitor. Now... Shot. Oh, shabby finished with shabby business. Mr. Horn, I suggest that we make sure Dr. Oberwald does not escape justice and that we then perform the ritual presentation of the butter. Yes, Mr. Holmes. The island of Garth will still pay tribute to England, and I think it always will. <laughs> Doctor, that was some story. So Germany didn't get the island of Garth after all. No, Mr. Bartell. In fact, in after years, the island proved to be an invaluable submarine base for England. Say, um, what about the pound of butter? Did Holmes get it? Oh, yes, yes. But why are you so interested in the, in the butter? Are you kidding? In our house, butter is our second most favorite topic of conversation. Your second most favorite? Well, what's your favorite topic of conversation? Remember, you asked me. Petri wine. Oh, as if I didn't know. Doctor, that Petri wine is something to really talk about. You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Why, the art of making fine wine is their heritage. Handed down from father to son, from father to son. Believe me, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, the Petri family really knows how. And they're proud of their wine, too. That's why the name Petri on a bottle of wine really means something. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of that wine is good wine. It ought to be because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that took place on the Sussex Downs many, many years ago. It concerns a young girl... A painter in watercolors and a very wise old lady. I call it The Adventure of the Living Doll. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story... The Adventure of the Bruce Poddington Plans. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, and say, I'd like to tell you about something myself. I'd like to tell you about the wine that more Americans prefer than any other wine. That wine is port. And if you want to know why port is such a favorite, just pour yourself a glass of wonderful Petri California port. Look at that Petri port. Look at its glowing deep red color. And sample that aroma. It'll remind you of, of a walk through a dew-covered vineyard. 
And now taste that Petri Port. Boy, you've got something. Petri Port is one of the most delicious wines ever poured from a bottle. Right then and there, Petri Port will become your favorite wine. I'm confident of that. And I'm sure you'll want to serve Petri Port to your friends, too. After dinner or any time they drop in for a visit. And remember, you can serve Petri Port proudly. Because those letters, P-E-T-R-I, spell the proudest name in the history of American wines. Petri. Petri wine. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. Ah, oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening. Uh, oh, excuse me, Dr. Watson. I, I didn't know that you had company. Shut the door, my boy, and come in and join us. Let me introduce you, Mr. Bartell. This is my friend, Mrs. Campbell. How do you do, Mrs. Campbell? How do you do, Mr. Bartell? Mrs. Campbell is a very old friend of mine from England, and when she called on me today, I persuaded her to stay and have dinner and then join us in this little session of, of storytelling. You see, Mr. Bartell, she's really what you might call the star of the Sherlock Holmes adventure that I'm going to tell you tonight. Oh, come now, Dr. Watson. I actually played a very small part in the story. In any case, I was much too young at the time to know what was really going on. Say, this is a great idea, Doctor. One of the characters out of your fabulous past here in California in 1946 and helps tell her own story. Oh, no, Mr. Bartell. I'm no storyteller. That's the doctor's department. I'll just listen. No, 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 my dear. I'll set the scene, but you must uh, ring up the curtain, as it were. In any case, my memory isn't too clear on some of the early points in connection with the case. You will have to help me out. Oh, but you're talking to millions of listeners on the radio. I'd be terrified to speak over the air. We're on the air now, Mrs. Campbell. Oh, oh, we're not, are we? Oh, oh, dear. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Don't worry, Cynthia. If they're kind enough to listen to me week after week, I'm sure they'll be delighted to hear you. And now to get on with the story. The title, The Adventure of the Living Doll. The setting, the Sussex Downs near the bee farm to which Sherlock Holmes retired. The period, 1910. And now, Cynthia, my dear, the curtain's going up. And the first scene belongs to you. Supposing you set it for us. Well, I I'll try we were living on the Sussex Downs also, Mr. Bartell, at that time. My name was then Cynthia Browning. My father, Arthur Browning, had been dead for some years. But my mother kept up the estate with a manager, a Mr. Hugh Tanner. I was away at school most of the year, of course. But the happiest times of my childhood were spent during those long summer months in Sussex. I lived in a small world, knowing only a few people and loving all of them, or almost all. First of all, there was Mother herself. She was the most beautiful woman in the world, and the sweetest. I remember she gave me a puppy on my twelfth birthday. His name was Dusty, and he was so sweet. I talked to Mother about him one day. I, I must have sounded terribly young. Mommy, darling, I do love Dusty very, very much. He's a lovely puppy, and you gave him to me. You love him, Cynthia. I know that, but I've been feeding him. That's your job, darling. It's good for grown-up people to have responsibility. Oh, Mommy, I'll feed him. Of course I will. I'll feed him so full, he'll burst. Then there was the estate manager, Hugh Tanner, such a pleasant man, and so willing to tell a 12-year-old all the things that a 12-year-old has to know or die. But, Mr. Tanner, why did you have to shoot the horse? He'd only broken his leg. Cynthia, horses aren't like human beings. Their legs won't mend. Now think of a horse that couldn't frisk and run and, and gallop across the downs. We're actually being kind to him. Honest we are, Cynthia. And then there was Frank King, the painter who lived on the downs. He taught me to open my eyes and really see things. No, 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 Cynthia. That sunset isn't red. It's gold and rust. And the water, child, look at it. It's almost rose in this light. Rose flecked with cobwebs of eggshell blue. Cynthia, darling, a sunset's never just one color. Do try and remember that, won't you? And then there was Mr. Pound from the city. I gathered that he was terribly rich and he wanted to marry Mother. But he certainly didn't understand little girls. Uh, uh, Cynthia, I'm going to give you half a crown for being a very good little girl. Now, uh, tell me, what will you do with it? I'll buy something for money. Oh, no, no, my dear. This is your own money. Uh, you put it in the savings account at the post office. 
and it'll make more money for you. Always remember, my dear, take care of the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves. Then there was the wonderful wise woman who knew all the things that aren't in books. Always remember, my bunny, that it's good luck to touch the hump of a hunchback. But the curse of Beelzebub himself will be upon ye if ye look at a sliver of silver moon through the glass. And then the strangest and most wonderful of them all was the lean middle-aged man with a sharp face and the bee net whom I met one day on the downs. Good afternoon, young lady. Good afternoon. I'm Cynthia Browning. My name is Holmes. Sherlock Holmes. Why are you carrying that net? You're looking for butterflies? Oh, 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 no, Cynthia. I'm a bee farmer. Bee farmer? Oh, that sounds funny. How do you farm bees? Well, come over to my place one day and I'll show you. I say, that's a beautiful doll you're carrying. Isn't a doll. It's my mascot. It was given to me by Frank King, the painter. He made it for me. He made it to look as much like me as possible. I call her me. It's remarkable likeness. See the hair? That's clippings off my hair. And the nails? Those are clippings from my own nails. She's really me. And I love her. Your own nails and hair? And the doll is an exact replica of you? I don't like that, Cynthia. Um, remember, my dear, my name, uh, will you, uh, it's uh, Sherlock Holmes, and I live at the bee farm, and if anything unusual happens, uh, come to me at once. Of course, Dr. Watson. I'll confess that that first meeting with Sherlock Holmes rather frightened me. You didn't understand why he was so worried about the doll, eh? No, but I remembered what he said about coming to him if anything unusual happened. And I'm sure that that unusual something did happen. Yes, Mr. Bartell, and within a very few days. But at this point, I think Dr. Watson should take over the story. It's where he and Mr. Holmes really entered into it. Oh, very well. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Bartell, I was staying with Holmes. Late in the afternoon, as I remember that you ran over to the bee farm where I first met you, Cynthia. A few moments before you arrived, Holmes and I, each of us with a cup of tea in our hands, were seated on the veranda, gazing out across the downs, and discussing the mutability of human affairs. It is strange, Watson, that after a lifetime devoted to the more flamboyant aspects of everyday life, that now, in what is the fast approaching twilight of my days, I find such... Peace and companionship in the exact and predictable behavior of bees. <laughs> I wonder what Mariotti would have thought. Oh, you talking as if you're an old daughter of 90. You say what you like, but I don't think that you'll ever really be happy in retirement. You miss the danger, the, the excitement of the chase, the, the public acclaim. What, what are you talking about? <laughs> yes, My work was never for the public. <clears throat> what did the public, the great unobservant public, who could hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a typesetter by his left thumb care about the finer shades of analysis or deduction. In any case, Watson, I chose a happy time to sink into oblivion. In comparatively recent years, the criminal seems to have lost all his originality and enterprise. My own little practice when I gave it up seemed to be in danger of developing into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils or giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. Oh, talking of young ladies, who's this little girl running up your driveway? Oh, great Scott, it's uh, little Cynthia, Cynthia Browning. Oh, and who's she? Oh, a charming young neighbor of mine. Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Mr. Holmes. You've come to see how I farm bees, haven't you? No, Mr. Holmes. You told me to come to you. Something unusual happened. It has. Something that's frightened me. Well, now, sit down, my dear. This is my old friend, Dr. Watson. Oh, how do you do, Cynthia? How do you do? Ah, Cynthia, dear. What has frightened you? It's my mascot. My me. Look. Somebody stabbed her through the heart. Great Scott, a doll that's an exact replica of her. With a penknife thrust into it. Good uh, gracious me. When did you find your... your mascot like this? Just after tea. Mummy had some gentlemen calling on her. And afterwards I went up to my room and found poor me on the bed. I remembered what you told me about anything unusual. And so I came over here as fast as I could. Yes, I'm glad that you did, Cynthia. But did you tell your mother where you'd gone with her? No, I didn't. She was still talking to the gentleman. Well, she'll be... She'll worry about you when she discovers your disappearance. No, don't worry, Watson. I shall go over and talk to her at once. Now, Cynthia, my dear. Yes, Mr. Holmes? Uh, who were the gentlemen calling on your mother? Well, there was Mr. Tanner. Yes. He's the man who looks after the estate for mummy. Mm -hmm. Mr. King, the painter. Mr. King is the man who made this doll, eh? Now, who else was there? Mr. Pound. He's a businessman from London that's staying with mummy. Hmm. And they were all present in your house when you found the do The, uh... Mascot lying on the bed. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Mm. What's no chap? 
Yes, sir? I'm going over to see Cynthia's mother at once. I want Cynthia to stay here with you. Guard her, old chap, as you would your life. Uh, Mrs. Browning, I know I must seem like an intrusive neighbor, but uh, possibly you've heard of me. My name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. Well, who hasn't heard of the famous Sherlock Holmes? Uh, please sit down, won't oh, you? Thank you. Your guests have left? Yes. But how did you know I had guests? I know you're a great detective, Uh, Your charming little daughter, Cynthia, came over to see me half an hour ago. She told me. So that's where she went. Uh, Did she come back with Uh, you? No, Mrs. Browning. I felt it safer that she remained at my place for a while. My friend, Dr. Watson, will look after her. I'm afraid uh, she may be in danger. In danger? Mr. Holmes, what makes you say that? You know your daughter's doll, the one fashioned in her own likeness and with her own hair and nails? Of course. Frank King made it for her. Uh, While you were at tea this afternoon, your daughter found the doll lying on her bed. With a penknife stuck through its heart. That's very peculiar. But I don't see that she should be in any danger because of it, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Mrs. Browning, certain practitioners of magic believe that if a doll-like effigy is made of a human being, and the effigy is then mutilated, that a similar fate will befall the living original. But, Mr. Holmes, that's black magic. You can't possibly believe in it. Not in the results of stabbing a doll, Mrs. Browning, but I... Well, it's possible that someone is trying to kill your daughter. To kill Cynthia? Oh, no. It may be more than a possibility, I'm afraid. And when these magical means fail, they will turn to more direct methods. But who could possibly want her death? You, uh... You have not remarried, Mrs. Uh, Browning. No, I feel it my duty to devote my life to Arthur's child, Cynthia. Yes, then anyone wishing to marry you might feel that Cynthia stood in the way. But that's absurd. But logical, Mrs. Browning... Do you mind if I ask you a very personal question? With Cynthia's safety at stake, you may ask any question. Are any of the three men who were present at tea this afternoon desirous of marrying you? Well, I... Please be completely honest, Mrs. Browning. Uh, At different times, they've all asked me to marry them, yes. And you won't contemplate marriage because of your dead husband's child? hmm? Uh, Tell me, Mrs. Browning, have you seen this penknife before? It was the one found stuck through the doll's heart. I don't think I've ever seen it before. One final question. Would anyone among Cynthia's acquaintances have a knowledge of uh, the practice of magic? Well, uh, the old woman that Cynthia called the wise woman might. Oh, who might she be? A strange creature that lives in some hovel on the downs near here. Mm -hmm. She brews weird concoctions with herbs, love filters, and all that sort of thing. I'd be a suitable companion for your daughter, Mrs. Browning. I know it, Mr. Holmes. I've told Cynthia over and over again that she mustn't stray off and see the old woman. But you know how disobedient children are at her age. I'm sure she's been over there recently. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk to this woman. Where does she live? I don't know exactly, but Frank can take you there. He used her as a model. Uh, Frank King, the the painter? Yes, he lives in the village. Mm. Then I shall call on him at once and persuade him to accompany me. We must find that wise woman and I hope save your child from magic. Magic and possible murder. much further, Mr. King. Only a few more yards, Mr. Holmes. A little cottage is just behind the trees there. It's a pretty broken down place. Poor old girl has only a few pennies to her name, I imagine. Mrs. Browning was telling me that you used this old woman as a model. Yes, she was a fascinating subject. I painted her as she was mixing up some devil's concoction of herbs and spices. I had her standing over a smoking cauldron with the firelight playing on her. It was... It was quite effective. Yes, it must have been. The uh, the subject of witchcraft appeals to you, Mr. King? I I don't know anything about it. It was just that she was such a wonderful subject for a painter. Mm. Here we are. I'll knock on the door. I think we'll take the liberty of going in, shall we? Hmm, I don't see why not. What is it? Listen. Came from that room. Someone is here. Come on. Look at her. Look at her head. Poor devil. Yes, she's still alive. She isn't long for this world. Can you hear me? Here, let me lift you up a little. Can you understand what I'm saying? Tell me. Who was it that did this to you? She's too far gone to speak. Got a piece of paper and a pencil? Yes. Wait a minute. There you are. Thanks. Now, can you write the name of the man who did this to you? She's pushing the pencil away. I don't suppose she knows how to write. She's trying to show you something, Mr. Holmes. 
She's trying to crawl over to the wall. Yes. Here, let me help you. It must be a hiding place of some kind. Look. She's taking a brick out of the wall. What is it? Wait, Scott. Money. A vegetable jackdaw's nest of pennies. And small silver. And at least a dozen golden sovereigns. That must be the money. Look. She's picking out one of the silver coins. She's trying to give it to you. A sixpence, but what? Oh, poor woman, she's dead. Just as she was trying to tell me something. I can't understand it. Golden sovereigns in this hovel, and she was... She was showing you a silver sixpence as she died. Mr. Holmes, what are you going to do? First, check on the young girl's safety. Meanwhile, I should like you to go back to my mother's. Assemble the other two men who were present at tea time this afternoon and keep them there until I arrive. I shan't be long. But the police... I shall summon the Mr. King when I have the murderer to offer them. And I'm convinced that that will be before the sun sets tonight. We'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. Time enough for me to mention another wonderful Petri wine. Petri California Muscatel. If you like that subtle muscat flavor, who doesn't, you really like Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is a clear golden wine that is just as much a hit with the ladies as Petri Port is with the men. But I don't mean by that that only the ladies like Petri Muscatel. In fact, if you want to be sure to please everybody, get both Petri Port and Petri Muscatel. In other words, don't buy one, buy two. But do be sure you always buy Petri. Now back to Dr. Watson and his guest tonight, Mrs. Campbell, who played a most important part in the story herself. Oh, not nearly as important a part as that played by Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened when Sherlock Holmes rejoined you at the bee farm? Well, first of all, he made sure that the little girl was safe. And then he told me of finding the dead woman and of his theories as to the killing. I can almost hear him now, Mr. Bartell, as he said... Watson, <clears throat> someone wanted the little girl out of the way because they knew the mother would never marry while the child was alive. And that someone persuaded the old woman to do the job for him, I suppose. Undoubtedly. And she, believing in the powers of black magic, mutilated the doll, firmly convinced that in so doing she was destroying the young girl it was fashioned after. And then, I suppose, when the potential murderer discovered the woman was merely indulging in stupid folklore, he killed her, mm-hmm. realizing she was only a hindrance to him, and with her knowledge of the plan... A dangerous hindrance. Exactly, my dear fellow. But um, how do you suppose we account for the hoard of money? Golden sovereigns, don't forget, that we found in the hovel. Well, no doubt it was a sum that she was already being paid for the murder that she was going to commit. Mm. As she died, she tried to give me the clue to her murderer by selecting certain, certain coin. Now, in her possession, she had gold, silver, and copper. She chose a silver coin. And yet I can't see its significance, I must confess. Well, at the moment, possibly not. And yet, before the evening's over... I bet you that... What did you say, Watson? I said before the evening's over, I I bet you... Thank you, old fellow. That's the clue. You bet me. What on earth are you talking about, Holmes? I was just saying... You've just given me the answer to the whole problem, Watson. What? I'm much obliged to you. Stay here, will you, old chap? And look after Cynthia a little while longer. Within a very short time, I shall have her intended destroyer under lock and key. Mr. Holmes, I'm glad you've come. I've had the greatest difficulty in persuading these three gentlemen that their presence was necessary. Within a few minutes, Mrs. Browning, two of them will be entirely free to leave if they want to. Mr. Holmes, I think it'd be a good idea to tell everyone what happened. Yes, uh, well, uh, Mr. Pound, Mr. Holmes, I don't I think it'd I... be a good idea to Indeed. tell everyone what happened. Yes, how do you do, Mr. Pound? Oh, oh how, how do you do, Mr. Holmes? Uh, look here. If there's some scandal down oh, here... Oh, there is, Mr. Pound. Uh, then I want my name kept out of it. You hear? I, I have a seat on the London Stock Exchange. Oh, very comfortable for you. Yes. <laughs> and the other gentleman, by the process of elimination, must be Mr. Hugh Tanner, the manager of your estate, Mrs. Browning. Yes, I'm Hugh Tanner. And now, Mr. Holmes, supposing you tell us what this is all about... I'm a straightforward man, and all this mystery is rather aggravating. Something has happened. Something that concerns us all. What is it? 
Murder. Murder? <laughs> Murder? Good Lord, who's been murdered? An old woman who lived in the village. Your daughter, Mrs. Browning, referred to her as the wise woman. Mr. King and I found her tonight in her cottage on the downs, beaten to death. Murdered. Well, that's shocking, but well, what's it got to do with us? I'll explain, Mr. Pound. Each one of you, I believe, would like to marry Mrs. Browning. Her daughter, Cynthia, is an obstacle to such a marriage. One of you decided to remove that obstacle and engage the wise woman to carry out the plan. Finding the woman clumsy and ineffective, you decided that she was a dangerous witness, and so you murdered her. Fortunately, the poor woman, as she was dying, gave me the clue to her murderer. But how did she do that, Mr. Holmes? I thought you said that she died without speaking. Uh, she did, Mrs. Barning, but she gave me the clue nonetheless, though I was shockingly slow in spotting it. Well, what was the clue? Uh, yes, let's, let's stop being mysterious and come out into the open. Now, you were with me, Mr. King. As she died, I shall let you tell them. Well, she was dying, unable to speak when Mr. Holmes asked who had attacked her. She couldn't write, but she showed him a hoard of copper and silver coins and a dozen golden sovereigns. Sovereigns in a hovel like that? Oh, I, I, I see. She meant her murderer was the man who had paid her. And with all that ill-gotten wealth, she died clutching a silver sixpence. Well, and you I... still don't uh, see who the murderer is? <laughs> Come along, gentlemen. You should know it as well as you know your own names. Now, when Mr. King mentioned that there were a dozen sovereigns, whose name does a sovereign suggest? Sovereign? Sovereign? King! You, Frank King, were the murderer. Oh, that's ridiculous. The old woman wasn't exactly a mastermind. Why should she be so, so indirect? And how much is a sovereign worth? A pound. And your name, my friend, with a seat on the London Stock Exchange is pound. Oh, isn't it? this is absolutely absurd. I can prove that I've never even met the woman. Well, what is the answer, Mr. Holmes? I'm sure that you know it. The answer is obvious, Mrs. Browning, though I'm ashamed to say that a chance remark of Dr. Watson's gave me the clue. Oh, now look here. Stop beating about the bush, Holmes. What is the answer? A very simple one, Mr. Pound. With 12 golden sovereigns at hand, sovereigns that would suggest either the name of King or Pound, what coin did the dying woman select? A sixpence. Exactly. A humble silver sixpence. And what is the common slang word for a sixpence? A tanner. Precisely. Which tells us that you, Mr. Hugh Tanner, killed the wise lady. Try and prove it. That's all. Just try and prove it. <laughs> What happened? I found the murder, old chap, thanks to you. What do you mean, thanks to me? Well, I was thinking of a sixpence, the coin the dead woman clutched in her hand, as a sixpence. When you said, I bet you, I thought of the much-used expression, bet your tanner. That gave me the clue to the whole business. The dying woman was obviously trying to indicate that Hugh Tanner was her murderer. He confessed, you say, before the police arrived. Yes, after Frank King, the artist, had started to give him... Something of the thrashing he deserved. Oh, I take no particular pride in the case, Watson. Without your chance remark, I might easily have overlooked this obvious clue that the dying woman gave me. As I've said before, old chap, I should not attempt to emerge from my retirement. Yes, 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 yes. It's obvious that my reflexes are shockingly slow. Rubbish. The police would never have solved it. Oh, my dear Watson, when you compare me with the police, I realize that my retirement should be permanent. Uh, by the way, um, where is Cynthia? Well, I arranged with your housekeeper for her to have an early supper. Some kippers, a poached egg or two, a piece of that treacle tart oh, we had last night, and a pot of tea. Oh, for a 12-year-old girl, my dear Watson... This is an occasion when I might accuse you of being a potential murderer. Oh, come now, Holmes, you know perfectly well. Uh, Shh. Uh, Here she comes now. Hello, Cynthia. Did you enjoy your supper? It was lovely. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Is everything all right? Can I go home now? Yes, Cynthia. Everything's all right. Uh, tell me, my dear, did you ask Mr. King to make that mascot for you? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The wise woman told me it would bring me luck. Oh, yes, I thought so. Mr. Holmes, will everything be just like before? No, not quite, Cynthia. Uh, Mr. Tanner and the wise woman have gone away. You, uh, uh, you won't see them again. Oh, dear. But you have new friends here, haven't you? Yes, and nice ones. Remember that, Cynthia. We'll always be your friends. I will, Dr. Watson. I like you both so much. Ah, oh, I'm glad. <laughs> and tell me, Cynthia, uh, do you like Mr. King, the artist? Oh, yes. Almost as much as I used to like my daddy. Uh -huh. He's like my daddy, a little. Oh, I'm glad to hear you say that, Cynthia. Uh, tell your mother the same thing, will you? I think it might change a peculiarly foolish notion of hers. Well, 
Well, Dr. Watson and Mrs. Campbell, that was a, a really different kind of story. I, I'm sure glad you were here tonight, Mrs. Campbell. Tell me, um, has Dr. Watson changed much since you last saw him? Well, yes. I think he's grown handsome. No, 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 no. And, and uh, what about Mrs. Campbell, Doctor? Has uh, she changed? Well, she is more grown up for the last time I saw her, but she hasn't changed much in one respect. <laughs> What's that, Doctor? Your appetite, my dear. Oh. <laughs> I remember how Holmes was amazed at the amount you ate when you were a child, but you certainly had just as hotly a dinner this evening. Well, that was your fault, Doctor. Your dinner was too good. Oh, <laughs> Cynthia, don't, don't talk about the wine. Well, why shouldn't I talk about the wine? It was wonderful. Sure it was. It was Petri wine, that's why. You see? Now you've got him started. And Mrs. Campbell, Petri wine is always good wine. That's because the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Ever since long ago when they started the Petri business, winemaking has been an art with the Petri family. It's a tradition, a heritage that they've handed on down from father to son, from father to son. Believe me, when it comes to turning luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into fragrant, delicious wine, well, you can bet your last dollar that the Petri family really knows how. No matter what type of wine you prefer, for any occasion, you just can't miss with a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure are you planning to tell us next week? Well, as next week, as St. Patrick's Day is only about six days away, Mr. Bartell, I... I thought next week that I'd tell you a rather unusual story that took place in Ireland at the turn of the century. It concerns the famous ceremony of kissing the Blarney Stone, St. Patrick's Night Revel, and an old Irish ballad that led directly to one of the most devilish murders that Sherlock Holmes and I ever encountered. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes' adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of the Copper Beaches. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. You can read about the stars of our broadcast in the April issue of Everybody's Digest. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another story about his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And incidentally, I'd like to tell you about a swell American custom. The custom of serving sherry wine just before dinner. Petri California sherry. You know, especially when you have guests, while you're waiting for that call to the dinner table, there's nothing better than a good glass of that good Petri sherry. You don't need fancy glasses for Petri Sherry. No, sir. That wine tastes good out of any glass. And it looks good, too. Beautifully clear and the color of precious amber. Just try that Petri Sherry and you'll feel like smacking your lips after every sip. Oh, and say, Petri makes two kinds of Sherry. The regular Sherry and Petri Pale Dry Sherry. Just to make sure you get the perfect Sherry for the whole family, don't buy one, buy two. But do be sure the sherry you buy is Petri Sherry. Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wine. And now 
I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join. Come in, come in, come in. Oh, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Good evening, Doctor. Say, where are the puppies this evening? Mr. Bartell, don't you think it's about time you began to refer to them as the dogs? They're almost a year old, you know. <laughs> I stand corrected. Where are the dogs this evening? Well, they had another furious battle with a dead seal on the beach today. My housekeeper, Mrs. West, is giving them a much-needed bath. <laughs> they certainly have an aversion to seals, don't they? Well, Doctor, are you all ready with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? Yes, my boy, and as yesterday was St. Patrick's Day... I decided to tell you a story that took place in Ireland uh, a few years before the turn of the century. I imagine that you've heard of kissing the Blarney Stone, haven't you? Oh, yes, Doctor, though I've never understood exactly what it meant. Well, let me explain it to you, because the ceremony plays a, a very important part in the story tonight. Blarney Castle is an imposing 15th century ruin a few miles outside the town of Cork. The castle is many stories high, and in the foremost tower... The famous Blarney Stone is, is situated. What's supposed to be the point in kissing it, Doctor? The stone is considered a powerful talisman, and the legend runs that whoever kisses it is endowed with eloquence for life. <laughs> Say, Doctor, if I ever get over to Ireland, I'll certainly kiss that stone. But you're such a storyteller yourself, Doctor. I, how about you've kissed it, huh? No, Mr. Bartell, I'm afraid I never had quite enough courage. Courage? Well, why does it need courage, Doctor? Well, because the Blarney Stone is, is set in a most inaccessible position on the outside wall. To kiss it, it is customary to lower the candidate for eloquence over the rampart, head foremost, with a friend hanging on to his heels. From the top of a castle? It does sound dangerous, Doctor. Well, it was, my boy. So much so that in recent years, a great row of iron spikes has put round the parapet to prevent an accident. Though, of course, at the time tonight's story took place... There was no such guard. And I have a feeling that an accident did take place, no, Doctor. No, 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 Mr. Bartell. Let me tell you the story from the beginning. Sherlock Holmes and I were staying in the city of Cork, where the great man had just solved a singular affair which the local press had referred to as the Leprechaun Murders. A few days before our departure for England, we paid a visit to Blarney Castle. I must confess that I had a certain desire to test the miraculous powers attributed to the Blarney Stone... I very soon changed my mind, however, as Holmes and I stood there, high on the turrets of Blarney Castle, and watched a terrified initiate being hauled up by his ankles and yelling at the top of his voice. Pull me up! Pull me up quickly! I, I think I'm going to faint! Great, Scott, I had no idea that kissing the Blarney Stone was such a hazardous proceeding, huh? Yes. It would seem that eloquence could be more easily obtained than by hanging suspended by one's ankles from a battlement with a hundred foot drop below and kissing a piece of stone? Oh, I'll never do that again. Oh, I'll never, I never. I must say, I don't blame the fuller. <laughs> and yet, my dear chap, on our way over here, you expressed a sneaking desire to kiss the stone yourself. I'll be very happy to hold your ankles if you want to try the experiment. No, no, thank you. After witnessing the ceremony, I've changed my mind. Then I suggest we make our way back downstairs. I don't think there's much more to be seen up here. Very well. By the way, Holmes, do you know the origin of the superstition regarding the, the Blarney Stone? Yes, I do, old chap. The stone was, um, <clears throat> the story of the stone dates back to the middle of the 15th century. A certain Cormac McCarthy called the Strong, a descendant of the ancient kings of Munster and builder of this castle, chanced one day to save an old woman from drowning. In her gratitude, she offered Cormac a golden tongue, which would have the power to influence men and women, friends and foes, as he willed. She told him to mount the battleman and kiss a certain stone in the wall five feet below the gallery running around the top. He followed her directions and obtained all the fluent persuasiveness she had promised. And I suppose the story spread in the Blarney Stone has been a magnet to pilgrims ever since. Yeah, that's pleasant legend. Uh, Holmes. Yes, old chap? Tomorrow's St. Patrick's Day. I, I bet there'll be quite a bit of excitement in the village tonight. Don't you think it'd be rather fun to pay a visit to one of the local inns? Splendid idea, old chap. Our rather arduous work here in Ireland is concluded, and I think we're... More than entitled to a little gaiety. In Dublin, the city, the girl of the sovereignty, was there that I first met with Molly Malone. 
Charming, quite charming. A waiter and singing at his work. Singing very well, too. Just the same. I wish someone would come and take our order. Oh, there's a barmaid. I'll see if I can catch her eye. Hi. Uh, miss? Miss? Would you gentlemen be after wanting something? Yes, my dear. My friend and I would like a little refreshment. And what would you suggest? What would I suggest, Your Honor? Oh, be good. Uh, there's but one drink a gentleman like yourself should be after pouring down you. And that's the cream of Connemora. Whiskey that'll soften your heart and, and make you glow with a good feeling so so that the little people will be after visiting you. <laughs> it sounds delightful. Bring two glasses, will you? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. I, I must say, I never heard an English barmaid go into such rhapsodies over a nip of whiskey. No, the Irish are distinctly more colorful in their speech. It's an interesting fact, though, Watson, that uh, the Irish are curiously unrewarding in the criminal world. England, Scotland, America, Australia have all produced classics of crime. But the Irish murders, almost without exception, have been purely physical... Affairs of hot blood. You say that rather regretfully, Holmes. No, my dear chap. No, no, no. I say, Watson. Look at this rather florid-looking gentleman coming towards our table. Uh, it looks to me as if he's a little under the weather. You fellas have got to have a drink with me. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. But we've just ordered one. Well, you've got to have it with me. I went to the races at Cork today and made a killing. I'm going to buy all the drinks here tonight. I'm afraid that... Uh, Nothing to be, be afraid of. I'll, I'll sit down with you for a moment. There. My name's Hanking, Jeffrey Hanking. What's yours? Uh, mine is Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do, do, do sir? How do you do? Your honors, uh, that'll be one and six. Here, yeah, I'm paying for these here. Half a crown, and you can keep the change. Oh, oh blessings you, on you, Your Honor. Oh, well, if you insist on paying for our drinks, Mr. Hankin, here's your very good help. Yes, indeed. You're, uh, you're both English, aren't you? Yes, sir. So am I, and it's certainly a relief to hear an English voice again. Oh, you don't like the Irish lilt, sir? Can't bear it. <laughs> Personally, I find it rather charming. Yes, indeed, so do I. Well, you wouldn't if you had to live with it all the time. Sometimes I think that if I hear one more Irish tenor singing Molly Malone, or one more reference to the little people, I shall go raving mad. <laughs> you live in Ireland, sir? Yeah, I have to. I own a half interest in the tweed mill here, you see. In any case, my wife's Irish, and she thinks there's no other country in the world, so I suppose I'm stuck here. Uh, see that couple sitting at the table over there? You mean the fellow with a with very beautiful girl? Yes. Man's Michael Corker and my partner. Oh, the girl's absolutely ravishing. <laughs> You'd like to meet her? I'd like to, my George, yes. What, what do you say, Holmes? Oh, very well, Watson. The combination of my natural curiosity and your taste for a pretty face would um, seem to suit the occasion admirably. Well, I might as well warn you, Doctor, that the pretty face... Belongs to my wife. Your wife? Oh, good question. I'm sorry, sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to... Oh, you better bring your glasses with you. <laughs> Molly, my dear, I want you to meet two English friends of mine. Mr. Holmes and uh, Dr. Watson. How do you oh, do? How do you do, Mr. Holmes, Dr. Watson? Won't you sit down and join us? And this is my partner, Michael Corker. Uh, how do you do, Mr. Corker? How do you do, sir? I'm glad to meet you. Please be seated, gentlemen. Are you visiting here in Cork, Mr. Uh, yes, Holmes? Mrs. Ankin, but uh, we're returning to England in a few days. You've been to Blarney Castle, I hope. Oh, oh yes, we were there this afternoon. And uh, did either of you have the courage to kiss the Blarney Stone? No, no, we didn't. I'm afraid it's an athletic feat that's beyond me. It's a lot of rubbish, that's <laughs> what it is. <laughs> Kissing a slab of stone. Uh, have you the courage to do it, Geoffrey? Oh, of course I have, but I don't want to make a fool of myself. Where's the barmaid? Kathleen, I'll make a wager, Geoffrey, that you haven't the courage to kiss the stone. How much shall you bet, Michael? I'll wager a ten-pound note on it. It's a bet, and you fellows witnessed it. I'll kiss the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow, and you'll be ten pounds the poorer, Michael. And I suggest that Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson be present as well. They can act as referees. Geoffrey, dear, don't get so excited. Well, I don't like it when Michael suggests I don't have courage. You want some more drink, Mr. Henry? Yes, all of us want some more. Uh, no more for me, thank you, Mr. No, 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 no more and for me, And I thank think you. you've had enough, Geoffrey. Well, don't tell me when I've had enough, Molly. In Dublin, this fair city, the girls... Oh, no, not that filthy song. Yes, yeah, Mr. Hankin, I find the traditional Irish melodies quite beautiful. And I find them the revolting. Stop! Jeffrey, quiet. Would your honour be wanting me to sing another song? My honour would like you to shut up that filthy caterwaul. Really, sir, really, oh, I call it Mr. Goldberg. Uh, Sean... Please go on with your singing. In Dublin's fair city... You heard me, you great bog trotting gazoon. I said shut up, and I meant shut up! Oh. Jeffrey, I'm leaving here at once. Michael, please to take me home. It'll be my pleasure, Molly. You're an ugly man, Mr. Henkin. Knocking down poor Sean when he was singing just like a bird. Oh, the devil with him, and all of you. No Irishman will be after forgiving you for this night's work. 
No, not the little people of old Ireland either. You've made more enemies, Mr. Hankin, than you'll ever see. But you'll be knowing they're there. Fiddlesticks. You can't frighten me with your stupid Irish superstition. Well, bless my soul, that was a charming little party, I must say. Englishmen like Hankin are a disgrace to their country. Fortunately, they're not represented at all. Yes, I must say, I'd hate to have a curse put on me like that barmaid laid on him. Watson. Yes? Did you see the glances which Mr. Hankin's partner and his wife exchanged as the brawl started? There was more menace to him in those glances than in all the threats of all the little people in Ireland. Yes. I thought that there was something between them. I say, Holmes, that bet about Hankin kissing the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow, do you suppose... I suppose that... nothing, old fellow. But there are forces at work here that I don't like. I think, Watson, that uh, you and I will be at the Blarney Stone at noon tomorrow. It's possible that the bet made tonight is all part of a definite plan, and I have a feeling that the bet is still on. <laughs> Quite windy up here today, old fellow, at the top of the tower, isn't it? Yes, it's just past noon. I wonder if that man Hankin is going to keep to the terms of his bed. We shall soon learn. In the meanwhile, are you sure that you wouldn't like to change your mind and kiss the blarney stone no, yourself? I'm quite sure, thank you. Ah, here they come now. Yes. Hankin and his partner, Mr. Corcoran. The bet is on, Watson. Good day to you, gentlemen. Oh, hello. My friends from last night. Well, I see you're going through with the bet, son. Oh, yes. Jeffrey set his mind on the ten pounds of mine. Your wife didn't accompany you, Mr. Hankin. No, she didn't. I'm afraid I'm rather in disgrace for my behavior last night. Molly made me go around and see that waiter fellow that I hit. I offered him money, but he wouldn't take it. Right. Did you offer him an apology? Apologize? To a waiter? I should say not. Well, come on. Let's get this stupid farce over with. Yeah. Are you sure your nerves can stand it, Jeffrey? There's a drop of a hundred feet or more below you. Oh, don't worry about me, Michael. Just hold on to my ankles tightly and don't let go. I'll climb onto the parapet. There we are. Now hold on to my feet, Michael, and lower me gently. Uh, I'm holding you, Jeffrey. The lower way. Yeah, right you are, Jeffrey. Great Scott, I wouldn't do that for a hundred pounds. Sliding head first down a vertical wall. That's not my door. I can reach the stone. Oh, his boots. They're slipping through my fingers. I can't hold Just him. Let me help you. I'm slipping. Hold on, hold on to him. Hold on to him. Oh, he's gone. I just couldn't hold him. Great heavens. No man could survive that drop. Mr. Cochran, you deliberately let your partner slip to his death. This is murder. Yeah, but I don't understand it. I... I'm a strong man, but he just vanished out of my hands like, like a grease pig. Let me see your hands, Mr. Corcoran. Now, this is dreadful. Dreadful. There's grease on your hands. Grease. And with a faint trace of boot blacking. Good Lord, Holmes. That it means, means that... Watson, that someone knowing that Hankin was going to kiss the Blarney Stone smeared his boots with grease so that he would slip out of the grasp of whoever was holding him. As clever a method of indirect long distance murder as ever I've encountered. <laughs> You'll hear the remainder of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm going to remind you that Petri California Sherry is not only wonderful before dinner, but it's good almost any time. If you had to choose just one wine for almost any occasion, that wine would be Petri Sherry. Petri Sherry is a perfect wine to serve in the afternoon or in the evening. It's good before dinner, yes, but it's swell after dinner, too. In fact, with a bottle of Petri Sherry on your shelf... You've got practically a small-sized wine cellar. So get a bottle of Petri Sherry soon. And remember, you can't miss with any wine that has the letters P-E-T-R-I on the label because all Petri wine is good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, this is quite a story you're telling us tonight. Uh, what happened next? I suppose you went down into the castle grounds and looked for the dead man's body? Oh, we tried to, Mr. Bartell, but the authorities were curiously uncooperative... They refused to let us search, insisting that the police be called first. And so, Mr. Bartell, half an hour after the tragedy, Holmes and I found ourselves standing in a tiny police station as we told the story to the local sergeant. 
Ah, uh, sure, the saints be praised, Mr. Holmes. It is a terrible story you've told me. Tomorrow I'll be after arresting Sean O'Flaherty. Sean O'Flaherty? But he's the waiter at the inn, the one who sings. That he is, that he is, and he sings like a breath of spring. I'll be sorry to see him hang. But to you, you've got no proof that he was responsible for the murder? Proof, you say, sir? Well, I can't arrest a big man, a factory man like Mr. Cochran, can I? Or a fine lady like Mrs. Hank. But you can't arrest a man without any evidence of guilt. Oh, I can't, can't I? Then suppose I tell you that Sean O'Flaherty cleans the boats at the hotel where Mr. Hank was staying. He does, eh? Then he had the perfect opportunity for the greasing of Hankin's boots this morning. And we know he had a motive for harming him. You're right, sir. And for what I have heard of the dead man's behavior last night, half a dozen people could have heard him make the bet that he'd kissed the Blarney Stone today. Sean O'Flaherty's our man. I'll have to arrest him tomorrow. Tomorrow? But good heavens, man, aren't you going to do something today? A murderer is at large. Today is Blessed St. Patrick's Day. Oh, I should let the poor fellow have the day in peace. Oh, he won't run away. But my dear sir... Uh, will you come back with me to the castle and search for the body? They refuse to let me do it alone. On St. Patrick's Day? That I will not. We would need a crew of helpers. And where will I be after getting them on the Blessed St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> no, no, we'll do that tomorrow too. No, today is a day for celebrating. Oh, your, your methods astound me, Sergeant. Oh, do they now, sir? <laughs> Don't be after fretting about me. Just enjoy yourself today. Tomorrow we'll see what can be done about it. Well, good day to you, gentlemen. <laughs> Bless my soul. I've never seen such a happy go lucky policeman in my life. It's infuriating. If only I were allowed to examine Hankins' body, I could get to the bottom of this. Well, what are you going to do now, Holmes? If the police won't help us, then we must take the law into our own hands. I think we'll start off by going to the hotel and seeing what we can find out from Sean O'Flaherty. <laughs> I was going to Berlin your day, I well remember. For to view the lads and lasses on the 50th of November with a maring do a day and a maring do a daddy. Oh, your honors would be after speaking to me, Sean O'Flaherty, perhaps. Yes, Sean. Did you know that Mr. Hankin, the man who struck you last night, was dead? Dead? Well, if ever a man deserved to be beneath the sod, was Jeffrey Hankin himself. A mean, ugly man. The saints be praised that he's gone. How did he die, sir? He was murdered. Murdered? Well, but, Dad, I'm not surprised to hear it. Who murdered him, sir? At the moment, the police seem to think that uh, you are the culprit. Myself? Well, how would I be after murdering the man, sir, when I don't even know how he died? He died when he fell from the top of Blarney Castle as he was trying to kiss the stone. He fell because Mr. Cochran, his partner, couldn't hold on to his feet. His boots had been greased. And we know that you have been cleaning his boots, Sean. That I have, sir. I cleaned them this very morning. But I put no grease on him, if that's what you'd be after suggesting. No, I'm suggesting nothing. I'm trying to establish a few facts. Do you know Kathleen the barmaid? Oh, and why shouldn't I know her, sir? She's to be me wife before the winter sets in. Uh, she pronounced a curse on the dead man last night, just after he had knocked you down. It's possible that um, she... Shh, shh, shh. Here she comes, huh? Sean, my darling, what are the fine gentlemen doing? Oh, right? Kathleen. They've come to ask me questions about the death of Mr. Hankin. He fell off Blarney Castle today and got himself murdered, they say. The saints be praised. But, uh, but what has that to do with you, my darling? Well, the gentlemen tell me that the village police think that I might have greased his boots so that he slipped to his death. The village police is as stupid as my father's big sow. If Mr. Hankin fell to his death today because his boots were greased, I can tell you who did it. Indeed, who? The little people. I warned Mr. Henkin last night that the little people would be after him. He insulted the Irish. Oh, come, 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 my dear. You don't seriously expect us to believe in the, in the little people? And why not, Your Honor? We have them here. Oh, oh, there are that say the fairies all be dead, but, but I know different. I've seen them. When I was a slip of a girl, close to where I lived, there was a rat. Uh, uh, that's a fort, you know. And the rat was a fairy's fort. We never dare touch it with a spade or, or cut down a tree growing on it or carry away a stone. We put our ear to the ground at night and, and we could hear the fairy music rising up from under the ground. Ah, oh, they're gentle people. Most of the time. But they'd grease the boots of a man like Mr. Henkin if they didn't like them. That they would, Your Honor. Holmes, I'm certain that we're wasting our time here. I feel so, Watson. You get the whole thing turned on the greasing of those boots. If only I could have the boots in my hands. If only I could make laboratory tests. 
But until that dolt of a police... But of course! I have it, Watson. You have what, Holmes? The answer, I hope. Get hold of Mrs. Hankin and Mr. Corcoran. Have them meet me in the Blarnestone Tower in half an hour. And you, where are you going? To the police station to try and convince the sergeant that even though it's St. Patrick's Day, it's his duty to help me trap a murderer. <laughs> You know, Mr. Holmes, you're an obstinate man. It's blessed St. Patrick's Day, and yet you insist that we meet here on the top of Blarney Castle. Uh, what do you think you can prove? Who murdered Jeffrey Hankin? Yes, but why do Molly and I have to be here? Yes, Mr. Holmes, and poor Jeffrey's body's still lying somewhere below us. Uh, Mrs. Hankin, Mr. Corcoran, I asked Dr. Watson to bring you here for a good reason, I assure you. You ready, Watson? Quite ready, Holmes. Uh, good. Sergeant. Uh, yes, sir. You asked me why I've assembled the three of you here. I'm going to reconstruct the crime. I shall play the part of the victim. My friend Dr. Watson will represent you, Mr. Corcoran. Now, I straddle the parapet. So, uh, Watson, hold on to my feet, Will. Uh, I've got him home. And uh, lower me down the face of the wall. Right, sure. Holmes! Holmes, hold tight to the wall. Oh. Try and push yourself back. Oh, the murderer's trying to get you. Uh, Your boots oh, are covered in grease. Oh, he's got Stand back. Come away. Grab my trouser legs, Watson. I, I've got him, Holmes. Come. Up you come. There we go. Oh, my God. Devilish plot. That was a near thing. Devilish plot, Sergeant, and very cleverly carried out. My boots were ungreased when I entered the castle, and yet someone has been able to... Apply grease to them without my knowledge within the last few minutes. Sure, and how is that possible, sir? I don't know, Sergeant. I must confess. Holmes, you stumbled as you came up the darkened staircase. Do you remember that? That's true, old chap. I'd forgotten. And you, Mrs. Hankin, and you, Mr. Corcoran, were kind enough to assist me to my feet. An excellent opportunity to apply the grease. Now we know that one of you two is the murderer. I must have a jar of grease somewhere. Now, Sergeant, will you search the lady while I search Mr. Corcoran? But this is ridiculous. Of course it is. How could we be guilty? Well, if you're not guilty, you should have got no objection to being searched, ma'am. Well, upon my word, here in your purse, Mrs. Hankin, is a jar of grease. What? Now, what have you to say for yourself? Why can't you say, Sergeant? Except that she engineered her husband's murder and tried to engineer mine. Oh, no. No, I knew nothing about Jeffrey's murder. Oh, Michael, darling, I swear to you. Don't worry, my darling. I'll not let them hurt you. I'm telling you, you're wrong, Mr. Holmes. I... I was the murderer. Oh, no, Michael. You mustn't sacrifice yourself for me. I think this little play acting has gone far enough. Mr. Corcoran, you have just offered us what you think we will accept as a false confession. But I've established the one thing I wish to know. That you love your late partner's wife and she you. I'm proud to admit that, Mr. Holmes. And now that she's a widow, I can see it in the open. But what are you implying? That you murdered your partner. But... But the grease on your own boots, sir. I just found a jar of it, Mrs. Hank's oh, handbag. Oh, that, my dear sergeant, was all part of my little plan. As to the grease on my boots, I confess I placed it there myself. Just as I planted the jar of grease in your bag, Mrs. But why, Holmes? A fraud accomplished two ends. It forced you, Mr. Corcoran, into a betrayal of your love. But what was more important, it proved from what Dr. Watson's natural reactions were that a man... Holding the creased boots could not fail to realize that fact at once. You brazenly committed murder before our very eyes, Mr. Corcoran, hoping to appear as an innocent victim of another's plot. Your theory is an ingenious one, Mr. Holmes, but how can you prove it? I can claim that my hands are unusually insensitive, not the delicate fingers of a doctor like your friend. Yes, he's right, sir. How can you prove it? When, uh, with your kind cooperation, Sergeant... We find the body of Mr. Hankin and examine it. I shall study his boots. If the grease was applied at the hotel, as it would have been if uh, Sean or Flaherty had done it, the boots will reveal dust from the walk here. If there is no dust, the grease must have been applied as you grasped your partner's boots with grease-smeared hands, Mr. Cochran. You should know best what my tests will reveal. Grab him, Sergeant. Grab him. He's come back here. Come back Oh, Michael, don't. Please don't. Goodbye, Molly, me darling. No! Great, Scotty. He, he jumped off the parapet. Now, Mr. Holmes, you can see that I was right, sir. Wasn't I? What do you mean, Sergeant? Oh, and waiting until tomorrow to get the search party. Now we can be after finding both bodies at the one time. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, Doctor, that was that was really an unusual story. <laughs> Even now, I get a bit of a shudder when I think of that afternoon at the castle. I don't blame you. Doctor, you know something? Uh, earlier this evening, I said that if I ever got to Ireland, I'd certainly want to kiss the Blarney Stone, remember? Yeah. Well, I've changed my mind. I'd no more want to hang by my heels to kiss that stone than, well... Just let's forget it. But, my boy, don't forget if you kiss that stone, you get the gift of eloquence. You'd be the most convincing fellow in the world. So? So, well, whenever you talked about Petri wine, you'd really do people a favor because they wouldn't be able to resist trying it. Oh, talking about Petri wine isn't important, Doctor. The best way to determine just how good Petri wine really is is to taste it. One sip and there's all the proof you need. That's because the Petri family has developed the art of winemaking to a truly fine point. They've been making wine for generations. And all of the things the Petri family knows about turning luscious, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine have been handed on down in the family from father to son, from father to son. That's why whenever you want a swell wine, for any occasion, you can't go wrong with a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a a story in which that arch-criminal Professor Moriarty played a most important part. It deals with the theft of a famous painting of a strange night that Sherlock Holmes and I spent trapped in the interior of a giant metal vault and of mysterious bloodstains in an empty room. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in this Arthur Conan Doyle story, A Case of Identity. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Bulldog Drummond, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to talk about those few minutes you have while you're waiting for dinner every evening. That's the perfect time for a glass of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. You really feel like you're enjoying the good things of life when you take time for a glass of Petri Sherry. Hold that glass of Sherry to the light. Look at it. It's a beautiful dark amber. Yes, and Petri Sherry is clear and fragrant. The way a good wine should be. Now taste it. You've got something. That Petri Sherry has a real heart of the grape flavor. Oh, and look, if you like your sherry dry, you know, not sweet, Petri makes a fine dry sherry. It's called Petri Pale Dry. And if you don't know yet which you prefer, the regular sherry or the dry, why not try both? Don't buy one, buy two. But just be sure you always buy Petri. And now, 
Now let's look in on our old friend, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Draw up your usual chair. I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, how did the story begin, Doctor? It was one day in the autumn of 1887, I remember. Holmes and I were seated on either side of the fire in our Baker Street lodgings. The great man, his eyes half closed, his long, thin fingers pressed together, lay back in his chair, filling the room with large blue clouds of tobacco smoke, and discoursing on one of his favorite subjects, Professor Moriarty. I can almost hear him now, Mr. Bartell, as he said... Time, Watson. He's the organizer of half that is evil and nearly all that is undetected in this great metropolis. Oh, surely that's an exaggeration, no, Holmes. No, it isn't, my dear fellow. He has a brain of the first order, and his agents are numerous and splendidly organized. He himself sits motionless like a spider in the center of his web. But that web has a thousand radiations, and he uh, knows every quiver of each one of them. <laughs> it's fortunate for me that there's only one Moriarty. If every criminal were equally astute, I'd be in bankruptcy within the year. I don't think you need to worry about bankruptcy, Holmes. As I came in just now, I picked these letters up from the whole table and slipped them into my pocket. Uh, here you are. Oh, thanks, old chap. Uh, they didn't look like bills to me. I observed the crest of the Duke of Carlisle on the top envelope. Oh, dear me. Five hundred guineas. His grace is extremely generous in his evaluation of my services. I don't agree, after all. You did save him from a shocking scandal. Oh, listen to this, Watson. <laughs> I seen you yesterday when you come to the cricket match. You wasn't watching the cricket. If you value your life, keep your filthy long nose to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> and it's signed Joe the Butcher. Long nose. Who knows Joe the Butcher? <laughs> oh, minor criminal that I was instrumental in sending to prison for a short term. He flatters himself, though. I was watching the cricket. No idea that Joe was back in practice again. I must keep an eye on him. Hello? Letter on Carlton Hotel stationery. Now, I... I say, this is interesting. Very interesting. Oh, what's the hell? Dear Mr. Holmes, I've been informed that you are a man of ability and discretion. My life is in grave danger and I need your help. Upon receipt of this letter, come to my hotel at once. I shall be expecting you. And it's signed, uh, Francois Dulac. Oh, rather brim is it? No, please, just come to my hotel at once. Who is this uh, Dulac, anyway? What's no fellow? Yes? Yeah? We were talking of Moriarty just now. I have a feeling that this letter may lead us to him. Well, what makes you say that? François Dulac, the writer of this letter, is recognized in France as the one indisputable authority on the paintings of Jean-Baptiste Greuze. Well, I still don't see the connection with Moriarty. If there is one thing Moriarty loves, more than the dazzling abstractions of mathematics and even more dazzling achievements of crime, it is the paintings of Greuze. The suggested combination of impending danger and a Greer's expert spells Moriarty to me. Get your hat and coat off, fellow. We're off to the Carlton Hotel to see Monsieur Dulac at once. This is room 212, all right, but uh, there's no answer. I'll knock again. Shall I go and get someone to unlock the door? No, 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 sir. Huh? Don't want to attract attention to our prospective plans. Hotel locks would be very hard to pick. Here. Yeah. The skeleton key should do the trick quite easily. Well, the man at the desk downstairs said that Mr. Delac was in his room. You know, Watson, he said he thought he was in his room. Uh-huh. Easier than I anticipated. Come on, let's go in. Doesn't look as if... Anyone's occupying this room? No signs of any personal belongings? No clothes hanging in the wardrobe, no luggage. Uh, yet he is still registered here. Hello. What's this stain on the carpet by the bed here? Great Scott, is it... It's a blood stain, Watson. Blood stain? And the stain is still damp. I'm afraid we're too late. Come on, we can do no more good here. You're not giving up, Holmes? No, of course not, my dear fellow. Let's see what we can find out from the hotel manager. I refuse to believe that in the 19th century a distinguished foreigner can vanish into thin air. <laughs> Yes, Monsieur Dulac did have a visitor early on today, Mr. Holmes. Do you remember his name? I think it was Perkins or Parsons, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Can you describe his appearance? I think so, Mr. Holmes. He was a very tall gentleman. Mm -hmm. Tall and thin, with deep-sunk eyes. Clean shaven Oh, yes, sir. 
He had a high forehead and a funny way of moving his head from side to side. Oh, yeah. Right, Joe Holmes, that's almost an exact description of Mariachi. Exactly, Watson. Have you seen Monsieur Dulac since this uh, Mr. Perkins or Parsons called on him? No, I haven't, sir. But his visitor came back only an hour ago. He had some men with him. They carried some large packages out of the hotel. Packages? But not luggage, eh? No, packages, Mr. Holmes. Has Monsieur Dulac received any other visitors since he arrived here? None that have been here to see him, sir. But I understand that Sir Henry Davenant has been most anxious to get in touch with him. Sir Henry Davenant? Thank you. I'm extremely obliged to you. Come on, Watson. Always proud to be of service to Mr. Sherlock Holmes. The plot begins to clear, Watson. Well, what makes you say that, huh? Sir Henry Davenant is a millionaire whose art collection is world famous. A year ago, the papers were full of his latest acquisition, the gem of his collection, Jean-Baptiste Greur's painting, Young Girl with a Gazelle. And now it would appear that for some reason Moriarty wishes to prevent a meeting between Sir Harry Davenant and Monsieur Dulac, a Greur's expert. Now, do you see why the plot begins to clear? Very good, but what are you going to do? Davenant said to, uh, there's something of a hermit. He won't have anything to do with officials, interviewers, and people like that. But we know that he wishes to consult an expert on the paintings of Jean-Baptiste Greus. The next move should be obvious, old chap. Gracious me, you mean that you'll impersonate one? Certainly. If a Greus expert is what he wants, then a Greus expert is what he's going to get. <laughs> Holmes, I must say, your disguise is, is amazingly effective. Uh, monsieur, <laughs> uh, you do me the great honor. Uh, if I appear convincing to the astute Dr. Watson, how can I fail to convince Sir Henry Davenant? Oh, my dear fellow, it's uh, marvelous. <laughs> Pulling the good. <laughs> yeah. Here we are, sir. Sir Henry's house. Let's uh, hope for the best, old fellow. Uh, I don't know exactly what a French art expert looks like, but I could certainly believe that you were one. I only hope that I can be equally convincing in the role of a patron of the art. You certainly look your part, old chap. Good afternoon. Can I help you? Uh, my name is Vernet. André Vernet. I am most anxious to make the acquaintance of Sir Henry Deron. I'm afraid that Sir Henry is extremely difficult to see, sir. I can tell him you're here, but he very rarely gives interviews. That is a great disappointment to me. Perhaps uh, you would just go and tell him I am a pupil of, and a disciple of the great François Dulac. I will do what I can, sir. Uh, come in, won't you, gentlemen? Uh, if you'll wait here for a moment, I'll take your message. Uh, what was the name again, uh, Bernay, sir? Vernet, André Vernet, and this gentleman is Mr. Watson. Very good, sir. Well, we got into the house. Now let's hope that you can impress the master of it. Not an easier task, I fear, old fellow. Hmm. I've had to match opinions on the paintings of Greus with an expert. My own knowledge of the subject is uh, somewhat sketchy, I'm afraid. Yes, and mine is absolutely nil. He goes was a naturalistic painter who flourished at the close of the 18th century, and though his paintings command a fabulous fee in this day and age, he himself died in great poverty. So, shh, shh, shh. Someone's coming. Monsieur Vernet, will you and Mr. Watson come with me, please? Sir Henry is most anxious to meet you. Merci, mademoiselle. My name is Violet Jackson. I look after Sir Henry's art collection. Indeed, a very pleasurable job, I'm sure, my dear. From what I hear, he has a magnificent gallery. He has one of the finest in the world. Yes. His latest acquisition is the famous young girl with a gazelle by Creuse. Oh, but I'm sure you know all about that, Monsieur Vernet. I think you said in your message you were a student of the great Dulac. I have that inestimable privilege, mademoiselle. Oh, this is Sir Henry's study. Turn. Oh, uh, thank you, Violet. Uh, you may go. Yes, Sir Henry. Uh, you're uh, Verne, I'm sure, and uh, this is Mr. Watson? That's right, Sir Henry. Mr. Verne is staying with me. I see. Well, uh, sit down, won't you? Uh, look, Verne, <coughs> uh, you're a friend of Dulux, aren't you? I think I may claim that honor, monsieur. Then why in thunder can't I get in touch with him? He's staying at the Carlton Hotel, isn't he? He uh, was, uh, or has been staying there, monsieur. We. Oui. I've left half a dozen messages for him, asking him to come and see me, and he hasn't answered one of them. I can't understand it. It's most important that I see him. Uh, monsieur is in some trouble, perhaps? Perhaps. Uh, now, you fellows are familiar with the painting by Greuze, the young lady with the gazelle, aren't you? Oh, yes, Sir Henry. Yes, indeed. 
Oh, you are, eh? Uh, well, what do you think of it? Well, uh, uh, one of the greatest uh, works, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, monsieur. Uh, of course, I have only seen a reproduction, uh, but it seemed to me uh, to have a freshness and vigor of the flesh tints, a great firmness and brilliance of line. You are indeed uh, fortunate uh, to own it, monsieur. Hmm, don't know about fortunate. Cost me 40,000 pounds. I still say you are most fortunate, monsieur. Would you grant me the honor of... Uh, to examine the original? Well, I don't know whether I ought to. I, I've had to guard it very carefully ever since this... Uh, uh, well, but perhaps in your case I can make an exception. You received threats regarding the painting, Sir Henry? Yes, I have, Mr. Watson. And they worried me so much that I've even thought of engaging the services of a private detective. Oh, indeed, monsieur. A very interesting... Uh, the Duke of Carlisle strongly recommended a fellow by the name of uh, Sherlock Holmes. Oh. Uh, I was seriously thinking of going to him. Instead of which... He has come to you, Sir Henry. In fact, it will save us all a lot of time, I'm sure. Well, what kind of horseplay is this, sir? Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Then why do you come here masquerading as a French art expert? Because I, I'd heard of your aversion to giving interviews, and I wanted to see you urgently. I felt that in the character of a supposed Greer's expert, I was uh, most likely to gain immediate admission. Well, then uh, your friend here? Uh, Dr. Watson, my colleague. Well, it's all turned out for the best, Sir Henry. You wanted to consult Mr. Holmes, and he was most anxious to see you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I'm glad you fellows are here. Uh, you see, I'm devilish worried about that growth of mine. Oh, why, Sir Henry? Well, I bought it at an auction. There was another man bidding against me all the time, and when it was finally knocked down in my name, he became most insulting. He seemed unable to bear not owning the picture himself. He told me bluntly that I wouldn't enjoy it long. Well, I didn't think much about it at the time, but lately I've been receiving postcards repeating the threat. I don't like it. That's a fact. Well, you've kept those postcards, I hope, Sir Henry? No, threw them in the fire where they belong. Oh, that's a pity, sir. Can you recall the name of this uh, bidder at the auction who threatened you? No, didn't know his name. Can you describe his appearance? Well, let me see. He was uh, tall, uh, clean-shaven. Mm -hmm. oh, and a curious habit of moving his head from side to side. Moriarty again. Yes, old chap, my supposition was correct. Now tell me, Sir Henry, is the painting safely guarded? Well, I'd say that it was impregnable, Holmes. It's not in my regular galleries. I had a special strong room built for it when I started to receive these threats. It has a lock to which only I know the combination, and a special clockwork device that so controls the room that even I can only enter it uh, during certain daytime hours. And yet, Sir Henry, with such thorough precautions, you appear to be frightened. Why? Well, I hardly dare trust my own shadow, Holmes. But as you possibly know, one of Greer's pupils, a certain Madame Ledoux, uh, imitated his paintings most successfully. Uh, several of the experts were fooled. I confess that I've been frightened lately, uh, since I received the threats, that a clever man might try and substitute a fake painting for the original, if indeed he hasn't already done so. Uh, that's why I was so anxious to get in touch with Dulac. Uh, he'd know a fraud at once. But a substitution would be impossible if you're the only one that knows the combination to the lock of the strong room. Well, that's what my logic tells me too, Doctor. And yet I'm very uneasy, I must confess. It's still daylight, Sir Henry. Would it be possible for us to examine the painting now? Well, certainly. Uh, by the way, what happened to François de Lac? Did he uh, leave the Cotton Hotel? He did, sir. Now, the circumstances of his departure made us distinctly uneasy. In what way? His room was empty. There were no signs of luggage, and yet... Come in. Yes, Violet, what is it? This note was just left for you, Sir Henry. I was asked to deliver it at once. Who left it, Violet? Well, you can give his name, Sir Henry. But he was a tall, thin man with deep sunk eyes. Oh. What's the note say? Wait. It's the same fellow again. Listen to this. I told you you wouldn't enjoy the painting for long. You didn't, did you? It's cut its money off. <laughs> Holmes, I don't see anything funny about this. What makes you laugh? It's obvious uh, that my painting has been stolen. I find nothing funny about it either, Sir Henry. But I must admit a certain pleasure. Once again, I'm crossing swords with an adversary who was more than worthy of my steel. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second, so I'm just going to remind you that Petri Sherry could really be called the all-round, all-American wine. That's right, Petri California Sherry. Now, the reason I say that is... Because Petri Sherry's not only a swell-before-dinner wine, 
but it's a perfect wine for almost any occasion. When company drops in, serve Petri Sherry. After dinner, when you're just sitting around chatting, Petri Sherry again is just right. Believe me, you couldn't ask for a better all-round wine than Sherry. You couldn't ask for a better tasting Sherry than Petri. Petri Sherry. Well, Dr. Watson, you've kept me on the edge of my chair so far with your story. What happened next? Did Sir Henry Davenant take you to see his famous painting? He did, Mr. Bartell. Together with Miss Violet Jackson, we descended countless flights of stairs. Doors opened where no one expected the door to exist. Finally, after walking down a narrow stone staircase that turned and twisted, we came up against a blank wall. It seemed that we could go no further. But a time clock, a combination of numbers, and a hidden door slid back. We stood in the interior of a small room. A room with no windows and hardly any light. An oil painting stood on an easel before us. It was incomparable girl's painting of a young girl with a gazelle. We stood looking at it for a brief moment, and then... The Henry Davenant. Uh, oh. Heavenly painting is still safe. Yes, Sir Henry. If it still is the same painting... It looks the same, Mr. Holmes. Yes, yeah, certainly does to me. The fact remains that only François Dulac could tell us if it is the same or a brilliant copy. Yes, and Monsieur Dulac has been uh, silent. So it would seem... Of course, we could ask the experts at the British Museum to pass judgment. Yeah, but how could it have been stolen? It would be impossible to smuggle it out of here and replace it with a copy. There's only one way of being absolutely certain. With your permission, Sir Henry, I should like to make a test. You're going to take a sample of the paint, Mr. Holmes? Yes, that should give us certain proof. Well, very, very, very well done. Yeah, you'd better do it, Violet. Uh, but be careful. Remember, the painting cost me 40,000 pounds. Am I new? fragment of paint will be sufficient for the test, won't it, Mr. Holmes? Yes, indeed. With my fingernail, Sir Henry, I'll scratch off a tiny sample. Firstly, hmm. I think it's a dash fine bit of work, whoever paid it. There you are, Mr. Holmes. Is that enough paint Splendid, Miss Jackson, splendid. Thank you. Please put it on this envelope for me, will you? That's it. And now, Sir Henry, I shall return to Big Street and analyze this paint. Within an hour, I shall be able to tell you whether the painting is worth 40,000 pounds or a plug farthing. Well, well, Holmes, did you uh, make the test? I did, Sir Henry. And? I'm afraid there's no doubt that your painting is a fraud. Oh, fraud. The sample of paint that I examined was manufactured not more than 25 years ago. And Greus died in 1805. Well, I still say that it's a fine painting, whoever did it. I wouldn't mind having it myself. I agree, Dr. Watson. In fact, I'd be glad to buy it. It's a brilliant copy. And more than likely, it was done by Madame Ledoux. You're remarkably quiet, Sir Henry. Forty thousand pounds. Forty thousand pounds! No, 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 sir. Put that knife down. Holmes, help me grab him. Uh, don't worry, gentlemen. I'm not about to commit suicide in despair, if that's what you're thinking. Now, why are you grasping that knife, sir? Because I have work to do in my strong room. I'm going to use this knife to smash that lying canvas into 40,000 pieces. Yes, well... I suppose you're right, Violet. It's childish to mutilate this daub. It's a brilliant fraud, Sir Henry. I'd like to have it. I'll buy it from you gladly. Buy it from me? <laughs> you can have it. Go and make arrangements to have the wretched thing taken away at once. I don't want any frauds in my collection. Yes, Sir Henry. And thank you. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'll pay you any fee you name if you can tell me how the original painting was stolen. Well, Sir Henry, the how must here precede the who. And the how, I must confess, seems impossible. Yes, I can agree. This is a sealed metal room. The only entrance is through the door. That has a combination that only you know, Sir Henry. It's perfectly true. It's impossible for anyone to enter this room without my being present. Or I would have sworn it was. Let's examine these walls, Watson. Might be a secret panel. Uh huh. Ventilator. No method of entrance here. Huh. Well, you'll find no flaws, I'm sure. This room is built like a giant safe. 
And the time lock on the door is equally solid. Is the time lock working now? Yes. It started five minutes ago when we opened the door. But don't worry, it's perfectly safe with the door open. But when the door's closed, it couldn't be reopened again, I take it, Sir Henry. Not until the morning, Doctor, no. I had the lock specially designed. Very ingenious. This presents as pretty a problem as ever I've tackled, Sir Henry. A large painting stolen and a fake one substituted in a sealed room to which only you have access. I must confess the house seems utterly impossible. Remember what you always say, Holmes. Throw out the impossible, and whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the possible. Uh, let's consider the who for a moment. Is your butler absolutely reliable? Absolutely. How about Mr. Jackson? Oh, completely trustworthy. Brought letters of recommendation from most of the leading art galleries in London. Intelligent, too. <laughs> and serious-minded. He's made a deep study of mathematics, as well as her knowledge of painting. Mathematics? How do you know that, Sir Henry? Well, she had a book with her the other day. <laughs> I was surprised at the title. Could have been a novel. But no, it was called The Dynamics of an Asteroid. And it was inscribed to her by the author. Dynamics of an Asteroid and inscribed to her by the author. Thank heavens for your memory, Sir Henry. That book was written by Professor Moriarty. Arlie Jackson must be an accomplice of his. Violet! I... The door! Someone slammed it shut! Yes, and it's not very hard to guess who that someone is. Oh, but I, I can't believe that Violet is a criminal. Look, 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 there's a, there's a note being pushed under the door. Oh, strike a match, will you, old fellow? Right, sure. What's it say, Holmes? Forgive my unladylike eavesdropping, but with Mr. Sherlock Holmes as near the truth as he is, I'm afraid it would be unwise for me to remain here any longer. On the other hand, you are in no danger of smothering in the strong room, but your imprisonment should delay my pursuit till morning. Violet Jackson. She's escaped with Holmes. Don't worry, Watson. If Jackson's failure to procure the painting for Moriarty will land her in a far worse dilemma than anything we could subject her to. Moriarty has never tolerated failure on the part of his minions. A brilliant plot, old fellow, a brilliant plot. Moriarty is at the zenith of his powers. How fortunate that we were able to foil him. What do you mean, foil him? My painting's been stolen. Your painting, Sir Henry? Oh, no, 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 no. It's, uh, it's here in this room. What on earth are you talking about, Holmes? You reminded me of my own dictum, Watson. I discarded the impossible. It was impossible that the picture had been stolen, therefore it had not been stolen. You mean that uh, this painting is the original, Gross? Yes, yes, of course, sir. Surely the whole plot is crystal clear now. Uh, just about as clear as porridge to me. <laughs> well, then, let me explain. The whole episode of Francois Dulac, the note to me, the empty hotel room, and the significant bloodstains and the apparent disappearance of Dulac were all part of Moriarty's plot. The real Dulac never left France. Moriarty created him in England to lure me into the case. Why in thunder should he want to do that, Holmes? Yes, I should think you're the last person he'd want on the scene. Oh, on the contrary, sir. He knew that I'd grab at his bait, the apparent murder of a Greer's expert who would make it seem likely that your painting had a substitute, Sir Henry. He wanted me to test the painting, which I did. I fell into his trap very neatly. The paint, Holmes, you said that it was no more than 20 years old. Yes, my dear fellow, the uh, answer should be obvious. I see it. Violet was his accomplice, had prepared the painting beforehand, and carefully scraped off a piece of modern paint. Exactly, Sir Henry. And Moriarty had assumed, quite correctly as it turned out, that as soon as you thought your painting was a fraud, you'd want to get rid of it. And that girl was going to take it out of this house with your full approval. And, of course, turn it over to Moriarty. What a fantastic scheme. A devilishly clever one, old chap. If it hadn't been for your chance remark about the book on mathematics, Sir Henry, I'm very much afraid the young lady with the gazelle might even now be on her way out of your house. Holmes, I can't tell you how grateful I am. I'm going to express that gratitude in a very material manner, I assure you. Thank you, Sir Henry, but I wouldn't dream of accepting a fee for this case. I've been shockingly obtuse. I might easily have let them walk away with your treasure right under our noses. Uh, we locked in here for, for the night, sir? I'm very much afraid so, Dr. Watson. Oh, I shouldn't be surprised if the butler notices our disappearance and comes looking for us. But he won't be able to open the door... It'll need a professional locksmith to get us out of here. Well, really, it looks as if we'll spend a very cheerful evening. <laughs> Don't be gloomy, my dear fellow. Oh, gloomy, sir. You're locked in with one of the loveliest girls in history, and she's genuine at that. Like another match, old chap, shall we? What? Let's, uh, let's look at her once again. <laughs> Well, 
Doctor. That was not only a swell story, but I really learned something. Oh, good, 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 Mr. Bartell. And just what did you learn? Well, uh, this fellow, Gers, the painter... Yeah? <laughs> I know this must sound stupid to you, but until you mentioned his name, I'd never heard of him before. You, you know, Holmes mentioned his name to me. I'd never heard him before either. <laughs> but then... We'll never learn about the good things in this world unless somebody tells us. Exactly. That's the way I feel about Petri Wine. No, no, no. Just wait wait a minute. Now, here's the way I look at it. There are thousands of people who know about Petri Wine and love it, right? Yes, but... But even though it's a wonderful wine, there must be some people who don't know about it. So I tell them about it. And I tell them about the Petri family and how they've been making wine for generations and how they've been handing on down from father to son, from father to son... The fine art of turning luscious grapes into delicious wine. Yes, and when I tell them that the name Petri on a bottle of wine is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine, well, that's all you have to know. So it adds up to this. If you want a fine wine for any occasion, you want a Petri wine. Because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California... Invite you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And right now, I'd like to just briefly mention an idea you ought to try tomorrow night, just before you sit down to dinner. Just pour yourself a glass of that good Petri California sherry. Petri sherry is the perfect before-dinner wine. Its cheerful, glowing amber color looks festive and, well, it sort of lends an air of importance to the occasion. And as for the wine itself, just taste it. That Petri Sherry is not just ordinary wine, no, sir. One sip and you know that wonderful sun-ripened grapes went into its making. Yes, and you know that Petri Sherry was carefully watched over every step of the way. Incidentally, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. Regular sherry and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure just which kind you and your friends will like best, try them both. Don't buy one, buy two. But when it comes to sherry, or any other wine for that matter, be sure you always buy Petri. And now I'm certain our good friend Dr. Watson's waiting for us. Let's go in and join him. Ah, there you are, Mr. Bartell. Punctual to the minute, as always. <laughs> well, this is one doctor's appointment I'm eager to keep. <laughs> nice you to say so, my boy. Draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. Thanks. Well, doctor, today is April the 1st. Did uh, anyone try and play any jokes on you? Yes, you did, Mr. Bartell, but I'm happy to say that nobody caught me. Uh, not as in the story that I'm going to tell you tonight, but an April Fool's Day prank certainly scored a bullseye. I see you have the dispatch box out again, Doctor. Been refreshing your memory? Yes, I have. Tell when I tell you the adventure took place in 1881, I think you'll agree that after such a lapse of time, a man can hardly rely on memory alone. 1881? Say, Doctor, tonight's adventure must have been one of the really early ones. Yes, it was indeed. In fact, to be exact, it took place only a little while after Sherlock Holmes and I had first met and taken up lodging together. How was the great detective in those early days? <laughs> Found mystery to me, Mr. Bartell. To give you an example, my boy, I'd shared our Baker Street lodgings with him for over a month before I was 
even certain of his profession, the knowledge of which I learnt to my awe and astonishment when our first adventure together took place. Well, that was the one you called a study in scarlet, wasn't it, Doctor? That's right, Mr. Marshall. The memory you've got to study in scarlet. Uh, but even after that adventure, I found myself wondering at times what I had let myself in for, sharing lodgings with such a strange companion. It was in one of those moods of doubt and confusion that my story begins. Late one March evening, I found myself in the neighborhood of Piccadilly Circus. It was cold, and a steady drizzle of rain had dampened my spirits. I took a glass of wine, and the sound of music would put me in a better mood. And, and so, Mr. Bartell, I entered the Criterion restaurant. As I sat with a glass of rare vintage port at my elbow, the orchestra playing a dreamy Strauss waltz in the background, I couldn't help thinking of the last time that I'd been there. It was the night I met a young medical student by the name of Stamford. He was the man who first introduced me to Sherlock Holmes. Suddenly, I felt a clap on my shoulder. I turned, and to my amazement, once again, young Stamford was standing before me. Watson. Or should I say, Dr. Watson. How are you, my dear chap? Hello, Stamford. Come and sit down. Thanks. I'm glad to see that you're not holding any grudge against me. Why on earth should I do that? For introducing you to Sherlock Holmes. I've reproached myself ever since. I think he's as mad as a hatter. Not at all. He may be eccentric. In fact, I'll admit that he is eccentric, but he's an extraordinarily interesting fellow. He'll make a great name for himself as a private detective one of these days. You'll see if I'm not right, Stafford. I saw something about him in the paper the other day. Yes, I think that was the Larston Gardens affair, wasn't yes, it? Yes, yes, it was. He's a brilliant man, Stafford. Quite brilliant. Hmm. So I must admit he's difficult at times. He works like a fiend as a rule, but occasionally a reaction sets in for days at a time. He'll lie on our sofa, hardly uttering a word or moving a muscle from morning to night. It's depressing, I must say. I think he takes himself too seriously. Yes, perhaps you're right. How would you like to join in a little plot? Plot? Uh, against Holmes? Yes, yes. Uh, just a rag, you know. We thought it'd be rather fun. We? Murphy and I, we were just talking about it. I'll call him over. Murphy? Oh, Murphy, I, I've seen him before somewhere, haven't I? I'm sure you must have done. He's been around at the hospital, and any time you go into the British Museum, you'll find him there. Nice fellow, but dull. Definitely dull. Uh, yes, Stamford. Oh, uh, this is a friend of mine, John Watson. Uh, this is James Murphy. How do you do? I think I've seen you at the hospital. And I know I've seen you, Dr. Watson. Oh, sit down and come and join us, won't you? Oh, thank you very much. I was just telling Watson about our little plot. Oh, you you, you mean about uh, Sherlock Holmes? Now, now, look here. I'd like you fellows to realize that Holmes is a very good friend of mine. Oh, don't worry, Watson. This is all in good fun. Don't you realize what the date is tomorrow? First of April, isn't it? Yes, April Fool's Day. Oh, now I see. You're going to play an April Fool's Day joke on... On Holmes. Yes, that's our plan. Well, it's hardly our plan, Stamford. It's really Lady Anne Partington's idea. You see, Holmes was very rude to her when she visited the hospital recently, and she wants to, uh, well, you know, take him down a peg or two. Oh, sounds innocent enough. I must say, he's inclined to be rather arrogant at times. Well, what's, what's the plan? Well, we'll need your help, Watson. You must be careful not to give the joke away. I'll bet you a fiver that Holmes falls for the whole story, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> now, here's exactly what we're planning to do. Lady Anne is going to call on Holmes at Baker Street in the morning. Lady Anne, I'm very glad that you called to see me in my professional capacity. Surely, my dear man, you didn't think this was a social call. You were much too rude to me at the hospital the other day for that. <laughs> that was the point I was trying to make. Uh, please sit down, won't you? Please, uh, take this chair, won't you, Lady Anne? It's by far the most comfortable chair in the room. Oh, thank you, Dr. Watson. And now, what can I do to help you? You've heard of the Elphinstone Emerald. Oh, yes, yes, indeed. A magnificent stone of very considerable value... An heirloom in your family, I believe. Yes, Mr. Holmes. I keep it in a wall safe in my bedroom. This morning, when I had occasion to go to the safe, I discovered that the emerald had been stolen. Stolen? Scott, what a shocking business. Of course you want Mr. Holmes to recover it for you. A remarkable deduction, my dear doctor. Uh, Lady Anne, when you opened the safe, did you observe any signs of it having been tampered with? <laughs> oh, I, I think it's rather stupid to sit and answer questions here in Baker Street. Uh, why don't you come over to my house in Cavendish Square and examine the safe for yourself? Uh, you are a detective, aren't you? Uh, Lady Anne, uh, just now you accused me of rudeness. I assure you that mine, at least, was unintentional. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. Don't be so touchy. I can promise you a substantial fee, Mr. Holmes. I'm a struggling practitioner and a new profession, eh? My poverty, but not my will, consents. I pay thy poverty and not thy will. <laughs> you see, I can quote my Shakespeare, too, Mr. Holmes. My carriage is waiting, gentlemen. Let's drive over to Cavendish Square at once, shall we? <laughs> This is the wall safe, Mr. Holmes. Mm, not too difficult a safe to crack for an expert. 
You placed the emerald in it last night, you say? Yes, when I went to bed. And this morning, it had gone. Well, surely, Holmes, this is a good occasion to use that magnifying glass that you're always fitting about. An excellent this. occasion, my dear doctor. That's why I brought it with me. Uh-huh. That's very interesting. What is it? This safe was opened by an expert. There isn't a sign of its having been forced. Hello. What have you discovered? There's a peculiar tarnish on the steel knob. It was obviously handled by someone whose fingers are habitually stained with chemicals. Amazing, Holmes. Let me mention, my dear doctor. Uh, where does that dolly do? My boudoir. I should like to examine it, if I may. Oh, but of course. Thank you, Lady Anne. Dr. Watson, this is the most beautiful April Fool's Day fraud I've ever played. I say Murphy was right. He has fallen for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Just the same, I'm beginning to feel guilty. I can't help feeling a, a bit disloyal. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. It's all in fun. Are Stamford and Mr. Murphy listening? Yes, they're next door in my drawing room. I'm sure their ears are positively glued to the keyhole. Well, I do hope Holmes won't be angry with me. Shh, here he comes. Nothing of any interest in there. The windows haven't been tampered with. We may presume, therefore, that the thief did not enter by an upstairs window. Uh, Lady Anne. Yes, Mr. Holmes. This room has not been touched since you discovered your loss. Oh, no. I told the servants to leave it exactly as it was while I came to fetch you. Splendid. Splendid. Thief pile carpet, eh? Couldn't be better. Uh, the thief was a tall man with a long stride. Oh, come, 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 Holmes. I know your methods, but there aren't any footprints on this carpet that, that you can identify. Even with your magnifying glass. My dear doctor, I've studied many crimes and I've never seen one yet that uh, was committed by a flying creature. As long as a criminal remains on his two legs, there must be some, some trifling displacement can be detected by a keen observer. I assure you that the marks on this carpet indicate that the thief uh, was a tall man with a long stride. Faces mm. of tobacco ash. Pipe tobacco. Stag tobacco that Sells at fourpence an ounce. Oh, now, really, Mr. Holmes, how can you possibly identify an individual tobacco? Oh, it's a hobby of mine. In fact, I've even written a monograph on the subject. Now, one more look at the safe itself. Hello. What's this part of dust here? What? It's rosin. The pink trace of rosin. Lady Anne, I suggest that you get in touch with Scotland Yard at once. You mean that you've solved it, Holmes? I mean, my dear doctor, that I can give you a reasonably complete picture of the thief, and that picture is so individual that I'd be surprised if it would fit more than one man in London. Why, this is pure magic, Mr. Holmes. Please describe him to me. Uh, well, he's a tall man. The width of his stride indicates that, and he's thin. Well, what enables you to tell that, Holmes? His footprints have made a remarkably light indentation on the nap of the carpet. Our thief dabbles extensively in chemicals, as indicated by the tarnishing of the knob on the safe, and the traces of rosin would suggest that he plays the violin also. He smokes shag tobacco, has a great practical knowledge of the ways of combination locks, and he's obviously in close contact with the criminal classes. How do you know that, Mr. Holmes? Well, he wouldn't steal a famous stone unless he knew how to dispose of it through some trustworthy fence. Yes, it's a very comprehensive picture, Holmes. I almost feel as if I knew the chap. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sure there's only one man in London, and it shouldn't be hard to trace him. <laughs> <laughs> I agree entirely, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, I think the joke has gone far enough. Joke? <laughs> oh, what do you mean? <laughs> You're quite right, Holmes, in, in saying there's only one such man in London. You've just given a perfect description of yourself. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> Dr. Stamford, Mr. Murphy, you can come in now. April Fool, Holmes. April Fool. April Fool. April Fool. <laughs> April Fool. <laughs> Here, into the drawing room, everyone. Let us drink a glass of wine to Mr. Holmes, who has so graciously forgiven us for the little trick we played on him. And also to Dr. Stamford, who thought of the whole idea. Uh, no hard feelings, Holmes. Oh, no, Doctor. Oh, it was a rather embarrassing experience. Yes, and Murphy told me about the plan. I, I just couldn't resist joining him. Ah, here you are, Holmes. Here's a drink. Thank you, Stamford. <laughs> you know Murphy, don't you? Uh, no, I don't think we've met. Oh. How do you do, sir? Uh, how do you do, Holmes? How did you like the little game we played on you? It was rather a salutary experience. I suppose you gave them all the details to build up the picture of me, eh, yes, Doctor? Yes, I did, Holmes, and knowing some of your methods, we tried to plant every clue that you'd pick up. <laughs> Very neat job, too, and incidentally, <laughs> a perfect example of the dangers of deductions based on purely circumstantial evidence. I shall profit from this little lesson. I must say it was worth a fortune in Emeralds to see your face, Holmes, when you realized what you'd done. Well, the joke's over now. By the way, 
Where is Lady Anne? I believe she said she was going to fetch the Elphinstone Emerald. She thought you might be interested in seeing it. She probably feels the sight of it will salve my wounded vanity. <laughs> oh, here she comes now. Mr. Holmes! Mr. Holmes! Mr. Scott, what's wrong? What's happened, Lady Anne? The Emerald, it's not where I hid it. This time it's really stolen. <laughs> Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds, so I've just time to remind you that there are many, many different types of wine. But if you want one wine that's fine for almost any occasion, then you want Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is fine before dinner, of course. But Petri Sherry is good after dinner, too. And it's the perfect wine for cocktail time or any time friends drop in. Everybody will love the real heart-of-the-grape flavor you get in every sip of Petri Sherry. And you can serve Petri Sherry proudly. Because those letters P-E-T-R-I spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Petri wine. Well, Dr. Watson, your April Fool Day plot kind of backfired on you, didn't it? Yes, Mr. Bartell, it was a perfect example of the, uh, of the biter bit. <laughs> What happened next? I suppose Sherlock Holmes went into action once again. That's true, right, Mr. Bartell, and it gladdened my heart to see the change in the fuller. I confess I'd felt rather ashamed of my part in the prank, for I could see that Holmes' pride had been hurt. But now, with a definite crime before him, the difference was amazing. He suddenly became a dynamo, galvanized into action as he stood there, firing questions at the other members. Lady Anne, who beside yourself knew of this fresh hiding place? Both Murphy and I did. Yes. Uh, after we'd left our deliberate clues on the safe, we went with Lady Anne and saw her secrete the emerald in the top drawer of her dressing table. We thought it would be all right there. After all, as soon as the joke was over, I was going to put it back in the safe. Now, I think our wisest plan before we question the servants would be for each one of you who were in this April Fool's Day prank to submit to being searched. Holmes, surely you don't suggest that any one of us took the emerald? No, Stafford, I don't. Uh, but if any one of you four are not guilty, this will be a splendid way of proving your innocence. I say, steady, Holmes. You're not suggesting that Lady Anne stole her own emeralds, are you? Are you, Mr. Holmes? I'm suggesting nothing. But I may point out that the recent vogue for the insurance companies has provided another interesting motive for these so-called I resent your insinuation. It's outrageous. Lady Anne, if I'm to recover your emerald, I must at least consider every possibility. A search is the most immediate practical action. Perhaps you'll retire into the next room while I persuade these gentlemen to submit to being searched. Very well, but but I think you're in danger of making a fool of yourself once again. No, wait, don't don't go, Lady Anne. A search won't be necessary. What do you mean, Murphy? I, I must throw myself on your mercy, Lady Anne. I confess that I stole the emerald. Murphy! After you put it in the drawer, Lady Anne, I, I slipped back into the room and took it out. Murphy, that's a criminal action. I, I know it, but I'm poor. I need money desperately for my mathematical research. I knew the emerald was priceless, and I... Well, I couldn't resist the temptation to take advantage of a joke. Here, Lady Anne, here's the stone, and please don't prosecute me. Please don't. It'd be my ruin. May I examine the emerald, Lady Anne? Thank you. Well, Mr. Murphy, I won't pretend that I'm not deeply shocked. I must ask you to leave my house... But you won't prosecute me, will you? It was a moment's temptation. No, uh, no, I won't prosecute you. Holmes, what are you doing with the emerald? Well, knowing something of the deceptive ways of thieves, I came on this case fully prepared to test the emerald when I found it. Now, uh, a drop of this acid on this vial, so... Mr. Holmes, what are you doing? You'll injure the stone. Uh, no, uh, not if it's a true emerald. Ah, uh -huh. look at that. Good Lord, the acid's eating to the stone as if it was sugar. But then that means... It that... means, Lady Anne, that Mr. Murphy has just imperiled his honor and his freedom to steal a singularly beautiful fake. Mr. Holmes, this joke has turned into a nightmare. Is there no way of recovering my emeralds? I hope so, Lady Anne. I've been taking steps in their logical order. The servants have all been questioned. We've searched Mr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy. Yes, most humiliating experience. Made me feel like a criminal. Well, personally, I was only too thankful to submit to a search this time. I knew I had nothing to worry about. You yourself, Lady Anne, you, you consented to being searched by the police matron that Holmes sent for? Only because he threatened to send for the police if I didn't. 
But distasteful though it was, I'd rather endure that than have this story on the front pages of the newspapers. And in spite of all these rather unfriendly proceedings, we've got exactly nowhere as regards finding the emerald. No, Stamford, but we have at least eliminated the possibility that the thief is secreting the jewel on his person. Still somewhere in these two rooms, eh, Holmes? I think so, though there is one remaining possibility. And that is? That the fake stone was substituted for the real emerald sometime before all of you engineered your April Fool's Day joke. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, that's not possible. I know it was the genuine emerald I took out of the safe this morning. How can you be sure? The substitute was an excellent imitation... Without a chemical test such as I performed, it would be hard to be certain. I can tell you why I'm certain. Last night, Papa came to dinner and brought a Mr. Van der Leider of Amsterdam. He examined the stone. And you'll agree that a jewel expert like that couldn't be fooled. That's true, Lady Anne. And what did you do with the emerald after Mr. Van der Leider left? I locked it in my safe and went to bed. Mm -hmm. I didn't unlock the safe again until Dr. Stamford and Mr. Murphy came here this morning. That settles it, then. The real emerald is still hidden somewhere in these two rooms. But where? That's the question. I must say it's completely mystifying. Well, let's go back to what we were all doing at the exact moment you came into the room, Lady Anne, and informed us of the loss of your stone. Now, we were... Well, we were drinking a toast to you That's and... That's it. Uh, Lady Anne, hard thinking is, uh, well, it's thirsty work. Oh, I'm so sorry. Let me get you something. Uh, a glass of port, perhaps. No, no, thank you, but I, uh... I observe that you have a remarkably comprehensive assortment of liqueurs. I wonder if I might have a glass of creme de menthe. Oh, of course. I'll get it for you. Creme de menthe in the middle of the day, Holmes? I knew you were eccentric, but this really Holmes, takes... This bottle, it, it clinked as I picked it up. I thought it might, Lady Anne. There's something inside it. Allow me, madam. Thank you. I'm sure you won't mind if I waste this liqueur on the aspidestra. Oh, no, so. Lady Anne. Allow me to restore to you the Elphinstone Emerald. Great Scott. Amazing. Fantastic. Ingenious. The one safe hiding place in the room. Where could a green gem be more effectively hidden than in a bottle of green liqueur? But who stole it? Who substituted the fake stone? Frankly, I don't care. The gem is restored. That's all that matters. Uh, I prefer not to go to court. Neither you nor I, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would show up in the best of lights... And my father would disapprove of this whole affair, I'm afraid. Just as you wish, Lady Anne. In either case, I shall expect your check for my services in due course. Well, here we are at the Criterion again, Stamford. Won't you come in and join us for lunch? Thanks, Watson, but I'll keep the cabin go on. I actually have a patient this afternoon. A rare and delightful experience for a young doctor, as you probably know. <laughs> as rare and delightful as a client is for a young detective, eh, Stanford? Yes. I quite understand, and I'm correspondingly grateful to you for your, your profitable hopes. I'm glad it was profitable for you. Personally, I feel pretty stupid about the whole thing. Well, goodbye. Uh, goodbye, right. fella. Goodbye. 39 Onslow Square, cabby. You're remarkably quiet, Mephus. Well, I, I'm afraid my conscience won't let me do much talking, Doctor. I'm heartily ashamed of myself. Well, thanks for the lift. I'll, I'll leave you traps. Oh, there. nonsense, nonsense. You'll join us for lunch, Murphy. But, uh, No buts about it, I insist. Come on. Well, it's awfully nice of you. Oh, come, 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 Murphy. Any one of us can make a foolish mistake. It's just lucky that you didn't have to pay for yours. Monsieur wishes it, David. Yes, for three, please. This way, Monsieur. Does this table please you? Excellent, thank you. Hi, right, George, I'm as hungry as a hunter. How about you, Murphy? No, I'm afraid I have very little appetite. This whole case has upset me oh. dreadfully. You mustn't take it so much to heart, Murphy. Uh, by the way, Doctor, I'd like to have your opinion on the case. Who do you think staged the theft of the emerald today? Perfectly obvious to me. Lady Anne Pilington did it herself to collect the insurance money. If she hadn't, she'd have insisted on your finding the thief. But uh, you needn't worry, old chap. You get your fee all right, I'm sure oh, of that. Oh, I'm not worrying about the fee. But I assure you, Lady Anne did not engineer that fraud today. You you, you mean that it was Stanford? Uh, tell him who was responsible, my dear Murphy. But how should I know? Oh, oh, come now, Murphy. Let's not fence any longer. You did an excellent job, a superlative job. I was uh, almost sorry to spoil it for you. I don't think I understand you, Holmes. Oh, yes, you do, Murphy. You're a splendid actor, too. 
I was so deeply touched when you had apparently stolen a fake jewel and uh, all the time you knew that the real one was safely hidden in the bottle of creme de menthe. To be abstracted at uh, your leisure. <laughs> you scoundrel. Holmes, do you mind telling me what's going on here? I'm completely and absolutely in the dark. Surely it's obvious, my dear doctor. The imitation emerald was a brilliant copy. What makes you so sure of that, my dear Holmes? Because this April Fool's Day hoax was only conceived yesterday, or that is what you wish the others to believe. Such a superb paste gem could not have been made at such short notice. Therefore, it must have been prepared by someone who knew about the hoax before it was arranged. Now, my dear doctor, when Stamper told you about the plan last night, whose idea did he say it was? He told me that it was Lady Anne Partington's plan. Precisely, ma'am. And yet Lady Anne referred to it today as Stamper's idea. Obviously, you, my dear Murphy, presented the plan to each as the notion of the other, and so only you could have arranged the real theft behind the hoax. I repeat, <laughs> a splendid job. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. May I, uh, may I also compliment you on your cleverness in frustrating my plot? Look here, what is all this? One of you is a criminal, the other is a detective. Yet you're throwing each other compliments as if you were in the same profession. The dividing line between the criminal and the criminal investigator is thinner than you might imagine, my dear doctor. How very true, my dear Holmes. Would you consider coming over to my side of the line? Together we'd make an unbeatable team. Oh, oh. oh you flatter me. Nevertheless, I must decline your offer, Mr. Murphy. Oh, a pity. On your side of the line, you'll never be a rich man. By the way, for your edification, my name is not Murphy. Though Stamford insists on thinking it is. Then what is your name, you scoundrel? <laughs> your friend says the word scoundrel so much better than you, Doctor. Uh, my name? My name is Murtry. Oh, indeed. Uh, spelled M-U-R-T-R-Y? No. Dear me, I have so much trouble with my name. People will either misspell it or mispronounce it. I'm afraid I'll have to begin calling it the way it looks. M-O-R-I-A-R-T-Y. Moriarty. Moriarty. I shall remember that name. I have a feeling we shall meet again. I trust that we shall. You've won the first round, Sherlock Holmes, I admit that. But I believe that um, a return match is indicated. I shall look forward to it, Moriarty. And now, Doctor, I can't stand your baleful glare any longer. Let's order lunch, shall we? <laughs> Doctor, that was a pretty hectic April Fool's Day. Yes, it was. I never want to see another one exactly like it. I don't blame you. <laughs> you know, I'd sure hate to have someone come to my house and pull a trick like that on me. Why, Mr. Bartell, do you have a precious emerald you, you fear may be stolen? Are you kidding? <laughs> I wouldn't know the difference between a precious emerald and a piece of green glass. But when it comes to rubies, now that's something else. Oh, you would know a ruby when you, when you saw it. Sure. Because a ruby has exactly the same color as a glass of Petri California port held up to the light. Mr. Bartell, you can find more excuses for talking about Petri wine than any man in the entire world. Believe me. Excuses? <laughs> I don't need an excuse to talk about Petri wine. Why, there's a wine that actually speaks for itself. If I may borrow a phrase from Shakespeare or somebody. There's no other wine quite like Petri wine because only Petri wine is made by the Petri family. And the Petri family has been making wine for generations. They've been handing down from father to son, from father to son, years and years of knowledge and experience of the fine art of turning luscious grapes into clear, fragrant, delicious wine. Yes, and because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, those letters P-E-T-R-I on a bottle of wine are the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle is good wine. You never miss with a Petri wine, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what's the prescription for next week's Well, story? next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a rather unusual story. It concerns a series of strange disappearances and a murder without apparent reason, and yet it was a case that Sherlock Holmes solved without ever meeting any of the suspects. I call it the singular affair of the disappearing scientist. Well, I'm sure we'll all want to hear that one, Doctor. Oh, I'm sure. Well, we're going to... Oh, before you go, Mr. Bartell, I want to urge our friends to do all they can to save on the use of all wheat and rice products and also fats and oils. There are millions of families literally starving to death in Europe and Asia. We're not being asked to give them our food. We're just being asked to take it easy on certain foods so that there will be some left for them to buy. I know there isn't one person listening to me tonight 
who would knowingly let anyone starve. And remember, unless you do help, thousands of little children will starve. So please, let's share a meal and save a life. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, A Study in Scarlet. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane, followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I'd like to ask you a short, simple question. Have you ever tried a glass of sherry before dinner? If you haven't, you'll never know what you're missing till you do. And make that sherry Petri California sherry. Because Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. Just hold a glass of Petri sherry to the light. Look at its wonderful clear amber color. Now just get a whiff of that aroma. Bouquet, the experts call it. I'm telling you, you can just smell those big, luscious grapes. Now, best of all, taste your Petri sherry. Sip it. Sip it slowly so you don't miss one single drop of this truly delicious wine. Yes, without a doubt, Petri sherry is good wine. Oh, and incidentally, Petri makes two kinds of sherry. Regular sherry and Petri pale dry. Both are fine. And if you're not sure which you might like best, do what I do. Don't buy one, buy two. Try them both. And serve them proudly because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our good friend and host, Dr. Watson, is waiting, so let's go in and join him. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. Here, Watson. Down, down, Monty. Down, down there. Don't seem very chipper tonight. Uh, tonight, yes, but they've been in disgrace most of the day, Mr. Bartell. Oh? What have they been up to? After the seals again, Doctor? Oh, my boy, this time it was chickens. They got into my neighbor's coop and had a delightful time. Fortunately, there were no casualties, but I'm afraid that my, uh, <laughs> my good neighbor policy has suffered a slight diplomatic strain. But you've come here to listen to Sherlock Holmes' adventures, not those of my dog, so uh, draw up your usual chair and make yourself comfortable, and uh, I'll get on with tonight's story. Last week, Doctor, you told us it was a case in which Sherlock Holmes found the solution without ever meeting any of the suspects. That's quite correct, Mr. Bartell. As remarkable as an exhibition of long-distance detection as I ever recall. But uh, judge the story for yourself, my boy. It's in the autumn of 1903, and... Sherlock Holmes was about to retire to his bee farm on the Sussex Downs. I must confess, Mr. Bartell, that my heart was heavy during those last few weeks we spent at Baker Street. I thought of the countless adventures that we'd shared together. I remembered those many evenings of quiet comradeship and companionship. A fire blazing away in the hearth as Holmes lay back in the shadows playing his beloved violin. And then, Mr. Bartell, as so often happened... There'd be a violent jangle on our doorbell and some wretched soul in misery would be standing before us and pouring out his troubles. Suddenly the violin would be discarded and Holmes the dreamer would become Holmes the man of action. Come, Watson, the game's afoot, he'd say. And in a few moments later, we'd be rattling off in a cab through the foggy, gaslit London streets. Yes, Doctor, I can imagine it was pretty hard for you to leave Baker Street. It was, Mr. Bartell. However, as it transpired, there was one more adventure awaiting us before we left. A few days before the actual move, 
I persuaded Holmes to take an afternoon off from his packing and accompany me on a visit to the laboratory of an old friend of mine, a Professor Jean Boulin. He was an eminent French scientist engaged in very important work at the London University. Well, by the way, this was at a period, Mr. Bartell, when radium was something extremely new and extremely rare. The university had just acquired a minute but invaluable portion of the element, and Professor Boulin was in charge of the research connected with it. I can remember the picture so well as Holmes stood in the laboratory talking with keen interest to the distinguished side. Amazing, Professor Boulin. Quite amazing. Think that this tiny leaden vessel contains one of the most precious substances in the world. Yes, Mr. Holmes. We have a great deal to thank Madame Curie for. This new element may force us entirely to revise our concepts of all physical structure. Your research is a great responsibility, Boulin. It is, Watson. But I must confess that I wish the authorities here would give me a freer hand. I foresee such infinite possibilities in the use, particularly the medical use of radium. But my conservative superiors seem to regard it only as a toy, a scientific curiosity. Limit your experiments accordingly, I suppose. Exactly. I'm given no opportunity to do anything that's in the least radical. Mm. It must be very disheartening. How can research ever get anywhere along those lines? It is a great misfortune, Holmes, that you've determined to retire to your bee farm. <laughs> uh, this project, we could use such an analytical mind as yours. <laughs> you flatter me, Professor. How many assistants do you have working with you, Buller? Three, but none of them are very inspired, I'm afraid. Well? My best assistant is a man named Barker. He's a little on the conservative side, too. But he is extremely adroit. The other two, a young man called Taylor and the girl Gladys Hughes, they mean well. But gauche, I fear, is the only word to describe them. <laughs> why, why, why do you laugh? Uh, I was just amused to observe that in describing my assistants, I chanced to be literal as well as figurative. It's odd that random symbolism can sometime... Uh, uh, but never mind that. You would like to see the rest of the laboratory. Yes, yes, indeed we yes, would. Thank you very much. I have some extraordinarily interesting photographic plates that record the emanations of radium. They're over here. I think you will find them most fascinating. Baker Street, particularly when our rooms are full of packing cases, seems rather drab after the scientific stimulations of Professor Boulin's laboratory, doesn't it, old chap? Yes, it seems drab, even if we hadn't been to see him. I feel frightfully depressed, Holmes. I just don't know what I'm going to do without you. Oh, you're still a young man, Watson, and a susceptible one. You'll marry again. No, no, I won't. Yes, <laughs> you will, old chap. And you'll end up by being glad that your old roommate, your difficult, rather unsociable old roommate is living in retirement on the Sussex Down. Rubbish. I shan't feel anything of the kind. In any case, I don't think you'll be able to stay in retirement for long. Your mind is much too alert to be satisfied by being a sort of midwife to a bunch of beastly bees. Oh, dear Watson. I feel that you'll never eat honey again. Yes, you can laugh, Holmes, but I could see how excited you were when Bula suggested that you might help him with his radium experiment. Oh, flattering suggestion, I must admit, my dear fellow. Just the same, I... Oh. Now, who the devil's that? From the urgency of the tug on the bell pull, I'd say that it was a client. Then go and head him off, will you, old chap? Yes, I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, uh, Watson, explain that I'm no longer in practice. It's too late, Holmes. He's bust past Mrs. Hudson. Here he comes rushing up the stairs. Oh, confound it. I beg your pardon, sir. Are you but, Mr. Uh, Sherlock Holmes? Uh, no, I am not Sherlock. Then you must be Mr. Holmes. Uh, that is my name, sir. But may I ask what accounts for your rather whirlwind entrance? My housekeeper, Mrs. Hudson... I haven't any time to consider oh, yeah. etiquette. My sister Gladys Hughes has vanished. Vanished into thin air. You've got to find her for me, Mr. Holmes. I'll pay you any fee you name, but you've got to find her. Mr. Hughes, I'm extremely sorry that your sister has vanished, but I'm afraid that I can do nothing to help you. I'm retiring. I'm giving up my practice. If you won't help me, I'll go to someone who will. That's exactly what I mean, sir. I suggest that you go to the police, or if you insist on a private investigator, I can strongly recommend Mr. Martin Hewitt. Yes, his address is um, 39 Pont Street, Knightsbridge. Good day to you. Uh, good day, Mr. Hughes. 36 Pont Street, Knightsbridge. <clears throat> Mr. Martin. Yes, I can understand his concern, but his manners leave a great deal to be desired. Holmes, Holmes. Gladys Hughes, his missing sister, that was the name of one of Professor Boulin's assistants, wasn't it? True, old fellow, but it's uh, probably only a coincidence. What? Both Christian and surnames are extremely common ones. Well, I, 
I have a feeling that it may not be a coincidence. Oh, 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 come now, my dear fellow. Don't you try and embroil me in a fresh adventure. I've retired and I'm leaving for Sussex in a few days. And if any more clients come wrenching at my doorbell, I shall ignore them. <laughs> But, Mr. Holmes, you've got to help me. My son, Jeffrey Barker, has disappeared. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barker, but I'm afraid I'm... Holmes, a... Jeffrey Barker was the name of Professor Bullard's chief assistant. Uh, Watson, please believe me when I say that I am not to be inveigled into any further... Uh, Mrs. Taylor, I'm sorry, but I can't help you. Oh, but, Mr. Holmes, it's my husband. He's disappeared. We, we've only been married three months, and now... Oh, it's... Terrible. I, I've been so worried ever since he started to work on that strange new radium with Professor Jean Bernard. Holmes, you can't pretend it's coincidence any longer. Gary Hughes, Jeffrey Barker, and now Taylor. The three assistants of Professor Bullard. I know it, Watson. Mrs. Taylor, the moving van will be here tomorrow to take, to take my things to Sussex. I shall follow them immediately. I have retired, madam. Do you understand that? Retired. <laughs> Yes, another telegram for you, Holmes. It'll be the fourth today. Why won't Scotland Yard leave me alone? Well, it's a pretty strange business. Three people engaged in research of this new element, radium, have all disappeared within 48 hours. Scotland Yard needs your help. Let them earn their salaries, my dear Watson. I've helped them for the last time. Well, let's see how they've couched their latest diffusion. Oh, this isn't from Scotland Yard. It's from my brother, Mycroft. Mycroft? What's he going to say? Listen to this. Now Professor Boulin has disappeared. Great Scott. And the radium with him. Surely the pattern is obvious, Sherlock. Radium must be found. Could solve the problem for you, but I'm too lazy. Consider what a flashy case for you to retire on regards Mycroft. Ha, 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 the old devil. Holmes, this is shocking. My old friend Boulin has, has disappeared. Yes, Watson, and now my brother asks me to investigate. Hmm... The pressure becomes irresistible. Very well. I bow to fate and postpone my retirement for a few hours. Good man, Holmes. You know, you'll, you'll never really retire. Let me see. As Mycroft says, there's an obvious pattern in this case. Our first step, of course, will be to interview all the doctors who treat patients without charge. Why? Well, surely that's obvious. Well, it isn't at all obvious to you. I don't know why you always leave me in the dark. <laughs> well, what makes you laugh? <laughs> Being left in the dark, it's... Just like the old times, isn't it, Holmes? <laughs> Come on, old fellow, let's go. The game's afoot. Uh, Dr. MacDonald, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Mr. Sherlock Holmes. I'm very glad to meet you. And I, you, uh, Dr. MacDonald. I swear that I've never been in as many doctor's offices as I have today. But Mr. Holmes is in search of some information. Perhaps, Doctor, you, you can help him. I'll do my best. Uh, what do you want to know, Mr. Holmes? Uh, whether you have any charity patients with skin eruptions or growths of any kind. I mean, oh. patients that have not kept their appointments recently, perhaps. Now, let me see. Why, why yes, I do. Old Mrs. Pendle. She has a very bad case of lupus. She was due for a treatment here yesterday, and I've seen nothing of her. Splendid. Can you give me her address? Why, oh, certainly. It's in my book here. Well, I hope this isn't a false trail, Holmes. You can only explore it and see, dear chap. Uh, here we are. Mrs. Pendle, mm. 36 Elm Gardens, Clapham. Mrs. Pendle, 36 Elm Gardens, Clapham. Thank you, Doctor. I'm greatly obliged to you. <laughs> Getting restless, Watson? Yes, I am a little. We've been waiting outside Mrs. Pendle's house for over an hour. Why don't we knock on the door and see if she's at home? Oh, no, 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 my dear chap. We mustn't frighten her. I hope that she's going to lead us to our quarry. You see... Shh, shh, shh. Front door's opening. A woman's coming out. Yes, it's Mrs. Pendle, beyond doubt. Look at that bandage around the upper part of her face. Yes. Hello, she's turning down the street. We're going to follow her, I suppose. Naturally, but let's give us a let's give her a start, shall we? We don't want her to spot us. Well, while we're waiting, perhaps you clear up one or two points for me. I'm still very much in the dark. With pleasure, old chap. What puzzles you? Well, one of the things that Come I on. Do... What? We've given her enough of a start. Let's follow her. Oh, very well, very well. But look here, Holmes. You asked me what I didn't understand. Two things puzzle me. What did Mycroft mean by the pattern of the case? 
Why are we following a poor sick old lady through the London streets? I'll ask, answer the first question, and I think the answer to the second will be sort of apparent. The pattern of the case is clear. Professor Boulin and his three assistants have vanished together with the radium, but their disappearances were not simultaneous. Had they been so, it would have been a transparent case of theft. But with the disappearances gradual rather than simultaneous, the emphasis has been subtly shifted. Yes, I can see that, Holmes, but what do you suppose is the back of the whole business? It can't be a simple case of theft. Radium is enormously valuable, but it'd be hard stuff to sell again. Not to an unscrupulous criminal with a knowledge of medicine, Watson. My own theory, and I admit at the moment that it's purely a theory, is that Professor Boulin was worried because he was so hampered in his research. You remember that he stressed his great faith in the medical values of the new element, radium. Yes, 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 he did. It's more than possible that he places the rights of science above the rights of property, that he's determined that he and his group will carry on their invaluable research unhampered by the conservative restraints of the university. I see what you mean, Holmes, but how does Mrs. Pendle, the poor woman that we're following, enter the picture? Because one of the chief lines of radium research on the continent so far has been with her sort of trouble. Professor Boulin's obvious move, if my theory is correct would be to contact poverty-stricken patients, promise them relief, induce them to abandon their regular treatments, and submit to him. By Joe, yes, Holmes, that seems perfectly logical, and yet I can't believe that Boulin would... Mrs. Uh... Pendleton has uh, reached her destination. She's turned down a driveway. Yes, yeah, she's walking up to what looks like a, a deserted well. Hurry, old chap. Don't let her out of our sight. She's opened the door without knocking. She's gone in. We'll wait here for a moment or two, then we'll follow her. I have a feeling that your old friend, Professor Boulin, is not far away, Watson. Yes, you're probably right. But I hope we can do something to protect him from the consequences of what he's done. It might easily mean the finish of a brilliant career. I'll do everything in my power, but you know as well as I do... Shh, shh, look, 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 look. Mrs. Pendle's coming out again. <coughs> yes, and she's in trouble. Come on. <coughs> Mrs. Pendle, what's wrong? I don't know how you know my name or who you be, but you ask me what's wrong. They tell me to come here to this address, and I find a doctor who'd help my face. I come here, and what do I find? What did you find, madam? A corpse, sir. That's what I find. A dead man lying there in a great pool of his own blood. <laughs> You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. So I'm just going to remind you that there's one wine which everyone likes and which is good on any occasion. Petri California Sherry. You want a swell wine to serve before dinner? The perfect answer is Petri Sherry. If you want a wine that's delicious after dinner or later in the evening when you're just talking things over with your friends, again, you want Petri Sherry. And if you want a wonderful wine to serve at cocktail time, naturally you want Petri Sherry. Sherry is a wine that's good at any time. And Petri, well, Petri is the wine that's good all the time. Well, Dr. Watson, so following the tracks of old Mrs. Pendle led you to a corpse, huh? Yes, Mr. Bartell. Of course, Sherlock Holmes and I went at once into the broken-down warehouse to examine the scene of the tragedy. Slumped over a desk in a dark and shabby room... A flickering candle giving a macabre lighting to the scene it was the body of a man. I think I knew its identity even before Holmes turned to me. He said, It's Professor Boulard. All right, Watson. Good devil. Murdered, of course. Yes, but examine him for yourself, will you? Yes. <coughs> yes, there's no doubt about it. This wound couldn't have been self-inflicted. The right oracle of the heart is... Has been pierced. How long ago would you estimate death took place? Uh, not more than a, a couple of hours ago, I should say. Uh, not hard to reconstruct the killing. The murderer came up from behind Boulin as he sat here. Crooked an arm around his throat. Yes. See the finger marks on the right-hand side of the neck? Here? Then stabbed him in the chest. And then withdrew the weapon and disappeared. Leaving no traces, confound it. A dusty room is an ideal place for recording footprints, but uh, there are half a dozen different prints here, including Mrs. Pendle's. Hello. Here's the print of a smaller woman's shoe. Well, it must be that of Gladys Hughes, his assistant. Undoubtedly. But that really proves nothing except that she was here with him. The fact that we were convinced of anyway. Mm. Question is... Come on. Let's go outside and talk to Mrs. Pendle again. Poor old Boulin. 
What a shocking way to die. And what a great loss to science. I suppose the murderer must have stolen the radium. We found no trace of it in there. Undoubtedly, the possession of the radium was the motive for the murder. Uh, Mrs. Pendle. The poor man is dead, ain't he, sir? I'm afraid so, madam. I knew it. I never should have come here. I never should have left Dr. MacDonald. Mrs. Pendle, let me ask you a question. I can't be answering no questions, sir. I don't know nothing about how the poor soul got himself murdered. What would a poor woman like me know about no, such no, things? No, 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 my good woman. My friend isn't suggesting at all that you know anything about the murder. Then what do you want to know, sir? Who told you to come to this address today, Mrs. Pendle? A young lady. Nice young lady she was, too. She met me coming out of Dr. MacDonald's yesterday and told me that if I come here today, I'd find a doctor who could cure me. Yeah, that was obviously Miss Hughes. Holmes, I believe that your theory was right. Come on, Mrs. Pendle. We'll escort you to the nearest police station where you uh, can report the murder. Yes, sir. And then, Watson, we must keep on the track of the radium. That, perhaps, is more important than any life. Well, how are we going to do that? We haven't a clue to go on. Remember that Professor Boulin's three assistants are still missing. We must go to the homes of each of them and see what can be found out. Mr. Hughes, you must realize by now that your sister's disappearance is part of something vastly more significant than you think. I must ask you in the... My first... sister didn't disappear, Mr. What do you mean, sir? You came to us and said that she had. Oh, it was all a mistake, gentlemen. She came back today. She'd just been down to the seaside for a short rest, and she'd forgotten to let me know. I'm sorry to have bothered you. May I see your sister at once, please? I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes, but she's out just now. I don't know where she's gone or what time she'll be back. <laughs> Mrs. Barker, I've come to you about your son's disappearance. I'm afraid that... Oh, but the... my son didn't disappear, Mr. Holmes. It was all a misunderstanding. He came home today. Then may we speak to him, please, Mrs. Barker? Oh, I'm afraid that's impossible. You see, he... Mrs. Taylor, I want to talk to you about your husband's disappearance. Oh, that... He came home this afternoon, Mr. Holmes. At first I was so suspicious, but... But when he explained, well... <laughs> Well, I'm sure you know how it is in the first few months of marriage. Those, those little tears. Confound it, Watson. We are no nearer the solution. And meanwhile, here we are back in Baker Street to find that the moving van has taken all your things off to Sussex. Perhaps you should give up the case, Holmes, and follow them. Close my career on a note of failure. No, 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 my dear fellow. I shall not leave London until this problem is solved. Oh, that case, I'll, I'll sit down. <coughs> Looks to me as if it may prove a lengthy wait. I've rarely felt more frustrated, Watson. All three vanished technicians home safely with plausible stories, or at least plausible alibis. And poor Bula murdered, the radium stolen. Oh, I must say it makes no sense to me. But it must make sense. The pattern was well enough to find in the beginning. It's just a question of... Finding the right key. In a way, it's clear enough what's happened. One of the three assistants, placing the financial value of radium above its value to science, murdered Boulin to obtain the prize. The other two, fearing that their complicity in the original plot would involve them as accomplices in murder, ran home and established an alibi. And the murderer did the same thing, for it's obvious one of the three must be the killer and the thief. Yes, the question is, which one of the three is the culprit? If only poor Boulin were alive, he could help us. My dear chap, if Boulin were alive, there would be no murderer. Well, of course it would. Of course he would. Now, let's see, let's see, let's see. Boulin gave us a few bare facts about his three assistants. I, I wonder... But of course, Watson... I have the answer. The case is solved. What do you mean, Holmes? That cannot be solved. You haven't done enough investigation. If it comes to that, you haven't even seen any of your three suspects. That isn't necessary. Oh, you know who did it? Yes, Watson, and so should you. But we know nothing to set them apart from each other, except that one of them's a girl. We know more than that, my dear fellow. Think hard. Well, Boulin told us that Jeffrey Barker was an excellent technician, while the other two were somewhat too we know, clumsy. We know even more than that. Well, I'm just if I know what, Holmes. I shan't even need to stay in London and follow the case through to its logical conclusion. A telegraph uh, to uh, Mycroft and another to uh, Scotland Yard to take care of it, yes. And I can be in Sussex before the moving van, after all. Oh, you mean you're going now before the case is solved? But it is solved, my dear fellow. All that remains to be done is some purely routine work. Uh, what's the time? Uh, look, it's uh, 
It's three o'clock. Uh, splendid. If we hurry, we can catch the 345 Express from Waterloo. We? Oui? Yes, I um, I was counting on you spending a few days down there with me, old chap. I, I hope you can spare the time. I should hate to make so drastic a change without... Uh, my good old friend Watson at my side? Oh, of course. I'll be delighted, but... Uh, but but uh, what, my dear boy? The case of the disappearing scientists. Wait until we get to Sussex, shall we? Hmm? As soon as I get an answer to my telegrams, I'll explain the whole thing to you. And now let's hurry, shall we? Our train leaves in 40 minutes. <laughs> T. Watson. Thanks, old boy. Ah, peaceful down here, isn't it? Extremely. At the moment, I must confess, I find it rather nerve-wracking. Oh, why? Uh, You know why, Holmes. I want you to open that telegram and tell me if your solution to the the Boulin case was the correct one. Very well, my dear chap. Let's see. Uh Uh-huh. It's from Mycroft. Listen. Murderer arrested and radium recovered. Well done, Sherlock, though you took longer than I expected. Regards, Mycroft. Oh, congratulations, Holmes. <laughs> and now perhaps you'll con- condescend to, to tell me how you solved it. <laughs> Don't be angry with me, old chap. I only wanted to make sure that my solution uh, was correct. You remember the uh, the nature of the fatal wound on Boulin's body? Of course. He'd been stabbed through the right oracle of the heart. From behind. Proving that the murderer was... Clearly right-handed. Oh, what does that signify? Almost everybody's right-handed. Oh, no, not in this case. If you recall, Professor Boulin said that um, Jeffrey Barker was adroit, while his other two assistants were gauche. Then he laughed because he said his remark was true, both literally and figuratively. I still don't see what I'm talking about. Oh, come now, Watson, come. Uh, Think of the origin of the word adroit. Ardois. Droit is the French word for right. And gauche is, is the word for left. Meaning the two gauche assistants were left-handed, and therefore only the adroit, the right-handed Barker, could have inflicted the fatal wound. I see it now, Holmes. <laughs> you know, if you'd remembered that mark of Boulin's at the time we found his body, you could have solved the case much sooner. That's true, old fellow, very true. <laughs> and when my old friend Watson points out that my memory is failing and my mind sluggish, then I know that my retirement has been postponed for... Far too long. Well, so so Holmes really went through with his idea of becoming a bee farmer. Yes, of course, of course. It became one of his favorite hobbies. Do you know anything about the, the raising of bees? Oh, nothing at all. The only connection I've ever had with bees was very remote. Once I had the hives. Once you had the... Oh, no, oh, no, no, Mr. Barker. <laughs> oh, yes, Dr. Watson. But seriously, I do know one thing about bees. Even when you know all about them, you're apt to get stung. That's true enough. So I'll make my hobby Petri wine. You know, you can't miss when you buy Petri wine, because Petri wine is always good wine. The Petri family has been making fine wine for generations. In fact, they started way back in the 1800s. And they've handed on down from father to son, from father to son, the knowledge and experience absolutely essential to the making of truly fine wine. And since the making of Petri wine is a family affair, you can be sure that the name Petri means something on a bottle of wine. Those letters, P-E-T-R-I, are more than a trademark. They're the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of Petri wine is good wine. So when you buy wine of any type, you can put your faith in the Petri label, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you going to tell us next week? Well, let next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you about one of the weirdest adventures that Holmes and I ever had. It concerns a haunted chapel in the wilds of Cornwall, Strange organ music that played at midnight, and the headless ghost of a murdered monk. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher, and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Rygate Puzzle. Music is by Dean Fossler. 
Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. Petri Wine brings you... Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invites you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And as for me, well, I'd like to tell you the easiest way I know to get the reputation of being the perfect host. Next time friends come over for dinner, before you sit down to the table, serve glasses of Petri California Sherry. Petri Sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. I say Petri Sherry because Petri Sherry is extraordinary Sherry. You can tell by looking at it. Hold it to the light. Notice how clear it is. Notice its beautiful deep amber color. And you can tell Petri Sherry is unusual from just a whiff of its fragrance. And, of course, in the last analysis, you can tell just how fine a wine Petri Sherry is by tasting. That's the best test of all. And that's where you'll get the most pleasant surprise because Petri Sherry really tastes wonderful. A flavor right from the heart of the grape. So serve Petri Sherry to your family and your friends and serve it proudly. Because the name Petri is the proudest name in the history of American wines. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's expecting us. Let's not keep him waiting. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Bartell. You forgive me if I, I don't get up, won't you, my boy? Of course, Doctor. What's the matter? A touch of rheumatism? No, no, I've played 18 holes of golf today. <laughs> I hope that when I'm your age, Doctor, I can be half as sprightly. Oh, it's nice of you, but if you don't mind, we won't discuss the uh, question of my age. <laughs> so drop your chair, make yourself comfortable. I'll get on with tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. Well, from the hints you gave us last week, it sounded like quite a spooky story. It was, Mr. Bartell. It it certainly was. Towards the end of November in the year 1895, a dense yellow fog had settled down over London. For four or five days, it was impossible from our rooms in Baker Street to see the outline of the houses opposite. A real London pea super, huh, Doctor? Yes, my boy, and it became most depressing. The first day, Holmes had spent in cross-indexing his huge book, of criminal references. The second and third had been patiently occupied with a subject which he had recently made his hobby, the music of the Middle Ages. But when on the fourth day, on pushing back our chairs after breakfast, we saw the greasy, heavy brown swirl still drifting past us and condensing in oily drops upon the window panes, Sherlock Holmes' impatient and active nature could endure this drab existence no longer. He paced restlessly about our sitting room, chafing against the inaction. After several minutes of these perambulations, he turned to me and spoke. Anything of interest in the paper, Watson? Oh, news of a revolution, a possible war, and of an impending change in the government. Nothing to interest you, though. <laughs> no crimes of any importance. The London criminal is certainly a dull and unenterprising fellow these days. Look out of the window, Watson. See how the figures loom up, are dimly seen, and then blend once more into the foggy depths. What a day for a thief or a murderer. He could roam London as the tiger does the jungle, unseen until he pounces, and then evident only to his victim. Oh, that's a cheerful thought, I must say. Hello, hello. I wonder who that is. Probably a visitor for Mrs. Hudson, or perhaps the local plumber has finally condescended to pay some attention to the faulty gas jet in our hallway. I don't think you're right on either count. I can hear Mrs. Hudson's footsteps on the stairs. Come in. Come in. Yes, Mrs. Hudson, what is it? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Holmes, but there's a gentleman to see you. Says it's most important, and he asked me to give you this card. Oh, thank sir. you. Oh, Mother Mahali, eh? 
Show him up, please, Mrs. Hudson. Very good. What about Harley and who's he? I've not had the pleasure of meeting him personally, but I'm quite familiar with his scientific reputation. Scientific? Oh, and what does he specialize? Oh, I, um, I suppose one might refer to him as one of the greatest authorities on all matters connected with the occult. You mean the fellow dabbles in supernatural stuff and all that sort of thing? Hmm. I mean, my dear Watson, that uh, Otto Mahali is an extremely intelligent man with a thoroughly comprehensive and scholarly knowledge of his field and an intense belief in the existence of the supernatural force. Now, here he is to speak for himself. Oh, come in, Harley. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, you're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? Yes, sir. This is my colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do, Mr. Harley? How do you do, Doctor? Uh, won't you sit down, sir? Thank you. <laughs> well, you fellows are probably wondering who I am and what's brought me here. Well, we're not wondering who you are, Mr. Harley. My friend Holmes is just telling me of your scientific eminence. I'm flattered that you know of me, Holmes. Just the same, you're wondering why I'm here. Naturally, sir. Well, since you know I'm a student of the occult, I'll get right down to my problem. Mr. Holmes, have you ever heard of the headless monk of Trevenis Chapel? Oh, yes, indeed, Mr. Harley. An apparition to be counted among our more intangible national treasures, I should say. I'm sorry to appear stupid, but I have never heard of the headless monk of whatever it is, Chapel. Well, then, let me tell you about it, Doctor. Yes, I wish you would. The Venice Manor in Cornwall was once an abbey. It was expropriated during the reign of Henry VIII, and several of the monks were killed in some of the, uh, <laughs> some of the minor difficulties attendant on such an act. But one of the murdered monks, a certain Brother Hugh, the chapel organist, was persistent. He still haunts the chapel today. He still plays the organ. And since he was beheaded, he always appeared headless. <laughs> Charming little legend, Mr. Harley, but you don't expect us to believe it's anything but a legend, surely. Ah, <laughs> skeptic, eh? How about you, Mr. Holmes? I'm extremely curious to know why you come to see me, Mr. Harley. I'll tell you why. I have a rare opportunity to investigate the phenomena. You see... The son of an old friend of mine, a young fellow by the name of Leonard Miles, is secretary to the owner of Trevenis Manor. He asked me to stay there, and I find the invitation irresistible, particularly since the phenomena have curiously increased of late, Mr. Holmes, almost as though some more mortal agency were motivating them. Oh. Now I see why you've come to me, Mr. Harley. I knew you would, Holmes. You see, I'm like my good friend and fellow investigator, Carnacki. I believe in being prepared to meet phenomena on either the natural or the supernatural plane. If the phenomena are real, then they fall legitimately in my field. Uh, whereas if, um, as I'm sure you suspect, they are being contrived by human forces, then you think uh, that's part of my department, eh, Harley? Exactly. Well, what do you say, Holmes? A little trip to Cornwall will be a nice few, few days. We, we'd probably escape the fog down there. Ah, oh, the places with the weather, Watson. What? I'm much more concerned with the fog that surrounds the appearances of the headless monk of Venice Chapel. And Mr. Harley, I accept your invitation with pleasure. There's still time to catch the Cornish Express. We can be at Venice Manor before the moon is up. Hello? Who's this funny-looking fellow coming down the steps towards us? If I didn't hear the sound of his footsteps, I believe it was a psychic manifestation. He certainly looks as if he came from beyond the grave. Who be ye, gentlemen? Where be ye going? Well, supposing you tell us who you are first, my good man. Who be I? I be David Pendragon, sir. That's who I be. Stable and here at the manor. And I ask you gentlemen again where you be going. We're staying at the manor, and we're just going to take a look at the chap. Oh, don't he do that, sir. People that go in there don't often come out the way they go in, sir. Don't he do it, gentlemen? What are you talking about, my good fellow? I be talking about the ghoulies and the ghosties and the organ music that comes out of the nowhere. You, you heard it? Of course I heard it, sir. Just like I seen the poor monk walking around without his head on. Take us into the chapel, will you? And, and, and show us where you saw the figure. Aye, that I will not, sir. Not for all the gold in Port Call will I go back and chance seeing the poor lost soul wandering about without his head on. If you gentlemen know what's good for him, you'll not go in there either. Mark my words. Don't he go in that chapel. Extraordinary chap. Seems really frightened of the place. He is. But it's more than blind superstition that accounts for his reluctance. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Well, I suppose it's all right. Quick, 
Wait, Scott. Listen to that. The organ. The ghost playing. We are extremely fortunate. A psychic manifestation as soon as we enter. Remarkable. Psychic manifestation. Rubbish. Look who's sitting at the keyboard. It's Holmes. Holmes. What's the matter, Watson? What's the matter? <laughs> you frightened us to death, didn't he, Holly? Well, speaking for myself, Doctor, he disappointed me. I thought it was a genuine phenomenon. What do you think you're doing, Holmes? I thought you were still behind us. I'm sorry if I frightened you, Watson. I was curious about this organ. I slipped in by the side door ahead of you and tested the instrument. It's in astonishingly good condition for a disused chapel, don't you think, Harley? Yes, I do, Holmes. One might reasonably presume that someone tends it with great care. In fact, I would go further and say... What are you doing in here? Uh, we are guests at the manor house, and we decided to pay a visit to the chapel before we paid our respects to our host. Oh, my father is your host. I'm Dorothy Brown. How do you do, Dorothy? Uh, my, my name is uh, Holmes, and these gentlemen are Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Harley. How, How do you do, do, do Dr. Mr. Watson, Harley? Mr. Harley? I heard the organ music, and I was terribly frightened. You've heard of the legend, I suppose. You mean about the headless monk and the ghostly organ and music, Miss Brownlee? Yes, Doctor. And it's more than a legend, I assure you. That's why I rushed over here as soon as I heard it. It must have frightened all the servants within hearing distance. Why were you playing the organ? I was curious to see whether it was in good repair. Obviously it is, Mr. Holmes. Well, my father and his secretary, Mr. Miles, are expecting you, I know. Let's walk over to the house, shall we? I'm sure you've seen enough of the chapel for tonight. Father, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do, How do you do, sir? How do you do? This is my secretary, Leonard Miles. How do you do, Mr. Miles? Oh, Mr. Mr. Miles? Dr. Watson? I'm afraid Mr. Brown is rather angry with me. I hadn't told him that you were an expert on psychic phenomena, Mr. Harley. Well, I fail to see why the knowledge of that fact should make you angry, Mr. Brownley. I don't want you ferreting about into this so-called ghost business. There's been enough trouble in the neighborhood already. It's almost impossible to keep servants... And these Cornish people are incredibly superstitious. You haven't seen the ghost yourself, Mr. Brownlee? Oh, of course not. There isn't any ghost, I tell you. You heard the mysterious organ playing? Hmm? Uh, well, uh, no, no, I haven't. And I don't want to talk about it anymore. Good. Yes, yes, what is it? David Pendragon at the door. He's very really anxious to see you, sir. Pendragon? Oh, oh very well. Tell him to come in. Uh, yes. David? What does he want, I wonder? Pendragon, that's the fellow we met outside the chapel, isn't it? Yes. Quite a colourful character. Oh, he's a superstitious old fool, if you ask me. But he is a good groom. Yes, Pendragon, what is it? Begging your pardon, sir, but there'll be trouble at the chapel again tonight. I says to myself, David, tis your duty to go to the master, I oh, says. Oh, never mind, never mind. What's the trouble? As the moon was hanging low tonight, sir, I hears the organ a-playing. But that was Mr. Holmes, my good man. Aye, that's what he thinks, maybe. But what I says to myself is, what made him play the organ? Then this very night, I saw the headless monk. With my own eyes, I saw that poor soul with his head off, wandering in the moonlight. I saw that, sir, with my own eyes, I did. Oh, get out of here, you blithering old fool. And I'm warning you, if I hear any more nonsense about this ghost, you'll lose your job, you understand? Now come along, be off with you. Aye, sir, begging your pardon, sir. Come on, I'll give you a chap to drink. Mr. Browner seems absolutely rabid on the subject of the ghost, eh? Yes. Suspiciously so. What about he's trying to hide? Whatever it is, I don't think he'll be successful. In your profession, Holmes, you know that murder will out. It's true in my profession also. Try to suppress them as you may, gentlemen. Ghosts will out. place may be haunted, but I swear that I never spent a better night anywhere. Ah, good morning, Mr. Harley. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. I'm glad to see I'm not the only late writer. Oh, were you up late too, sir? Yes, I was, Doctor. I decided to ignore the veiled threats of Mr. Brownlee, and so I did a little investigating in the chapel. Uh, would you mind passing the teapot? And what were the results of your investigations, Mr. Harley? Well, there was no psychic manifestation, you understand, but I'm sure of one thing. That chapel is evil. Evil to the hearts of its stones. 
and I'll swear that evil does not stem from the hapless monk who was murdered there. Mm, you confirm certain suspicions aroused by my own investigations last night. There is evil here, Mr. Harley, and I think I know its nature. Unless I mistake every sign and reaction, someone has been initiating the local peasantry into the evils of the Black Mass. Black Mass? Good Lord, what a, what a shocking thought. My own sensations last night confirm your theory, Holmes. There is a coven here, I swear it, hiding its own obscene practices under cover of the haunting. Well, that sounds quite feasible. After all, the people are so superstitious that they'd keep as far away as possible from the chapel when they, when they heard the organ play. This problem falls into both our fields, Harley. The practice of black magic is a criminal offense. Perhaps it's just as well. The old laws against witchcraft are still in force. I imagine, Mr. Harley, that you... Uh, have your own methods of combating such forces as we're up against? Oh, yes, Holmes. Though mine are not connected with the legal aspect of the case. May I ask what you plan to do, sir? Well, I have several rather elaborate preparations to make, Doctor. It'll take me most of the day, I'm afraid. However, I shall explain them to you all uh, after dinner tonight. <laughs> It's very pleasant to sit here after a good dinner with a superb brandy at one's elbow <laughs> and listen to the piano being so, so charmingly played. You're very fine, Doctor. Won't you play something more, Miss Bowley? I'd love to. Are you enjoying your stay down here, Oh, Mr. very Holmes? much, thank you. Both Mr. Harley and I have found the local folklore extremely interesting. I see. You fellows haven't been investigating the haunted chapel business again, have you? Oh, look here. If you have, I shall be very angry. It's abusing my hospitality. I told you distinctly, I didn't want any more talk of ghosts. We are not talking of ghosts, my dear Mr. Brownlee. I have something even more important that I must fight now. It's possibly a little hard to imagine me as a crusader. Me, the stooped little man beside the four of you, as toweringly tall a quartet of men as I have ever faced. And yet, I am your St. George. What on earth are you talking about, sir? I'll tell you in secrecy. This mustn't reach the ears of the peasantry. I refer to myself as St. George because I go to wipe out an evil that lives in your midst, a living modern dragon. Oh, please, Mr. Harley. That sounds dreadfully frightening. And to rid you all of this fiend, I must cleanse the chapel, purify it, exercise it, remove its residue of psychic evil. That, gentlemen, is my mission tonight. Dorothy! He's fainted. Get some smelling salts quickly. I'm afraid you were a little too graphic, Mr. Harley. I'm sorry if I frightened the young lady, but I, I'm i sure that after tonight she will have no further grounds for fear in Trevenice Manor. <laughs> Yes, old chap. Did, did you hear anything? Nothing but the owls and the clock striking midnight. I'm getting off the jumper. What do you suppose Harley's up to? I can imagine his procedure. Midnight, the crucial hour, I suppose, in his endeavors. I wish him luck. My own plans are not nearly as clear, unfortunately. I sense a guiding force here, but I lack the clues. There is something, Holmes. Yes, sir. Great heavens! It's the organ in the chapel. And Harley's in there alone. Not alone. Listen to the organ. Feeling forth its madness. Come on, Watson. Something has gone horribly wrong. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a second. You know, a moment ago, I told you how much I thought you'd like Petri California Sherry, but I didn't tell you that Petri Sherry is the all-round, all-American wine. You can not only serve Petri Sherry before dinner, it's good after dinner, too. And, of course, later in the evening, when you're listening to the radio with some friends, a glass of Petri Sherry is just the thing. And say, Petri makes two kinds of sherry, the regular and Petri Pale Dry. To make sure you get the one that you like best, do what I do. Don't buy one, buy two. But remember, always buy Petri. Dr. Watson, that was a heck of a place to break off your story. And let us continue it as speedily as possible, my boy. 
As soon as we heard that devilish organ music, Holmes and I rushed out of the house and raced in the moonlight down the path leading to the ruined chapel. By the time we reached the entrance, the organ music had ceased, and the tall, gangling figure of David Pendragon was standing in our path. You gentlemen be wanting at this time of night. What are you doing here? Oi, I be here because the gentleman gave me five shillings to stand outside here and see that no one disturbed him. Uh, That's why I be here. And nobody did come or go. He still be there, he be. But when you heard that organ music, why the devil didn't you go in? Organ music? I heard no organ oh, music, come on, sir. Watson. Come Great heavens. Look at him. We're too late, poor devil. A knife through his heart. It's obvious who did it at full of Pendragon. I'll, I'll go and grab him no, before no, he gets no, away. Watson, he's not our man. This murder was planned with devilish cunning. The curious thing, there's no sign of a struggle at all. He just stood here and allowed himself to be stabbed. There are these uh, chalk marks with which the body is surrounded. They're known as a pentagram, I believe. He thought it would protect him completely from the supernatural forces. Poor chap. For once his researches went too far. Yes, because they touched not on the supernatural, but upon natural evil. And remember, Watson, that only three people besides ourselves and David Pendragon knew of this vigil. Yes, Brownlee, his daughter, and young Miles, the secretary. Exactly. Um... Go back to the house, will you? And bring them here. Perhaps we can lay a ghost by trapping a murderer. And that's all I know, Mr. Holmes. Well, you've not established much so far, Holmes. The three of them all swear that they were asleep and that they didn't hear the organ. Yes, then you can't prove otherwise. I think I can prove that one of you was not only awake, but also murdered Mortimer Harley. But why should any of us want the poor man dead, Mr. In your case, young lady, I confess that I find it hard to conceive a motive. Implying that Mr. Brownlee and I might have one. Well, Mr. Miles, you must admit that you're responsible for Mr. Harley coming here. And you, Mr. Brownlee, must uh, admit that you did everything in your power to prevent the dead man from carrying out his investigations. Why? What are you trying to hide? Nothing. It's just that I wanted to sell the manor house. All this talk about ghosts was giving the place a bad name. And if it had gone on, I'd never have disposed of the property. Well, speculation can get us nowhere. Let's get down to facts. Is there any other entrance to this chapel besides the two doors? None. Oh, there was an old smuggler's cave which came out near the organ lot. But Father had it bricked up some years ago. I had to. The tourists kept crawling in. Go and examine it, will you, Watson, old chap? All right, you are, huh? If you don't mind my saying so, Mr. Holmes, it seems obvious who did this murder. You told us David Pendragon admitted that no one went in or out as he stood guard. He must have done it himself. Oh, the man's half-witted. And superstitious. He might have killed Mr. Harley because he was attempting to interfere with a ghost. And then played the organ to celebrate the occasion? I think you overestimate David Pendragon's capabilities, Miss Brownlee. Mr. Miles. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Uh, Pendragon is waiting outside. Would you be kind enough to ask him to come here for a moment, please? Certainly. Uh, what did you find out, Watson? Well, it's easy to see where it was bricked up, but it's a solid wall now. No one could get in that way. But if no one came in or out, who else could have killed Harley except Pendrack, the ghost? Or rather, the person disguised as a ghost. The dead man expected a psychic manifestation. When he, uh, when he saw the supposed ghost coming towards him, he offered no resistance. He believed that the magical pentagram would protect him. Ah, there you are, David. Aye, here I be, sir. But I don't know nothing more than what I told thee. No, don't be fighting, Pendragon. All we want is the truth. That's what I told thee, sir. Then tell us a little more, will you? Uh, when you said no one had entered the chapel tonight, you meant that no mortal man had entered, didn't you? That I did, sir. But how could I say I'd seen the ghost when Mr. Brownlee here had told me I'd lose my job if I spoke of the ghost again? Oh, now we're getting somewhere. So you did see the ghost? That I did, sir. The poor soul walking through the moonlight with no head on his body. You saw it quite clearly? Just as clearly as I see you now, sir. How tall was he? He was... Would you would you mind standing against the wall, sir? Yes, of course. He was as tall as... Well, his shoulders come to just where your shoulders come now, sir. You're a tall man, then, so we narrow it down to either you, Mr. Brownlee, or you, Mr. Oh, Miles. This is utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. On the contrary, gentlemen, the case is solved. Which one of them was it, Holmes? Neither. Remember that the ghost is headless. That means that the imposter must have built up fake shoulders covering the head. On either of these men, it would have uh, brought their shoulders to the level of my head. Great Scott, it was... <laughs> Bravo, Mr. Holmes. 
I didn't think you'd catch me. Dorothy! No, no, I don't. Please. Listen me. I must warn you that... Keep back. Don't any of you come near me. As you see, I have a revolver. Dorothy, for heaven's sake. Don't speak to me of heaven. <laughs> you thought I was a sweet little girl, didn't you, Father? <laughs> you didn't know your dear, demure daughter could murder a man, did you? Why did you kill Mortimer Harley? Because he was a meddler. For months, I've been practicing black magic here. For months, I've been building up the legend of the headless monk and the organ music. It made me so wonderfully alone. So gloriously free to practice the right. And then he came here. I let him live that first night because I thought he was a fool. But on the second, when he said he was going to exercise this chap, to purify it, as he said, he signed his death warrant. <laughs> If you could have seen his face, if you could only have seen his stupid, toddled face as I plunged the knife into him. Dorothy! He bled so beautifully. Holmes, Holmes, she's mad as a hatter. What are we going to do? <laughs> Finally, give me that revolver. And let you take me to prison or to the asylum. No, you'll never catch me. She's backing up the stairs leading to the organ loft. Dorothy, Dorothy, come back. Don't try and follow Look out. The railing's behind you. <laughs> And turn my head. Oh, no, Mr. Holmes, I... Dorothy! Dorothy! My poor little girl. Mr. Brownlee, the powers of evil are frightening. Your daughter had killed one man and might have killed more. She was insane. Hopelessly insane. <laughs> Doctor, that was quite an exciting story. You know, I wish I could play the organ and write music for it. There's nothing like music to really express a thought. Yes, I can just imagine the kind of music that you'd write. Probably a catchy little ditty such as The Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you drink, remember Petri wine. Oh, no, Doctor. Is that the way I affect you? Although on the level, you could probably write beautiful music to describe the way the grapes look on the vine in the sunlight. But what music could tell you about the Petri family? How long they've been making fine wine? You know, the Petri family has been making wine for generations. Handing on down from father to son, from father to son, the knowledge necessary to transform luscious, sun-ripened California grapes into delicious, fragrant wine. And when you see that name Petri on a bottle of wine, remember, you're not looking at a mere trademark. That name Petri is the personal assurance of the Petri family that every drop of wine in that bottle meets their unusually high standard. Petri wine is always good wine. It's got to be, because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes adventure do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me think, uh... Next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you a story that started quietly enough. As Holmes and I sat at a London dinner party, and yet, before the evening was over, we found ourselves involved in one of the most shocking scandals that ever rocked London society. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. <laughs> The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Petri Wine brings you... 
Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us another exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And I know that Dr. Watson will agree with me when I tell you that the best way to begin a good meal is with a glass of Petri California Sherry. Before you sit down to the table, pour yourself and your family a glass of Petri Sherry. Try it. There are many ways to tell a good wine by its color, its aroma, and its flavor. On every count, Petri Sherry is outstanding. The color of Petri Sherry is a clear, deep amber. Perfect. The aroma? Well, Petri Sherry is as fragrant as a bunch of dew-covered grapes picked in the early morning. But most important to you, and to me, is the flavor of Petri Sherry. We want a wine that tastes good. And believe me, you couldn't ask for a more delicious wine than Petri Sherry. And just to make sure you get a wine that's exactly the way you want it, Petri makes two kinds of sherry, the regular and Petri Pale Dry. If you're not sure which you'll like better, why not try them both? Don't buy one, buy two. Just be sure you always buy Petri, Petri Sherry. And now I'm sure our good friend Dr. Watson's ready for us. Let's go in and join him. <laughs> good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bartow. Quiet, quiet, it. Glad I want it. <laughs> Dogs seem very chipper tonight, Doctor. Have they been getting into any more trouble lately? Oh, no, my boy. It's been a relatively quiet week for them. One meeting with a dead seal, two visits to my neighbor's chickens, and a losing battle today with a cross-eyed... Sami's cat. <laughs> you, you call that a quiet week, eh? Well, it is for them, but never mind about the dogs. Drop your usual chair and make yourself comfortable. You're just in time to join me in a, in a glass of sherry. That'll be very nice, Doctor. Oh, I see you have the old dispatch box out again. Yes, my boy. As the story I'm going to tell you tonight took place in 1887, I thought I'd better refresh my memory on some of the details of the case. But shortly after my marriage, and as I had bought a practice in the Paddington district, I saw very little of my old friend Sherlock Holmes. How was doctoring in those early days? A struggle, my boy, a distinct struggle. Dr. Farquhar, from whom I had bought the practice, had at one time an excellent clientele, but his age, combined with an unfortunate affliction, he that resembled St. Vitus's dance, uh, had very much thinned it. I had uh, uh, confidence, however, in my, in my youth and in my energy. And I was convinced that in a very few years, the practice would be as flourishing as ever. But, as I said, I saw very little of Holmes in those days. I guess you were too busy to visit Baker Street, aren't I? Yeah, you guessed quite correctly, Mr. Bartow, quite correctly. Uh, Holmes seldom went anywhere himself, save on professional business. You can imagine my surprise, therefore, when one day on coming home from a heavy day's work, I found that Holmes had decided to pay us a visit. My wife persuaded him to stay to dinner, and as the three of us sat at the table, the flickering candlelight dancing strange patterns on the walls, fitted quite like old times. Holmes was in an unusually gay mood, and I can remember the twinkle in his eye as he turned to my wife and said, You're a brave woman, Mrs. Watson, to feed an unexpected guest on the maiden night out. I'm extremely grateful. Mrs. Hudson's cooking, though excellent of its kind, lacks variety. Uh, your dinner has been quite a treat. Oh, that's a very gracious little speech, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> yes, uh, I've never known you to be so observant about food, Holmes. <laughs> Perhaps the lack of your company, my dear chap, and the consequent lonely meals have made me conscious of Mrs. Hudson's culinary shortcomings. Oh, uh, <laughs> I, um... I suppose you're taking John out with you tonight on one of your cases. <laughs> oh, no, Mrs. Watson. Oh, I can understand your suspicions. My visit was purely social. Then let's go into the other room and, and have a pipe, shall we? Well, uh, don't you think you'd be more comfortable at the club? <laughs> but, so, Mary, I believe you want to get rid of us. Oh, <laughs> no, dear, it's not that. It's just that... Uh, that um, well, your visitor is due at any moment and you would count it on the house being empty by now. Why, how on earth did you know that, Mr. <laughs> Holmes? <laughs> Past half hour, you've been glancing at the clock with mounting anxiety. I feel sure that... Um, 
If it had been, if it had not been for my unexpected visit, your uh, your good husband would already have been walking towards his club. Yeah, it is my custom to go to the club on Thursdays, but uh, but how do you know? I know your habits, my dear chap, as well if not better than you do. It's a it's a good thing I'm a bachelor, isn't it, Mrs. Watson? Yes, indeed. A wife will keep no secrets from you, Mister Holmes. I'm sure. Uh, well, my dear, who who is your visitor, and uh, what is the secret that you you've been hiding? <laughs> It's innocent enough, John. As Thursdays is the maid's night out and you've been going to the club, I've been letting Alicia Wentworth meet her young man here. With me, a chaperone, of course. Oh, that's a mystery. Well, Watson, uh, yeah, yeah. love is on the wing and I'm sure we're dreadfully in the way. Let's uh, stroll to Baker Street, shall we? Well, of course, I'll get my coat. Uh, oh, why didn't you tell me, man? Eh? Well, I was afraid you might be angry, John. Angry, of course, ma'am. Alicia is such a sweet girl. And Harry Prendergast is a very charming young man. He comes from an excellent family, has a commission in the infantry, and the children are tremendously in love. But her beastly guardian forbids them to meet. So I... So, oh, there she is now. Well, we can pretend that we were just leaving anyway. Yes, I'll get my coat. Hello, Alicia, dear. Oh, Mrs. Watson, I'm so glad to see you. Come here. Alicia, this is my husband. And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do, you do? How do you do, my dear? It's a shame that we have to go now, but my friend and I have some very important business to attend to. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the detective, aren't you? Yes, Miss Whitworth. Please don't go, Mr. Holmes. Please don't. I need help so badly. Why, Alicia, what's wrong? You're as white as a ghost. Let's go into the drawing room, shall we? What's troubling you, Miss Wentworth? It's Harry, Captain Prendergast. I don't know exactly what's the matter, but something dreadful has happened to him. Oh, now sit down here beside me, dear. That's it. Miss Wentworth, uh, what reason do you have to suppose that Captain Prendergast is in trouble? I've seen friends of his today. They spoke of him almost as if he were dead. And yet they wouldn't tell me why. And just now I went to his club. And they told me that Captain Prendergast was not a member. But he is a member. He's been a member for years. Oh, what's happened to it? What has happened to it? There, there, dear. Mr. Holmes will help you. Now, don't you cry. Have you uh, been to the police, Miss Wentworth? No, Doctor. You see, I went to my guardian, but... He wouldn't let me go to the police. He said there'd be a scandal. But then he hates her. Mm, the Prindergast are a fine family. Uh, why does your garden object to, uh, object, uh, object to him so strongly? I don't think he would approve of anyone I choose. He doesn't want me to get married. Well, sounds like a positive ogre to me. Uh, who, who is your guardian, my dear? Colonel Moran. Colonel Sebastian Moran. Indeed. He's a man who has many entries against him in my ledgers, but a man that I've never met. I have long hoped to cross swords with him directly. But but how could Uncle Sebastian have anything to do with the criminal profession, Mr. Holmes? He's the son of Sir August Moran. And he was once British minister to Persia. Oh, oh you must be confusing him with someone else. No, my dear, it's the same man. And furthermore, I'm almost certain that your guardian is the right-hand man of a certain friend of mine whose name also begins with the three letters M-O-R. Good Lord, Moriarty. I have no proof. And yet I suspect that Colonel Moran is the second most dangerous man in London. That's Harry. It must be Harry. Oh, poor girl. I do hope you can help her, Mr. Holmes. I shall do my best, Mrs. Well, Watson. Well, if that is a young man at the door, it's more than likely her problem doesn't exist any longer. I hope you're right, Watson. Though with Colonel Moran as a guardian, I'm afraid the young lady is destined to have trouble. Come on, Harry. Good evening, Mrs. Watson. Oh, I'm so glad to see you, Harry. Uh, this is my husband. How do you do, Doctor? How do you do, my boy? And Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, Captain Prendergast? How do you do, sir? Harry, what's wrong? I can tell by your face that something dreadful has happened. It has, darling. Tell Mr. Holmes about it. He's promised to help us. Well, sir, I'm afraid this is a little outside of your province. <laughs> you will find that my friend's province is quite extensive, Captain Prendergast. I should be more than happy to do anything I can to help, sir. That's very nice of you, Mr. Holmes. Well, it's pretty bad. Last night I was accused of cheating at cards at the Tankerville Club. Oh, dreadful. Of course, I don't have to tell you that I didn't cheat, but the evidence was dead against me. I'd been winning heavily and the cards were proved to be marked. Marked? How? Oh. There were pinpricks on the edges. Pinpricks which indicated the card's value. Hmm. How did the pack of cards come into play? That's the devil of it. I myself broke open a sealed pack given to me by the club porter. And I swear, that was the pack that was later found to be marked. Was everyone searched? Yes. But they found a new, unopened pack in my pocket. The obvious implication being that you had substituted the marked cards, of course. I can see what happened. Somebody deliberately tried to incriminate you by dropping the new pack in your pocket. Of course, darling. But what I can't understand is how the marked pack was introduced into the game. Were there any other cards found in the room? None, Doctor. The Tankerville, eh? Colonel Moran is a member of the club, isn't he? Yes, he is. Uncle Sebastian uses it all the time. He was present at the game last night, Alicia. Oh, Harry. Now we're worse off than ever. 
If he thinks you cheated at cards, he'll never let us get married. Now, don't worry, Alicia. I'm sure that Mr. Holmes can find a way out of this. I'm afraid it'll be too late. I couldn't marry you now, Alicia. What do you mean, Harry? But they forced me to resign from the club. That's a bad enough disgrace. But I know there's worse to come. You see, I was expecting my promotion to major any day. Now it'll be a miracle if I'm not cashiered from the regiment. What kind of a life can I offer you? Harry, you're talking absolute nonsense. I think, Captain Prendergast, the next step is obvious. We must remove this apparent stain on your character. But how? Miss Wentworth can stay here with Mrs. Watson. The doctor and I will drive over in a cab with you to the club and see what can be done. What, uh... What kind of a card game were you playing last night, Prendergast? Stud poker. Ever since the American ambassador introduced it at the club, it's been quite a favorite. The perfect game for marked cards, which requires no elaborate dexterity in the dealing, simply the knowledge of your opponent's whole card. How many of you were playing? Half a dozen of us. Uh, you, uh, you were winning heavily, you say? Yes, Doctor. Though one of the others, a fellow named David Harkness, was doing well. Now I come to think of it, Harkness almost seemed to know when I was bluffing. As though he could see the marked card. Well, perhaps he was the one who marked them. It's possible. And yet certainly no one could accuse him of tricky dealing. He was so clumsy with his bandaged finger, eh? How did you know he had a bandaged finger, Mr. I'll Holmes? tell you that, Captain Prendergast, when you tell me what's really on your mind. There's a great deal more at stake than a card scandal, isn't there? Yes, there is. I didn't dare to tell Alicia about it. You see, I'm fighting a duel tomorrow. A duel? Lord, with whom? Colonel Moran. What? He insulted me last night. He goaded me beyond a man's patience. He taunted me until I couldn't stand it any longer. And so I challenged him. And in so doing, gave him the choice of weapons. Yes, could have found it. Of course, he chose revolvers. Moran was a big game hunter of note. He was reputed to be the best shot in England. And I'm probably the worst in London. If only I could shoot as well as I can box. I'm regimental champion, you know. Revolvers? Good heavens, man. Revolvers, a, a duel with Moran is, is suicide for you. No, it's not suicide. Ah, that's a tank of a club. Here, cabby. Keep the change, will you? Oh, blimey. Thank you, Governor. Suicide. No, what's not suicide. This is a carefully laid plan for murder. Pray heaven that we are not too late to avert it. Mr. Harkness that you want him, sir? Yes, he... He went to his room half an hour ago. Number 108. Up the main stairs and down the corridor, sir. Thank you. I, um, want you to follow us in precisely one minute and bring a sealed pack of the club's playing cards to Mr. Harkness's room. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. And thank you. Did you, uh, Did you make the arrangement? Yes, come on. Let's go up to Harkness's room. The three members have cut me dead since I came in here. It's the most humiliating experience. A little patience, Captain Prendergast, and I'm sure your honor will be entirely vindicated. I wish I knew what you were up to, Holmes. I'm going to try and restage the drama that was presented in this club last night. The only difference being that my production will have a cast that's a little different. Now, here we are. Now, let me do the talking. Yes? Did you want something? Prendergast, I don't want you in my rooms. I don't know why they allowed you inside the club. Let us in, Mr. Harkness, please. No, I won't. Take your foot out of the door, confound it. Uh, Mr. Harkness, there are three of us. <clears throat> I think you'd better let us in. You're going to let us in, Harkness. Oh, all right. Come in. Ah, oh, thank you for your hospitality, sir. Now perhaps you fellows will tell me what the devil you think you're up to. With pleasure. As you very well know, Mr. Harkness, this is probably Captain Prendergast's last day on earth. He has one request to make of you, that you join him in a farewell game of poker with us to show you bear no grudges. Oh, it's fantastic. You're all insane. Oh, by the way, Mr. Harkness, I'm delighted to notice that your sore finger seems to have healed with great rapidity. By an odd coincidence, you'll observe that uh, I seem to have injured mine. Mr. Holmes, when did you do that? Oh, in the carriage just now, a mere scratch. Fortunately, I had some first aid materials in my greatcoat. Come in. Yes, Taylor, what is it? Begging your pardon, Mr. Harkness, but the gentleman asked me to bring this sealed pack of cards here. Uh, 
Put them on the table, Taylor. Very good, sir. Well, what's the game? Stud poker, Mr. Harkness. A game with which you're quite familiar, I understand. And the stakes? A man's honor. Possibly another man's freedom. Open the pack, Mr. Harkness, and deal us all a hand. I should think this might be a very unusual game. You'll hear the rest of Dr. Watson's story in just a few seconds. Time for me to explain that Petri California Sherry is not only an ideal wine to serve before dinner, but it's also the perfect wine for almost any occasion. Petri Sherry is fine after dinner when you're listening to the radio or just sitting around talking. And, of course, you couldn't ask for a finer party wine than Petri Sherry, especially if your party is at cocktail time. If you don't know what wine to buy, you can't go wrong with Petri Sherry. But be sure it's Petri. Look for the letters P-E-T-R-I. They spell the proudest name in the history of American wine. Well, Dr. Watson, that was quite a game of poker you were settling down to. Uh, I have a feeling that Sherlock Holmes had an ace or two up his sleeve, didn't he? Well, figuratively, he did, Mr. Bartell. Though at the time, I must confess that, as usual, I was pretty much in the dark. David Harkness opened the new sealed pack of cards, and the four of us played a hand of poker. It was easy to see that our unwilling host was far from happy. His ferrety eyes darted from one to the other of us as he played our cards. <clears throat> He knew that he was the victim of a conspiracy, and so he was watching every move we made. Finally, as that strange game progressed, Captain Prendergast leaned across the table and said, I think you're bluffing, Harkness. Do you? Well, it'll cost you exactly the limit to find out. How curious are you? My Joe, I think you are bluffing, Harkness. I'll see you. He'd be a fool to Watson when he has a straight flush. What do you mean, Holmes? My dear Harkness. The markings are quite apparent, I assure you, to someone who knows what he's looking for. Scott, you mean that these cards are marked too? Examine them for yourself, old chap. They are marked. They're pinpricked just like they were last night. Well, that's impossible. Harkness broke the seals on the new pack just now. We all saw him do it. He couldn't have switched the pack. And why would I do that, even if I could? I wouldn't try and cheat Mr. Sherlock Holmes, would I? No, Mr. Harkness. I just wanted you to know that I understood the trick. What trick, Mr. Holmes? The same one that was played on you last night, Captain Prendergast. This was a demonstration of how easily a sealed pack of cards may be turned into a marked one by a man with a sore finger. What well, has the sore finger got to do with it, Holmes? Oh, it's very simple, Watson. A pinhead or a thumbtack hidden under the bandage, a tiny pressure against a card one wishes to mark as it comes into one's hand, and after several deals... <laughs> hey, presto, a marked pack. Oh, so that's how it was done. You can't prove it, Holmes. You can't prove a thing. You weren't here last night. Oh, unfortunately, I wasn't, Mr. Harkness. Otherwise, I should have had the great pleasure of exposing your trick at the time. As it is, I shall have to rely on a public confession. (laughs) You'll never get a confession from me. Possibly not, but I'm sure that you'll be interested to know that I've made quite an extensive study of card sharping. In fact, I've considered giving a little lecture or demonstration here at the club. What are you talking about? This game that we've just played was in the nature of a, a rehearsal. I should, of course, stress this particular method... As being of uh, great local interest, I'm sure most of the gambling members will recall one man who has had uh, unusually bad luck with his fingers. Holmes, you're trying to ruin me. Well, you were willing to see Prendergast ruin. And killed. But a pistol duel with Colonel Moran is almost equivalent to murder. What? What do you want me to do? Uh, from the direction of your glance, Mr. Harkness, I'm certain that you keep a loaded revolver in your desk drawer. That's a very poor solution, I assure you. Why not be a man, write a confession and sign it? It'll free Captain Prendergast from any stigma and it'll help to trap the real culprit, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Moran? Where does he come into the picture, Holmes? Mr. Harkness knows, don't you? And I think I know now. Why don't you tell us, Harkness? One thing at a time, Prendergast. I owe it to you to write a confession. I'll do that. Rather than face a public exposure in the club, but that's as far as I'll go. If you have any ideas about Moran, go and talk to him yourselves. There's a certain honor, you know. Even among thieves? Thank you for the implication, Mr. Harkness. You have writing materials here? Yes, I have writing materials, Holmes. Splendid. Then while you're telling the truth about last night's episode, we'll call on Colonel Sebastian Moran. Have you any idea where we might find him at this time of night? Yes, I have every idea. You'll find him in the gun room. Thinks he has a jewel on his hands tomorrow. In the gun room, eh? Thank you, Mr. Harkness. We'll go and talk to him. You may expect us back within half an hour. <laughs> Who 
Who are you fellows? <clears throat> Turn the gas up, can't you? Colonel Moran, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, Colonel Moran, I've been wanting to meet you for a very long time. Sherlock Holmes, <clears throat> I've heard a lot about you. And I of you, Colonel. Harry, what are you doing inside the club? Mr. Holmes brought me back. We've just left David Harkness's room. He's writing a confession that he engineered the swindle last night, that he deliberately tried to involve me. So, in that case, I suppose I need oil this revolver no longer. Harkness is a cheat. Dear me, how shocking. Aren't you glad that my name will be cleared in this business? Of course I am. I'm delighted. And you'll apologize for the things that you said last night? Yes, Harry, I'll apologize. But you must realize that this revelation makes no difference to my feelings about your marriage to Alicia. On my soul, Colonel Moran, it seems to me that one uh, Dr. Went... Uh, uh, Watson, I think the name is. Watson, yes, my name's Watson. Uh, Dr. Watson, I would suggest that the happiness of my ward is a matter that cannot possibly concern you. Now, look here, sir, I, I don't want to go... Will you, old chap? Oh, sorry. Uh, Colonel Moran, I think I may be able to change your mind on the question of your ward's marriage. How very interesting. Mm -hmm. And what makes you labor under that delusion? Would you care to have it known at the club that you had deliberately planned Captain Prendergast's murder? What in thunder are you talking about? You know, sir, that a revolver duel with you is no duel. It's a cold-blooded killing. Rubbish. I was challenged. Therefore, I had the choice of weapons. Naturally, I chose the weapon with which I was most familiar. And you had the choice for a very good reason, Colonel Moran. You forced Prendergast into a duel because it was the only way you could, you could be certain that he'd never marry your ward. Alicia? What do you know about her? More than you think, sir. She's at my wife's house this very minute. She suspects you of jealousy. I think it's far more likely that the financial aspect of guardianship is involved here. A financial accounting is due upon her marriage, isn't it? That's none of your business. An accounting is due, Mr. Holmes. Alicia told me that herself. Exactly. And the accounts were in no state to undergo scrutiny. The answer is obvious. David Harkness, a card shop, was in need of money. You induced him to practice his cheating last night in order that you could trap... Captain Prendergast into a duel. <clears throat> Harkness, what the devil do you want? Put that revolver down, you fool. I don't care about my own disgrace, but you're going to pay for your share in it, Moran. Drop that revolver, Harkness. Don't you see that you... Oh, oh. Moran, you... You shot him. You saw that it was in self-defense, gentlemen. He was waving a loaded revolver at me. It's most unfortunate, but it was in self-defense. Yes, self-defense that removed the one dangerous witness who could have testified against you. He's dead, Watson, isn't he? Yeah. Shot right through the heart. Moran, you're a cold-blooded, murdering devil. I demand satisfaction for that insult. These gentlemen are my witnesses. I apologize for the misunderstanding last night, but this is a different matter. You've insulted me, Harry. The duel will take place, Colonel Moran, and Dr. Watson and myself will act as seconds for Captain Prendergast. Let's make the necessary arrangements, shall we? <laughs> Mrs. Watson? Yes, Alicia, dear? It's two o'clock. What can have happened to them? They left here just after eight. Oh, well, if, if you'd been married to John for any length of time, my dear, you wouldn't worry. When your husband goes out with Sherlock Holmes, you're prepared not to see him for a few days. Mrs. Watson, what are you saying? I haven't got a husband. Hmm? Oh. Oh, now, Alicia, don't, don't glower at me like that. What did you say the time was? It's just after two, and they left here at eight. What can have happened? Well, I don't know, but Mr. Holmes was with them. So don't worry, my dear. He's frightfully clever. I wouldn't be surprised. There's the front door now. They're back. Oh, dear me. Now I'll have to make Coco. <laughs> Harry, Harry, darling, what's happened? Oh, lots of things, darling. I'm a member of the Tankerville Club again. I'll probably become a major... And you'll certainly become Mrs. Prendergast before very long. Oh, it all sounds wonderful. What have you two been up to? John? Oh, it's the old story, Mary dear. Holmes solved the case and it all ended happily. Happily? My dear Watson, that's hardly the word to use. Harkness is dead and Colonel Moran is probably in hospital. Please, tell me what happened. <clears throat> well, your, your guardian challenged Captain Prendergast to a duel. Um, he overlooked the fact that uh, since he was the challenger, the choice of weapons belonged to his opponent. And perhaps you can guess what that choice was. Boxing gloves. If we've just come from the gymnasium at the club, Alicia. I'm afraid I really gave him a thrashing. Uh -huh. 
And a well-deserved one, too. I'm only sorry that I couldn't put him where he belongs, behind prison bars. Oh, Harry. He'll be the laughing stock of London. I'm glad of it. But, but that means that he'll never consent to our being married. I disagree, Miss Wentworth. If we keep his secret, and we've hinted that we might, I'm quite certain that he'll withdraw his objections to the marriage, and somehow he'll make up his deficiencies in his guardianship account. Probably by borrowing money from Professor Moriarty. Oh, oh I think it's all wonderful. But it's well after two o'clock in the morning. Let's go into the kitchen, shall we? I'll make some cocoa. Cocoa? Cocoa? Spot of whiskey? Uh, Harry, huh? you and Alicia stay here. You probably have some plans to make. Oh, cocoa's not a very exciting drink. Oh, though. shush, John. Oh, sorry, no. As soon as the cocoa's ready, we'll call you. <laughs> Doctor, that was, that was some story. You know, I'm glad the age of dueling is over. I'd hate to have someone challenge me to a duel. What's the matter, Mr. Bartell? Are you afraid of being uh, hurt? Afraid of being hurt? Of course not. If someone challenges me to a duel, I, I have the right to choose the weapons, don't I? Yes, and what weapons would you choose? Cream puffs at 30 paces. Nobody's going to hurt me. <laughs> I see that. See that. <laughs> Hold on. Come to think of it. Instead of cream puffs, I'd rather have a piece of cake. Oh, why a piece of cake? Because it tastes so good with a glass of Petri Sherry. Any questions? Uh, no questions. <laughs> For a while there, I'll bet you thought I'd forgotten all about Petri oh, Wine. Oh, I've forgotten about it. Not you, Mr. Bartell. No, not anybody Never who's ever tasted it. it. Petri Wine is the kind of wine you'll always remember. That's because the Petri family really knows how to make good wine. They've been making wine for generations. Winemaking is their heritage. It's an art that's been handed on down in the Petri family from father to son, from father to son. Every drop of Petri wine is clear, fragrant, and delicious. As delicious as the luscious, sun-ripened California grapes from which it's made. Remember, the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that their wine is the kind of wine you like for any occasion. You can't miss with Petri wine because Petri took time to bring you good wine. Well, Dr. Watson, what new Sherlock Holmes story are you planning to tell us next week? Well, now, let me see. Uh, next week? Uh, next week, Mr. Bartell, I'm going to tell you an adventure that took place in the gay Vienna of the 90s. Concerns a strange tragedy that occurred on a ballroom floor and a weird series of murders that were punctuated by the sound of music. I call the story... The Waltz of Death. Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure was written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story... The Five Orange Pips. Music is by Dean Fossler. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro Goldwyn Mayer. And Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week. Next week, many communities will change time, and this program will reach some of our listeners at a different hour. Consult your local newspaper or mutual station for the exact time in your area. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is Harry Bartell saying goodnight for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Michael Shane... Followed immediately by Sherlock Holmes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.